Part One, Chapter Nine of A Brief History of English and American Literature. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kalinda. A Brief History of English and American Literature by Henry A. Beers. Part One, Chapter Nine Theological and Religious Literature in Great Britain by John Fletcher Hurst. Miracle plays, rude dramatic representations of the chief events in scripture history, were used for popular instruction before the invention of printing. In England they began as early as the twelfth century. Moral plays, or moralities, were of the same origin, though dating from the fifteenth century. These were somewhat more refined than the miracle plays, and usually set forth the excellence of the virtues, such as truth, mercy, and the like. Both miracle and moral plays were under the conduct of the clergy. John Bale, 1495-1563, was Bishop of Ossory, and wrote much for popular reform. He was the author of nineteen miracle plays. Lord Edward Herbert of Cherbury, 1581-1648, wrote a deistical work, De Religione Gentilium, the first of that school of writers which later appeared in Bolingbroke. John Spottiswood, 1565-1639, to Archbishop of St. Andrews and afterward Chancellor of Scotland, wrote a voluminous History of the Church of Scotland. George Sandys, 1577-1643, to 1643, distinguished also as one of the earliest literary characters in America, wrote metrical versions of several of the poetical books of the Bible, and also a tragedy called Christ's Passion. John Knox, 1505-1572, the great Scotch reformer and polemic, while more prominent as the preacher and spokesman of the Scotch Reformation, wrote First Blast of the Trumpet Against the Monstrous Regimen of Women, 1558, and The History of the Reformation of Religion Within the Realm of Scotland, published after his death. John Jewell, 1522-1571, wrote in Latin his Apologia Ecclesia Anglicanae. William Whittingham, 1524 to 1589, who succeeded Knox as pastor of the English church at Geneva, aided in making the Genevan version of the Bible, and also cooperated in the Sternhold and Hopkins translation of the Psalms. John Fox, 1517 to 1587, was the author of the Book of Martyrs, whose full title was Acts and Monuments of These Latter and Perilous Days, Touching Matters of the Church. An abridgment of the work has had a very wide circulation. John Aylmer, 1521-1594, to replied to Knox's first blast of the trumpet in a work called An Harbor for Faithful and True Subjects. Nicholas Sanders, 1527-1580, to a Roman Catholic professor of Oxford, wrote The Rock of the Church, a defense of the primacy of Peter and the bishops of Rome. Robert Parsons, 1546-1610, to a Jesuit, wrote several works in advocacy of Roman Catholicism and some political tracts. John Reynolds, 1549-1607, to a learned Hebraist of Oxford, wrote many ecclesiastical works in Latin and English. He was a chief promoter of King James's version of the Bible. Miles Smith, died 1624, Thomas Bilson, 1536-1616, to John Boyes, 1560-1643, to and George Abbott, 1562-1633, to Archbishop of Canterbury, were all co-workers on the King James translation of the Scriptures. Next in importance to the English Bible in its effect upon literature stands the English prayer book, which is the rich mosaic of many minds. It came through the primer of the fourteenth century, and contained the more fundamental and familiar portions of the Book of Common Prayer, such as the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Litany, and the Apostles' Creed. This compilation differed in form and somewhat in content in the different dioceses of England, and was partly in Latin and partly in English. In 1542 an attempt was made to produce a common form for all England, and to have it entirely in English. The Committee of Convocation, who had the work in charge, were prevented from making it complete through the refusal of Henry the Eighth to continue the approval which he had given to the appointment of the committee. However, under Edward the Sixth, a commission headed by Archbishop Cranmer carried their work through, and it was accepted and its use made compulsory by Parliament. It was published in 1549 as the first prayer book of Edward the Sixth. Three years later the second prayer book of Edward the Sixth was issued 
it being a revision of the first, also under the shaping hand of Cranmer. The prayer book received its final revision and substantially its present form in the reign of Elizabeth in 1559, although in 1662 there was added to the morning and evening prayer a collection of prayers and thanksgivings upon several occasions. Gathering thus through three centuries the choice treasures of confession and devotion of the strong and reverent English nation, it has been a large element in the literary training, not only of communicants in the Anglican, the Episcopal, and the Methodist churches, but in a measure also of those who have received their religious instruction and have worshipped in other branches of the Protestant church. The work of the Assembly of Divines at Westminster, 1643-1649, to 1649, particularly the Confession of Faith and the Shorter Catechism, became, as specimens of strong and pure English, potent factors in the intellectual and literary discipline of the Presbyterians in all parts of the world. The modern psalms and hymns, or the simplified and popularized forms of the earlier and medieval worship, have had vastly to do with the daily thought and education of the people into whose lives they have brought not only increase of lofty devotion, but also a positive and stimulative culture. Foremost of these collections was that made by Thomas Sternhold, John Hopkins, and others, and known as the Psalter of Sternhold and Hopkins, published in 1562. Francis Rouse made a version in 1645, which, after revision, was adopted in 1649, and largely used by the Scotch Church. A new version was that by Nahum Tate and Nicholas Brady, which appeared in 1696, and has since been called the Psalter of Tate and Brady. The first English hymn-book adapted for public worship was that of Isaac Watts, appearing about 1709, although several minor collections and individual productions had preceded Watts among which should be mentioned those of Joseph Stennett, John Mason, and the fine hymns of Bishop Ken and Joseph Addison. A little later, the prolific and spiritual Charles Wesley, aided by the somewhat stricter taste of his more celebrated brother John, began his wonderful series of published hymns, which, together with those of Watts, have since formed the larger portion of the Protestant hymnody of the world. Others of the eighteenth century who have made contributions to the sacred lyrics of the church are John Byram, 1691-1763, Philip Doddridge, 1702-1751, Joseph Hart, 1712-1768, Anne Steele, 1716-1778, Benjamin Bedham, 1717-1795, John Senek, 1717-1755, Thomas Oliver's 1725 to 1799, Joseph Grigg 1728 to 1768, Augustus M. Toplady 1740 to 1778, and Edward Perronet died 1792. Approaching our own time, the ranks of our hymn writers include James Montgomery 1771 to 1854, whose Christian Psalmist was published in 1825. Thomas Kelly of Dublin, 1769 to 1855, Harriet Auber, 1773 to 1832, Reginald Haber, 1783 to 1826, Sir Robert Grant, 1785 to 1838, Josiah Condor, 1789 to 1855, Charlotte Elliot, 1789 to 1871, Sir John Boring, 1792 to 1872, Henry Francis Light, 1793 to 1847. John Cable, 1792-1866, whose Christian year came out in 1827, John H. Newman, 1801-1890, Sarah Flower Adams, 1805-1849, and Horatius Bonar, 1808-1869. Richard Mant, 1776-1848, Henry Alford, 1810-1871, F. W. Faber, 1815-1863, John Mason Neal, 1818 to 1866, Miss Catherine Winkworth, born 1829, and some others, have given many beautiful and stirring translations from the Latin and German hymns of the ancient and medieval periods. Theological writers of the middle of the 17th century are numerous. Chief of those belonging to the Anglican Church may be named Joseph Hall, Bishop of Norwich, 1574 to 1656 whose Episcopacy by Divine Right was replied to in Smectimnus, the joint production of five dissenting divines, Stephen Marshall, Edward Calamy, Thomas Young, Matthew Newcomer, and William Spurston. 
James Usher, 1580 to 1656, a man of vast literary learning and most known by his sacred chronology, published after his death, Thomas Fuller and Jeremy Taylor, mentioned in a previous chapter, John Cozen, 1594 to 1672, who wrote chiefly devotional treatises, William Chillingworth, 1602 to 1664, whose religion of Protestants has had a wide circulation, John Pearson, 1612 to 1686, whose exposition of the creed became a standard, Ralph Cudworth, 1617 to 1688, whose intellectual system of the universe dealt a stunning blow to the atheism of his day, and Isaac Barrow, 1630 to 1677, the learned vice-chancellor of Cambridge, wit, mathematician, and theologian all in one, who left a rich legacy in his sermons. Of the non-conforming authors deserving notice, Richard Baxter, 1615 to 1691, is the most voluminous, if not also the most luminous. Controversy engaged his pen almost constantly, but his most permanent works were his Call to the Unconverted and The Saint's Everlasting Rest. John Owen, 1616 to 1683, was a leading Puritan writer, and under Cromwell was vice-chancellor of Oxford University. His commentary on the Epistles of the Hebrews and his book on the Holy Spirit are still in use and highly prized. His pen was strong rather than elegant. John Bunyan's immortal allegory throws a halo on universal literature. John Howe, 1630 to 1705, the chief author among the Puritans, wrote many strong works, among which of special note are The Living Temple and The Office and Work of the Holy Spirit. He was Cromwell's chaplain. The spiritual writings of Samuel Rutherford, 1600 to 1661, the Scotch divine, the annotations on the Psalms by Henry Ainsworth, died 1662, an independent who was an exile in Holland for conscience's sake, the expository writings of Thomas Manton, 1620 to 1677, the synopsis of Matthew Poole, 1624 to 1679, later abridged into his celebrated Annotations upon the Bible, the sermons of Stephen Charnock, sixteen twenty eight to sixteen eighty, particularly the one on the divine attributes, and an alarm to an unconverted sinners by Joseph Eleni, sixteen thirty three to sixteen eighty eight, which has had an immense circulation, form a galaxy in the theological firmament of the time of Milton. A later group of theological writers in the latter part of the seventeenth century contains the commanding figures of Simon Patrick, 1626-1707, to bishop and author of A Commentary on the Old Testament, John Flavel, 1627-1691, to and his works on practical piety, John Tillotson, 1630-1694, to the Anglican archbishop whose eloquent sermons are still held in high repute, Robert South, 1633-1716, to the great pulpit orator whose discourses are an ornament to the English tongue, Edward Stillingfleet, 1635-1699, to from whose prolific pen came several valuable treatises, one of which was The Antiquities of the British Churches, and William Beveridge, 1637-1708, to whose private thoughts upon religion is still in much esteem. To those we may add Thomas Ken, 1637-1710, to the good bishop now best known as the author of Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow, Benjamin Keach, 1640-1704, to a Baptist preacher of much note, and author of Gospel Mysteries Opened, which, like his other writings, is marred by an excessive use of figures, Gilbert Burnett, 1643-1709, to the writer and bishop, who mingled freely in the political affairs of the day and wrote much on a variety of subjects, one being a history of the Reformation of the Church of England, William Wall, 1646 to 1728, the prominent defender of infant baptism, Humphrey Prideaux, 1648 to 1724, who wrote The Connection of the Old and New Testaments, and Matthew Henry, 1662 to 1714, still valued for his quaint and suggestive Commentary on the Scriptures. Here, too, belong George Fox, 1624-1690, to 1690, and Robert Barclay, 1648-1690, to 1690, the heroic founder and the learned champion of the Society of Friends, the former's journal and the latter's apology for the true Christian divinity being worthy of special note. William Penn, 1644-1718, to 1718, more eminent as the chief colonizer of Pennsylvania, also wrote many powerful works in advocacy of Quaker teachings and William Sewell's, 1650-1726, History of the Quakers, is a notable contribution to the literature of that much misunderstood and persecuted people. 
Among those who grace the first half of the eighteenth century we find the Irish man of letters Charles Leslie, 1650-1722, who gave, among others, a celebrated treatise on A Short and Easy Method with Deists. Francis Atterbury, 1662-1732, Bishop of Rochester, whose sermons still survive. William Wollaston, 1659-1724, known as the author of The Religion of Nature, A Plea for Truth. Samuel Clark, 1675-1729, the philosophical writer of The Demonstration of Being and Attributes of God. Matthew Tyndall, 1657-1733, the leading deists of his day, whose chief work was Christianity as Old as Creation. Robert Woodrow, 1679-1734, a Scotch preacher who wrote A History of the Sufferings of the Church of Scotland, and Thomas Wilson, 1663-1755, Bishop of Soda and Man for fifty-seven years, and the author of many useful works on the Scriptures and Christianity. Bishop Joseph Butler, 1692-1752, appeared as the champion of Christianity and successfully answered the deistical tendency of Tyndall and others by his analogy of religion natural and revealed to the constitution and course of nature, which, though obscure in style, is still in high repute for its massive thought and mighty logic. Thomas Stackhouse, 1680-1752, and his History of the Bible, John Bampton, 1689-1751, whose estate still speaks at Oxford in defense of the Christianity in the annual lectures on divinity, Daniel Waterland, 1683-1740, in his defense of the divinity of Christ, and Joseph Bingham, 1668-1723, in his learned treatise on the antiquities of the Christian church, are also in the front rank of this period. Daniel Neal, 1678-1743, in his history of the Puritans, John Leland, 1691-1766, the Dublin preacher, in his View of the Deistical Writers, and Philip Doddridge, 1702-1751, in his Family Expositor, and his briefer and more famous Rise and Progress of Religion in the Soul, furnished valuable contributions to theological literature. The latter half of the eighteenth century was prolific of letters. Noteworthy among those who wrote on religious themes are the following— Nathaniel Lardner, 1684-1768, who wrote The Credibility of the Gospel History. William Law, 1687-1761, whose Serious Call to a Holy Life and Christian Perfection are still powerful works. Richard Challoner, 1691-1781, a Roman Catholic author of many practical and devotional works and of a version of the Bible much prized in his own church. Albin Butler, 1700-1773, who compiled The Lives of the Saints, William Warburton, 1698-1779, in his Divine Legation of Moses, Alexander Cruden, 1701-1770, the Scotch author of the famous Concordance to the Holy Scriptures, and Lord George Littleton, 1708-1773, the author of Observations on the Conversion and Apostleship of St. Paul. In the same category belong Robert Louth, 1710-1787, whose book on Hebrew poetry is still consulted, James Hervey, 1713-1758, whose meditations became very popular, Hugh Blair, 1718-1800, the Scotchman whose sermons for many years rivaled his lectures on rhetoric in popularity, Joseph Priestley, 1733-1804, illustrious in the Annals of Chemical Discovery, who wrote Institutes of Natural and Revealed Religion, and is one of the most distinguished Socinian writers, and William Paley, 1743-1805, whose Natural Theology and Hore Pauline are still standard works. During this period also came the great impulse to the literature of the common people through the tireless pen of John Wesley, 1703-1791, whose sermons and notes on the New Testament have had a powerful influence wherever the Wesleyan revival has spread. James McKnight, 1721-1800, the scholarly commentator and harmonist, John Fletcher, 1729-1785, the sweet-souled defender of Methodism and author of Checks to Antinomianism, Bishop Richard Watson, 1737-1816, the learned apologist. Augustus M. Toplady, 1740-1778, the hymnist and polemic. Joseph Milner, 1744-1797, the church historian. 
Thomas Coke, 1747 to 1814, in his Commentary on the Old and New Testaments, and Andrew Fuller, 1754 to 1815, were authors of marked force and ability. Belonging to the first quarter of the nineteenth century, the leading theological productions are The Immateriality and Immortality of the Soul by Samuel Drew, 1765 to 1833, The Translation of the Book of Job by John Mason Good, 1764 to 1827, the Popular Commentaries on the Bible by Thomas Scott, 1747-1821, to 1821, Adam Clark, 1762-1832, to 1832, and Joseph Benson, 1748-1821, to 1821, The Sermons of Robert Hall, 1764-1831, to 1831, The Great Baptist Preacher, The Introduction to the Literary History of the Bible by James Townley, died 1833, the Missionary Narratives of Henry Martin, 1781-1812, William Ward, 1769-1822, and John Williams, 1796-1839, and The Pathetic Story of the Dairyman's Daughter, by Leg Richmond, 1772-1827. A little later in this century, the first ranks of theological scholarship included the Wordsworths, Christopher, 1774-1846, the brother of the poet, and his two sons, Charles, 1806-1892, and Christopher, Jr., 1809-1885. Tracts for the Times, written by a group of men styling themselves Anglo-Catholics, whose leaders were Edward B. Pusey, 1800-1882, John H. Newman, 1801-1890, John Keble, 1792-1866, Richard H. Froude and others, began in 1833, and for several years continued to be published, reaching ninety in number. Their main purpose was a discussion and defense of the character and work of the established church, but a large result was that several of the leading spirits, with about two hundred clergymen and the same number of prominent laymen, became Roman Catholics. This high church series of writings was followed in 1860 by Essays and Reviews, a volume containing seven articles, whose authors were Frederick Temple, born 1821, Roland Williams, 1817-1870, Baden-Powell, 1796-1860, Henry B. Wilson, born 1804, C. W. Goodwin, Mark Pattison, 1813-1884, and Benjamin Jowett, 1817-1893. The purpose of these men was to liberalize the thought of the church. They accomplished this result, and with it the overthrow of the faith of some. Thomas Chalmers, 1780-1847, the great Scotch preacher, left much fruit of his pen, the most celebrated being Astronomical Discourses. Other distinguished books are A Practical View of Christianity by William Wilberforce, 1759-1833, Horae Homileticae by Charles Simeon, 1759-1836, The Lives of Knox and Melville by Thomas McCree, 1772-1835, Horae Mosaicae by George Stanley Faber, 1773-1854, The Scripture Testimony to the Messiah by John Pye Smith, 1774-1851, Theological Institutes by the Wesleyan theologian Richard Watson, 1781-1833, the Histories of the Jews and of Christianity by Henry Hart Millman, 1791-1868, The Cyclopedia of Biblical Literature by John Kitto, 1804-1854, Mammon by John Harris, 1804-1856, The Theological Essays of John Frederick Denison Maurice, 1805-1872, Missions, The Chief End of the Christian Church, by Alexander Duff, 1806-1878, The Sermons of Frederick William Robertson, 1816-1853, and The Life and Epistles of Paul, by William J. Conybeare, 1815-1857, and John S. Housen, 1816-1885. The latter half of the present century has been marked by many strong and profound theological publications, of which we may name as worthy of particular notice. The Introduction to the Study of Holy Scriptures by Thomas Hartwell Horne, 1780-1862, Historic Doubts Relative to Napoleon Bonaparte by Richard Watley, 1787-1863, Apologia por Vita Sua of John H. Newman, 1801-1890, The Typology of Scripture by Patrick Fairburn, 1805-1892, The Eclipse of Faith by Henry Rogers, 1806-1877, 
The Notes on the Parables and Miracles by Richard Chevenix Trench, 1807-1886. The Temporal Mission of the Holy Ghost by Henry Edward Manning, 1808-1892. The Series of the Lectures on the Scriptures by John Gumming, 1810-1881. The Greek New Testament, edited by Henry Alford, 1810-1871. And the same by Samuel Prideaux Tregels, 1813-1875. The Historical Works of Arthur Penrin Stanley, 1815 to 1881. Hypatia, or Old Foes with a New Face, by Charles Kingsley, 1819 to 1875. Ecce Homo, by John Robert Seeley, 1834 to 1895. The Sermons of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, 1834 to 1892. And Natural Law in the Spiritual World. The Brilliant Venture of the Beloved and Lamented Henry Drummond, 1851-1897, to whose greatest thing in the world bids fair to become a Christian classic. End of Part 1, Chapter 9 Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany, on March 6, 2009this little volume is intended as a companion to the outline sketch of English literature, published last year for the Chautauqua Circle. In writing it, I have followed the same plan, aiming to present the subject in a sort of continuous essay rather than in the form of a primer or elementary manual. I have not undertaken to describe or even to mention every American author or book of importance, but only those which seem to me of most significance. Nevertheless, I believe that the sketch contains enough detail to make it of some use as a guide-book to our literature. Though meant to be mainly a history of American belles lettres, it makes some mention of historical and political writings, but hardly any of philosophical, scientific, and technical works. A chronological rather than a topical order has been followed, although the fact that our best literature is of recent growth has made it impossible to adhere as closely to a chronological plan as in the English sketch. In the reading courses appended to the different chapters, I have named a few of the most important authorities in American literary history, such as Dukink, Tyler, Stedman, and Richardson. Henry A. Beers Outline Sketch of American Literature, Chapter 1 The Colonial Period, 1607-1765 to 1765. The writings of our colonial era have a much greater importance as history than as literature. It would be unfair to judge of the intellectual vigor of the English colonists in America by the books that they wrote. Those stern men with empires in their brains had more pressing work to do than the making of books. The first settlers, indeed, were brought face to face with strange and exciting conditions. The sea, the wilderness, the Indians, the flora and fauna of a new world, things which seemed stimulating to the imagination, and incidents and experiences which might have lent themselves easily to poetry or romance. Of all these they wrote back to England reports which were faithful and sometimes vivid, but which, upon the whole, hardly rise into the region of literature. New England, said Hawthorne, was then in a state incomparably more picturesque than at present. But to a contemporary that old New England of the seventeenth century doubtless seemed anything but picturesque, filled with grim, hard, worky-day realities. The planters, both of Virginia and Massachusetts, were decimated by sickness and starvation, constantly threatened by Indian wars and troubled by quarrels among themselves and fears of disturbance from England. The wrangles between the royal governors in the House of Burgesses in the Old Dominion, and the theological squabbles in New England, which fill our colonial records, are petty and wearisome to read of. At least they would be so, did we not bear in mind to what imperial destinies these conflicts were slowly educating the little communities which had hardly as yet secured a foothold on the edge of the raw continent. Even a century and a half after the Jamestown and Plymouth settlements, when the American plantations had grown strong and flourishing, and commerce was building up large towns, and there were wealth and generous living in fine society. The good old colony days, when we lived under the king, had yielded little in the way of literature that is of any permanent interest. 
there would seem to be something in the relation of a colony to the mother country which dooms the thought and art of the former to a hopeless provincialism. Canada and Australia are great provinces, wealthier and more populous than the thirteen colonies at the time of their separation from England. They have cities whose inhabitants number hundreds of thousands, well-equipped universities, libraries, cathedrals, costly public buildings, all the outward appliances of an advanced civilization. And yet what have Canada and Australia contributed to British literature? American literature had no infancy. That engaging naivete and that heroic rudeness which give a charm to the early popular tales and songs of Europe find, of course, no counterpart on our soil. Instead of emerging from the twilight of the past, the first American writings were produced under the garish noon of a modern and learned age. Decrepitude rather than youthfulness is the mark of a colonial literature. The poets, in particular, instead of finding a challenge to their imagination in the new life about them, are apt to go on imitating the cast-off literary fashions of the mother country. America was settled by Englishmen who were contemporary with the greatest names in English literature. Jamestown was planted in 1607, nine years before Shakespeare's death, and the hero of that enterprise, Captain John Smith, may not improbably have been a personal acquaintance of the great dramatist. "'They have acted my fatal tragedies on the stage,' wrote Smith. Many circumstances in the Tempest were doubtless suggested by the wreck of the sea venture on the still-vexed Bermouths, as described by William Strachey in his true repertory of the rack and redemption of Sir Thomas Gates, written at Jamestown and published at London in 1510.' Shakespeare's contemporary, Michael Drayton, the poet of the Polyalbion, addressed a spirited valedictory ode to the three shiploads of brave, heroic minds who sailed from London in 1606 to colonize Virginia, an ode which ended with the prophecy of a future American literature. And as there plenty grows of laurel everywhere, Apollo's sacred tree, you it may see a poet's brows to crown that may sing there. Another English poet, Samuel Daniel, the author of The Civil Wars, had also prophesied, in a similar strain, And who in time knows whether we may vent the treasure of our tongue to what strange shores, what worlds in the yet unformed Occident may come refined with accents that are ours? It needed but a slight movement in the balances of fate, and Walter Raleigh might have been reckoned among the poets of America. He was one of the original promoters of the Virginia colony, and he made voyages in person to Newfoundland and Guiana. And more unlikely things have happened than that when John Milton left Cambridge in 1632, he should have been tempted to follow Winthrop and the colonists of Massachusetts Bay, who had sailed two years before. Sir Henry Vane the Younger, who was afterward Milton's friend, Vane, young in years but in sage counsel old, came over in 1635 and was for a short time governor of Massachusetts. These are idle speculations, and yet when we reflect that Oliver Cromwell was on the point of embarking for America when he was prevented by the king's officers, we may, for the nonce, let our frail thoughts daily with false surmise, and fancy by how narrow a chance Paradise Lost missed being written in Boston. But as a rule the members of the literary guide are not quick to emigrate. They like the feeling of an old and rich civilization about them, a state of society which America has only begun to reach during the present century. Virginia and New England, says Lowell, were the two great distributing centers of the English race. The men who colonized the country between the capes of Virginia were not drawn to any large extent from the literary or bookish classes in the old country. Many of the first settlers were gentlemen, too many, Captain Smith thought, for the good of the plantation. Some among these were men of worth and spirit, of good means and great parentage. Such was, for example, George Percy, a younger brother of the Earl of Northumberland, who was one of the original adventures, and the author of A Discourse of the Plantation of the Southern Colony of Virginia, which contains a graphic narrative of the fever and famine summer of 1607 at Jamestown. But many of these gentlemen were idlers, unruly gallants packed thither by their friends to escape ill destinies, dissipated younger sons, soldiers of fortune, who came over after the gold which was supposed to abound in the new country, and who spent their time in playing bowls and drinking at the tavern as soon as there was any tavern. With these was a sprinkling of mechanics and farmers, indented servants, and the off-scourings of the London streets, fruit of press-gangs and jail deliveries sent over to work in the plantations. 
nor were the conditions of life afterward in Virginia very favorable to literary growth. The planters lived isolated on great estates, which had water fronts on the rivers of that flow into the Chesapeake. There the tobacco, the chief staple of the country, was loaded directly upon the trading vessels that tied up to the long, narrow wharves of the plantations. Surrounded by his slaves, and visited occasionally by a distant neighbor, the Virginia country gentleman lived a free and careless life. He was fond of fox-hunting, horse-racing, and cock-fighting. There were no large towns, and the planters met each other mainly on occasion of a county court or the assembling of the Burgesses. The courthouse was the nucleus of social and political life in Virginia, as the town meeting was in New England. In such a state of society schools were necessarily few, and popular education did not exist. Sir William Berkeley, who was the royal governor of the colony from 1641 to 1677, said, in 1670, I thank God there are no free schools nor printing, and I hope we shall not have these hundred years. In the matter of printing, this pious wish was well nigh realized. The first press set up in the colony, about 1681, was soon suppressed, and found no successor until the year 1729. From that date until some ten years before the Revolution, one printing press answered the needs of Virginia, and this was under official control. The earliest newspaper in the colony was the Virginia Gazette, established in 1736. In the absence of schools, the higher education naturally languished. Some of the planters were taught at home by tutors, and others went to England and entered the universities. But these were few in number, and there was no college in the colony until more than half a century after the foundation of Harvard in the younger province of Massachusetts. The College of William and Mary was established at Williamsburg, chiefly by the exertions of the Rev. James Blair, a Scotch divine who was sent by the Bishop of London as commissary to the church in Virginia. The college received its charter in 1693, and held its first commencement in 1700. It is perhaps significant of the difference between the Puritans of New England and the so-called Cavaliers of Virginia, that while the former founded and supported Harvard College in 1636, and Yale in 1701, of their own motion, and at their own expense, William and Mary received its endowment from the crown, being provided for in part by a deed of lands, and in part by a tax of a penny a pound on all tobacco exported from the colony. In return for this royal grant, the college was to present yearly to the king two copies of Latin verse. It is reported of the young Virginian gentlemen who resorted to the new college that they brought their plantation manners with them, and were accustomed to keep racehorses at the college and bet at the billiard or other gaming tables. William and Mary College did a good work for the colony, and educated some of the great Virginians of the Revolutionary Era, but it has never been a large or flourishing institution, and has held no such relation to the intellectual development of its section as Harvard and Yale have held in the colonies of Massachusetts and Connecticut. Even after the foundation of the University of Virginia, in which Jefferson took a conspicuous part, southern youths were commonly sent to the north for their education, and at the time of the outbreak of the Civil War, there was a large contingent of southern students in several northern colleges, notably in Princeton and Yale. Naturally, the first books written in America were descriptions of the country, and narratives of the vicissitudes of the infant settlements, which were sent home to be printed for the information of the English public and the encouragement of further immigration. Among books of this kind produced in Virginia, the earliest and most noteworthy were the writings of that famous soldier of fortune, Captain John Smith. The first of these was his true relation, namely, of such occurrences and accidents of note as hath happened in Virginia since the first planting of that colony, printed at London in 1608. Among Smith's other books, the most important is perhaps his General History of Virginia, London, 1624, a compilation of various narratives by different hands, but passing under his name. Smith was a man of restless and daring spirit, full of resource, impatient of contradiction, and of a somewhat vainglorious nature, with an appetite for the marvelous and a disposition to draw the longbow. He had seen service in many parts of the world, and his wonderful adventures lost nothing in the telling. It was alleged against him that the evidence of his prowess rested almost entirely on his own testimony. His truthfulness in essentials has not, perhaps, been successfully impugned, but his narratives have suffered by the embellishments with which he has colored them, and in particular the charming story of Pocahontas saving his life at the risk of her own, the one romance of early Virginian history, has passed into the realm of legend. 
Captain Smith's writings have small literary value apart from the interest of the events which they describe, and the diverting but forcible personality which they unconsciously display. They are the rough-hewn records of a busy man of action, whose sword was mightier than his pen. As Smith returned to England after two years in Virginia, and did not permanently cast in his lot with the settlement of which he had been for a time the leading spirit, he can hardly be claimed as an American author. No more can Mr. George Sandys, who came to Virginia in the train of Governor Wyatt in 1621, and completed his excellent metrical translation of Ovid on the banks of the James, in the midst of the Indian massacre of 1622, limbed, as he writes, by that imperfect light which was snatched from the hours of night and repose, having wars and tumults to bring it to light instead of muses. Sandys went back to England for good, probably as early as 1625, and can therefore no more be reckoned as the first American poet, on the strength of his paraphrase of the Metamorphoses, than he can be reckoned the earliest Yankee inventor, because he introduced the first water-mill into America. The literature of colonial Virginia, and of the southern colonies which took their point of departure from Virginia, is almost wholly of this historical and descriptive kind. A great part of it is concerned with the internal affairs of the province, such as Bacon's Rebellion in 1676, one of the most striking episodes in our anti-revolutionary annals, and of which there exist a number of narratives, some of them anonymous, and only rescued from manuscript condition a hundred years after the event. Another part is concerned with the explorations of new territory. Such were the Westover manuscripts, left by Colonel William Byrd, who was appointed in 1729 one of the commissioners to fix the boundary between Virginia and North Carolina, and gave an account of his survey in his History of the Dividing Line, which was only printed in 1841. Colonel Byrd is one of the most brilliant figures of colonial Virginia, and a type of the old Virginia gentleman. He had been sent to England for his education, where he was admitted to the bar of the Middle Temple, elected a fellow of the Royal Society, and formed an intimate friendship with Charles Boyle, the Earl of Orrery. He held many offices in the government of the colony, and founded the cities of Richmond and Petersburg. His estates were large, and at Westover, where he had one of the finest private libraries in America, he exercised a baronial hospitality blending the usual profusion of plantation life with the elegance of a travelled scholar and picked man of countries. Colonel Byrd was rather an amateur in literature. His history of the dividing line is written with a jocularity which rises occasionally into real humor, and which gives to the painful journey through the wilderness the air of a holiday expedition. Similar in tone were his diaries of A Progress to the Mines and A Journey to the Land of Eden in North Carolina. The first formal historian of Virginia was Robert Beverly, a native and inhabitant of the place, whose history of Virginia was printed at London in 1705. Beverly was a rich planter and a large slave owner, who, being in London in 1703, was shown by his bookseller the manuscript of a forthcoming work, Old Mixon's British Empire in America. Beverly was set upon writing his history of the inaccuracies in this, and likewise because the province has been so misrepresented to the common people of England as to make them believe that the servants in Virginia are made to draw in cart and plough, and that the country turns all people black, an impression which lingers still in parts of Europe. The most original portions of the book are those in which the author puts down his personal observations of the plants and animals of the New World, and particularly in the account of the Indians, to which his third book is devoted, and which is accompanied by valuable plates. Beverly's knowledge of these matters was evidently at first hand, and his descriptions here are very fresh and interesting. The more strictly historical part of his work is not free from prejudice and inaccuracy. A more critical, detailed, and impartial, but much less readable, work was William Stith's History of the First Discovery and Settlement of Virginia, 1747, which brought the subject down only to the year 1624. Stith was a clergyman, and at one time a professor in William and Mary College. The Virginians were stanch royalists and churchmen. The Church of England was established by law, and nonconformity was persecuted in various ways. Three missionaries were sent to the colony in 1642 by the Puritans of New England, two from Braintree, Massachusetts, and one from New Haven. They were not suffered to preach but many resorted to them in private houses, until, being finally driven out by fines and imprisonments, they took refuge in Catholic Maryland. 
the Virginia clergy were not, as a body, very much of a force in education or literature. Many of them, by reason of the scattering and dispersed condition of their parishes, lived as domestic chaplains with the wealthier planters, and partook of their illiteracy and their passion for gaming and hunting. Few of them inherited the zeal of Alexander Whitaker, the Apostle of Virginia, who came over in 1611 to preach to the colonists and convert the Indians, and who published in furtherance of those ends Good News from Virginia in 1613, three years before his death by drowning in James River. The conditions were much more favorable for the production of a literature in New England than in the southern colonies. The free and genial existence of the Old Dominion had no counterpart among the settlers of Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay, and the Puritans must have been rather unpleasant people to live with for persons of a different way of thinking. But their intensity of character, their respect for learning, and the heroic mood which sustained them through the hardships and dangers of their great enterprise are amply reflected in their own writings. If these are not so much literature as the raw materials of literature, they have at least been fortunate in finding interpreters among their descendants, and no modern Virginian has done for the memory of the Jamestown planters what Hawthorne, Whittier, Longfellow, and others have done in casting the glamour of poetry and romance over the lives of the founders of New England. Cotton Mather, in his Magnalia, quotes the following passage from one of those election sermons, delivered before the General Court of Massachusetts, which formed for many years the great annual intellectual event of the colony. The question was often put unto our predecessors, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? And the answer to it is not only too excellent, but too notorious to be dissembled. We came hither because we would have our posterity settled under the pure and full dispensations of the gospel, defended by rulers that should be of ourselves. The New England colonies were, in fact, theocracies. Their leaders were clergymen or laymen, whose zeal for the faith was no whit inferior to that of the ministers themselves. Church and state were one. The freeman's oath was only administered to church members, and there was no place in the social system for unbelievers or dissenters. The Pilgrim Fathers regarded their transplantation to the New World as an exile, and nothing is more touching in their written records than the repeated expressions of love and longing toward the old home which they had left, and even toward that Church of England from which they had sorrowfully separated themselves. It was not in any light or adventurous spirit that they faced the perils of the sea and the wilderness. This howling wilderness, these ends of the earth, these goings down of the sun, are some of the epithets which they constantly applied to the land of their exile. Nevertheless, they had come to stay, and unlike Smith and Percy and Sandys, the early historians and writers of New England cast in their lots permanently with the new settlements. A few, indeed, went back after 1640. Mather says some ten or twelve of the ministers of the first classes, or immigration, were among them, when the victory of the Puritanic party in Parliament opened a career for them in England, and made their presence there seem, in some cases, a duty. The celebrated Hugh Peters, for example, who was afterward Oliver Cromwell's chaplain, and was beheaded after the Restoration, went back in 1641. And in 1647 Nathaniel Ward, the minister of Ipswich, Massachusetts, and author of a quaint book against toleration, entitled The Simple Cobbler of Agawam, written in America and published shortly after its author's arrival in England. The Civil War, too, put a stop to further emigration from England until after the Restoration in 1660. The mass of the Puritan immigration consisted of men in the middle class, artisans and husbandmen, the most useful members of a new colony. But their leaders were clergymen educated at the universities, and especially at Emmanuel College, Cambridge, the great Puritan college. Their civil magistrates were also in great part gentlemen of education and substance, like the elder Winthrop, who was learned in the law, and Theophilus Eaton, first governor of New Haven, who was a London merchant of good estate. It is computed that there were in New England, during the first generation, as many university graduates as in any community of equal population in the old country. Almost the first care of the settlers was to establish schools. Every town of fifty families was required by law to maintain a common school, and every town of a hundred families a grammar or Latin school. In 1636, only sixteen years after the landing of the pilgrims on Plymouth Rock, Harvard College was founded at Newtown whose name was thereupon changed to Cambridge, 
the general court held at Boston on September 8, 1680, having already advanced four hundred pounds by way of essay toward the building of something to begin a college. An university, says Mather, which hath been to these plantations, for the good literature there cultivated, sal gentium, and a river without the streams whereof these regions would have been mere unwatered places for the devil. By 1701, Harvard had put forth a vigorous offshoot, Yale College, at New Haven. The settlers of New Haven and Connecticut plantations having increased sufficiently to need a college at their own doors. A printing press was set up at Cambridge in 1639, which was under the oversight of the university authorities, and afterwards of licensers appointed by the civil power. The press was no more free in Massachusetts than in Virginia, and that liberty of unlicensed printing, for which the Puritan Milton had pleaded in his Areopagitica in 1644, was unknown in Puritan New England until some twenty years before the outbreak of the Revolutionary War. The Freeman's Oath and an almanac were issued from the Cambridge Press in 1639, and in 1640 the first English book printed in America, a collection of the Psalms in meter, made by various ministers, and known as the Bay Psalm Book. The poetry of this version was worse, if possible, than that of Sternhold and Hopkins's famous rendering, but it is noteworthy that one of the principal translators was that devoted apostle to the Indians, the Reverend John Eliot, who in 1661-1663 to translated the Bible into the Algonquin tongue. Eliot hoped and toiled a lifetime for the conversion of those salvages, tawnies, devil-worshippers, for whom our early writers have usually nothing but bad words. They have been destroyed instead of converted. But his so entitled Mamuse Unitupanatamwe, Up Biblum God Naniswe Nukone Testament Kawonk Wusku Testament, the first Bible printed in America, remains a monument of missionary zeal and a work of great value to students of the Indian languages. A modern writer has said that, to one looking back on the history of old New England, it seems as though the sun shone but dimly there, and the landscape was always dark and wintry. Such is the impression which one carries away from the perusal of books like Bradford's and Winthrop's journals, or Mather's Wonders of the Invisible World, an impression of gloom, of night and cold, of mysterious fears besieging the infant settlements, scattered in a narrow fringe between the groaning forest and the shore. The Indian terror hung over New England for more than half a century, or until the issue of King Philip's War in 1676 relieved the colonists of any danger of a general massacre. Added to this were the perplexities caused by the earnest resolve of the settlers to keep their new English Eden free from the intrusion of the serpent in the shape of heretical sects in religion. The Puritanism of Massachusetts was an orthodox and conservative Puritanism, the later and more grotesque outcrops of the movement in the old England found no toleration in the new. But these refugees, for conscience's sake, were compelled in turn to persecute antinomians, separatists, familists, libertines, anti-pedobaptists, and later Quakers, and still later enthusiasts, who swarmed into their precincts and troubled the churches with prophesyings and novel opinions. Some of these were banished, others were flogged or imprisoned, and a few were put to death. Of the exiles, the most noteworthy was Roger Williams, an impetuous, warm-hearted man, who was so far in advance of his age as to deny the power of the civil magistrate in cases of conscience, or who, in other words, maintained the modern doctrine of the separation of church and state. Williams was driven away from the Massachusetts colony, where he had been minister of the church at Salem, and with a few followers fled into the southern wilderness and settled at Providence. There, and in the neighboring plantation of Rhode Island, for which he obtained a charter, he established his patriarchal rule, and gave freedom of worship to all comers. Williams was a prolific writer on theological subjects, the most important of his writings being, perhaps, his Bloody Tenant of Persecution, 1644, and a supplement to the same called out by a reply to the former work from the pen of Mr. John Cotton, minister of the First Church at Boston, entitled The Bloody Tenant Washed and Made White in the Blood of the Lamb. Williams was also a friend to the Indians, whose lands he thought should not be taken from them without payment, and he anticipated Eliot by writing in 1643 a key into the language of America. Although at odds with the theology of Massachusetts Bay, 
Williams remained in correspondence with Winthrop and others in Boston, by whom he was highly esteemed. He visited England in 1643 and 1652, and made the acquaintance of John Milton. Besides the threat of an Indian war and their anxious concern for the purity of the gospel in their churches, the colonists were haunted by superstitious forebodings of the darkest kind. It seemed to them that Satan, angered by the setting up of the kingdom of saints in America, had come down in great wrath and was present among them, sometimes even in visible shape, to terrify and tempt. Special providences and unusual phenomena, like earthquakes, mirages, and the northern lights, are gravely recorded by Winthrop and Mather and others as portents of supernatural persecutions. Thus, Mrs. Anne Hutchinson, the celebrated leader of the Familists, having, according to rumor, been delivered of a monstrous birth, the Rev. John Cotton, in open assembly at Boston upon a lecture day, thereupon gathered that it might signify her error in denying inherent righteousness. There will be an unusual range of the devil among us, wrote Mather, a little before the second coming of our Lord. The evening wolves will be much abroad when we are near the evening of the world. This belief culminated in the horrible witchcraft delusion at Salem in 1692, that spectral puppet play, which, beginning with the malicious pranks of a few children, who accused certain uncanny old women and other persons of mean condition and suspected lives, of having tormented them with magic, gradually drew into its vortex victims of the highest character, and resulted in the judicial murder of over nineteen people. Many of the possessed pretended to have been visited by the apparition of a little black man, who urged them to inscribe their names in a red book which he carried a sort of muster-roll of those who had forsworn God's service for the devils. Others testified to having been present at meetings of witches in the forest. It is difficult now to read without contempt the evidence which grave justices and learned divines considered sufficient to condemn to death men and women of unblemished lives. It is true that the belief in witchcraft was general at that time all over the civilized world, and that sporadic cases of witch-burnings had occurred in different parts of America and Europe. Sir Thomas Brown, in his Religio Medici, 1635, affirmed his belief in witches, and pronounced those who doubted of them a sort of atheist. But the superstition came to a head in the Salem trials and executions, and was the more shocking from the general high level of intelligence in the community in which these were held. It would be well if those who lament the decay of faith would remember what things were done in New England in the name of faith less than two hundred years ago. It is not wonderful that, to the Massachusetts Puritans of the seventeenth century, the mysterious forest held no beautiful suggestion. To them it was simply a grim and hideous wilderness, whose dark aisles were the ambush of prowling savages and the rendezvous of those other devil-worshippers who celebrated there a kind of vulgar Valpurgis night. The most important of original sources from the history of the settlement of New England are the journals of William Bradford, first governor of Plymouth, and John Winthrop, the second governor of Massachusetts, which hold a place corresponding to the writings of Captain John Smith in the Virginia colony, but are much more sober and trustworthy. Bradford's history of Plymouth Plantation covers the period from 1620 to 1646. The manuscript was used by later analysts, but remained unpublished as a whole until 1855, having been lost during the War of the Revolution, and recovered long afterward in England. Winthrop's journal, or History of New England, begun on shipboard in 1630 and extending to 1649, was not published entire until 1826. It is of equal authority with Bradford's, and perhaps on the whole the more important of the two, as the colony of Massachusetts Bay, whose history it narrates, greatly outwent Plymouth in wealth and population, though not in priority of settlement. The interest of Winthrop's journal lies in the events that it records, rather than in any charm of the historian's manner of recording them. His style is pragmatic, and some of the incidents which he gravely notes are trivial to the modern mind, though instructive as to our forefathers' way of thinking. For instance, of the year 1632, At Watertown there was, in the view of diverse witnesses, a great combat between a mouse and a snake, and after a long fight the mouse prevailed and killed the snake. The pastor of Boston, Mr. Wilson, a very sincere, holy man, hearing of it, gave this interpretation, that the snake was the devil, the mouse was a poor, contemptible people, which God had brought hither, which should overcome Satan here and dispossess him of his kingdom. 
the reader of Winthrop's journal comes everywhere upon hints which the imagination has since shaped into poetry and romance. The germs of many of Longfellow's New England tragedies, of Hawthorne's Maypole of Marymount, of Endicott's Red Cross, and of Whittier's John Underhill and the Familist's Hymn, are all to be found in some dry, brief entry of the old Puritan diarist. Robert Cole, having been oft punished for drunkenness, was now ordered to wear a red D about his neck for a year, to wit, the year 1633, and thereby gave occasion to the greatest American romance, The Scarlet Letter. The famous apparition of the phantom ship in New Haven Harbor, upon the top of the poop a man standing with one hand akimbo under his left side, and in his right hand a sword stretched out toward the sea, was first chronicled by Winthrop under the year 1648. This meteorological phenomenon took on the dimensions of a full-grown myth some forty years later, as related with many embellishments by Rev. James Pierpont of New Haven, in a letter to Cotton Mather. Winthrop put great faith in special providences, and among other instances narrates, not without a certain grim satisfaction, how the Mary Rose, a ship of Bristol, of about two hundred tons, lying before Charleston, was blown in pieces with her own powder, being twenty-one barrels, wherein the judgment of God appeared, for the master and company were many of them profane scoffers at us, and at the ordinances of religion here. Without any effort at a dramatic portraiture of character sketching, Winthrop managed in all simplicity, and by the plain relation of facts, to leave a clear impression of many of the prominent figures in the first Massachusetts immigration. In particular, there gradually arises from the entries in his diary a very distinct and diverting outline of Captain John Underhill, celebrated in Whittier's poem. He was one of the professional soldiers who came over with the Puritan fathers, such as John Mason, the hero of the Pequot War, and Miles Standish, whose courtship Longfellow sang. He had seen service in the Low Countries, and in pleading the privilege of his profession, he insisted much upon the liberty which all states do allow to military officers for free speech, etc., and that himself had spoken sometimes as freely to Count Nassau. Captain Underhill gave the colony no end of trouble, both by his scandalous living and his heresies in religion. Having been seduced into familistical opinions by Mrs. Anne Hutchinson, who was banished for her beliefs, he was had up before the general court and questioned, among other points, as to his own report of the manner of his conversion. He had lain under a spirit of bondage and a legal way for years, and could get no assurance, till at length, as he was taking a pipe of tobacco, the spirit set home an absolute promise of free grace with such assurance and joy as he had never since doubted of his good estate, neither should he, though he should fall into sin. The Lord's day following he made a speech in the assembly, showing that as the Lord was pleased to convert Paul as he was in persecuting, etc., so he might manifest himself to him as he was taking the moderate use of the creature called tobacco. The gallant captain, being banished the colony, betook himself to the falls of the Piscataquack, Exeter, New Hampshire, where the Reverend John Wheelwright, another adherent of Mrs. Hutchinson, had gathered a congregation. Being made governor of this plantation, Underhill sent letters to the Massachusetts magistrates, breathing reproaches and imprecations of vengeance. But meanwhile it was discovered that he had been living in adultery at Boston with a young woman whom he had seduced, the wife of a cooper, and the captain was forced to make public confession, which he did with great unction and in a manner highly dramatic. He came in his worst clothes, being accustomed to take great pride in his bravery and neatness, without a band, in a foul linen cap, and pulled close to his eyes, and standing upon a form, he did, with many deep sighs and abundance of tears, lay open his wicked course. There is a lurking humor in the grave Winthrop's detailed account of Underhill's doings. Winthrop's own personality comes out well in his journal. He was a born leader of men, a conditor imperi, just, moderate, patient, wise, and his narrative gives upon the whole a favorable impression of the general prudence and fair-mindedness of the Massachusetts settlers in their dealings with one another, with the Indians, and with the neighboring plantations. Considering our forefathers' errand and calling into this wilderness, it is not strange that their chief literary staples were sermons and tracts in controversial theology. Multitudes of these were written and published by the divines of the first generation, such as John Cotton, Thomas Shepard, John Norton, Peter Bulkley, and Thomas Hooker, the founder of Hartford, 
of whom it was finally said that, when he was doing his master's business, he would put a king into his pocket. Nor were their successors in the second or the third generation any less industrious and prolific. They rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Their sermons and theological treatises are not literature, they are for the most part dry, heavy, and dogmatic, but they exhibit great learning, logical acuteness, and an earnestness which sometimes rises into eloquence. The pulpit ruled New England, and the sermon was the greatest intellectual engine of the time. The serious thinking of the Puritans was given almost exclusively to religion. The other world was all their art. The daily secular events of life, the aspects of nature, the vicissitude of the seasons, were important enough to find record in print only in so far as they manifested God's dealings with his people. So much was the sermon depended upon to furnish literary food that it was the general custom of serious-minded laymen to take down the words of the discourse in their notebooks. Franklin, in his autobiography, describes this as the constant habit of his grandfather, Peter Folger, and Mather, in his life of the elder Winthrop, says that, though he wrote not after the preacher, yet such was his attention and such his retention in hearing, that he repeated unto his family the sermons which he had heard in the congregation. These discourses were commonly of great length. Twice, or sometimes thrice, the pulpit hourglass was silently inverted, while the orator pursued his theme, even unto Enthley. The book which best sums up the life and thought of this old New England of the seventeenth century is Cotton Mather's Magnalia Christi Americana. Mather was by birth a member of that clerical aristocracy which developed later into Dr. Holmes's Brahmin caste of New England. His maternal grandfather was John Cotton. His father was Increase Mather, the most learned divine of his generation in New England, minister of the North Church of Boston, president of Harvard College, and author, inter alia, of that characteristically Puritan book, An Essay for the Recording of Illustrious Providences. Cotton Mather himself was a monster of erudition and a prodigy of diligence. He was graduated from Harvard at fifteen. He ordered his daily life and conversation by a system of minute observances. He was a bookworm, whose life was spent between his library and his pulpit, and his published works numbered upward of three hundred and eighty. Of these, the most important is the Magnalia, 1702, an ecclesiastical history of New England from 1620 to 1698, divided into seven parts, one, Antiquities, two, Lives of the Governors, three, Lives of Sixty Famous Divines, four, A History of Harvard College with Biographies of its Eminent Graduates, five, Acts and Monuments of the Faith, six, Wonderful Providences, seven, The Wars of the Lord, that is, an account of the afflictions and disturbances of the churches and the conflicts with the Indians. The plan of the work thus united that of Fuller's Worthies of England and Church History with that of Wood's Athene Oxoniensis and Fox's Book of Martyrs. Mather's prose was of the kind which the English Commonwealth writers used. He was younger by a generation than Dryden, but as literary fashions are slower to change in a colony than in the mother country, that nimble English which Dryden and the Restoration essayists introduced had not yet displaced in New England the older manner. Mather wrote in the full and pregnant style of Taylor, Milton, Brown, Filler, and Burton, a style ponderous with learning and stiff with allusions, digressions, conceits, anecdotes, and quotations from the Greek and the Latin. A page of the Magnalia is almost as richly modeled with italics as one from the Anatomy of Melancholy, and the quaintness which Mather caught from his favorite, Fuller, disports itself in textual pun and marginal anagram and the fantastic subtitles of his books and chapters. He speaks of Thomas Hooker as having angled many scores of souls into the kingdom of heaven, anagrammatizes Mrs. Hutchinson's surname into the nonsuch, and having occasion to speak of Mr. Urian Oakes's election to the presidency of Harvard College, enlarges upon the circumstance as follows. We all know that Britain knew nothing more famous than their ancient sect of Druids. The philosophers, whose order they say was instituted by one Samothes, which is in English as much to say, an heavenly man. The Celtic name Deru, for an oak, was that from whence they received their denomination as at this very day the Welch call this tree Drew, and this order of men Derwidden. And there are no small antiquaries who derive this oaken religion and philosophy from the oaks of Mamre, 
which the patriarch Abraham had as well a dwelling as an altar. That oaken plain and the eminent oak under which Abraham lodged was extant in the days of Constantine, as Isidore, Jerome, and Sozomen have assured us. Yea, there are shrewd probabilities that Noah himself had lived in this very oak plain before him, for this very place we call Oye, which was the name of Noah, so styled from the Ogion, subsineritis panibus, sacrifices, which he did use to offer in this renowned grove. And it was from this example that the ancients, and particularly that the druids of the nations, chose oaken retirements for their studies. Reader, let us now upon another account behold the students of Harvard College as a rendezvous of happy druids, under the influences of so rare a president. But alas, our joy must be short-lived, for on July twenty-fifth, 1681, the stroke of a sudden death felled the tree. Qui tantum inter caput extulit omnis, quantum lenta solent inter viberna cipressi. Mr. Oakes, thus being transplanted into the better world, the presidentship was immediately tendered unto Mr. Increase Mather. This will suffice as an example of the bad taste and laborious pedantry which disfigured Mather's writing. In its substance the book is a perfect thesaurus, and inasmuch as nothing is unimportant in the history of the beginnings of a nation such as this is, and is destined to be, the Magnalia will always remain a valuable and interesting work. Cotton Mather, born in 1663, was of the second generation of Americans, his grandfather being of the immigration, but his father a native of Dorchester, Massachusetts. A comparison of his writings and of the writings of his contemporaries with the works of Bradford, Winthrop, Hooker, and others of the original colonists, shows that the simple and heroic faith of the pilgrims had hardened into formalism and doctrinal rigidity. The leaders of the Puritan exodus, notwithstanding their intolerance of errors in belief, were comparatively broad-minded men. They were sharers in a great national movement, and they came over when their cause was warm with the glow of martyrdom and on the eve of its coming triumph at home. About the Restoration, in 1660, the currents of national feeling no longer circulated so freely through this distant member of the body politic, and thought in America became more provincial. The English dissenters, though socially at a disadvantage as compared with the Church of England, had the great benefit of living at the center of national life, and of feeling about them the pressure of vast bodies of people who did not think as they did. In New England, for many generations, the dominant sect had things all its own way, a condition of things which is not healthy for any sect or party. Hence, Mather and the divines of his time appear in their writings very much like so many Puritan bishops, jealous of their prerogatives, magnifying their apostolate, and careful to maintain their authority over the laity. Mather had an appetite for the marvelous, and took a leading part in the witchcraft trials, of which he gave an account in his Wonders of the Invisible World, 1693. To the quaint pages of the Magnalia, our modern authors have resorted as to a collection of romances or fairy tales. Whittier, for example, took from thence the subject of his poem, The Garrison of Cape Anne, and Hawthorne embodied in Grandfather's Chair the most elaborate of Mather's biographies. This was the life of Sir William Phipps, who, from being a poor shepherd boy in his native province of Maine, rose to be the royal governor of Massachusetts, and the story of whose wonderful adventures in raising the freight of a Spanish treasure ship sunk on a reef near Port de la Plata reads less like sober fact than like some ancient fable, with talk of the Spanish main, bullion, and plate and jewels, and pieces of eight. Of Mather's generation was Samuel Sewell, Chief Justice of Massachusetts, a singularly gracious and venerable figure, who is intimately known through his diary kept from 1673 to 1729. This has been compared with the more famous diary of Samuel Pepys, which it resembles in its confidential character and the completeness of its self-revelation, but to which it is as much inferior in historic interest as the petty province here was inferior in political and social importance to Britain far away. For the most part it is a chronicle of small beer, the diarist jotting down the minutia of his domestic life and private affairs, even to the recording of such haps as this. March 23rd, I had my hair cut by G. Barrett. But it also affords instructive glimpses of public events, such as King Philip's War, the Quaker Troubles, the English Revolution of 1688, etc. 
It bears about the same relation to New England history, at the close of the seventeenth century, as Bradford's and Winthrop's journals bear to that of the first generation. Sewell was one of the justices who presided at the trial of the Salem witches, but for the part which he took in that wretched affair he made such atonement as was possible, by open confession of his mistake and his remorse in the presence of the church. Sewell was one of the first writers against African slavery in his brief tract, The Selling of Joseph, printed at Boston in 1700. His Phenomena Quedam Apocalyptica, a mystical interpretation of prophecies concerning the New Jerusalem, which he identifies with America, is remembered only because Whittier, in his Prophecy of Samuel Sewell, has paraphrased one poetic passage, which shows a loving observation of nature very rare in our colonial writers. Of poetry, indeed, or in fact of pure literature, in the narrower sense, that is, of the imaginative representation of life, there was little or none in the colonial period. There were no novels, no plays, no satires, and until the example of the spectator had begun to work on this side of the water, no experiments even at the lighter forms of essay-writing, character sketches, and literary criticism. There was verse of a certain kind, but the most generous stretch of the term would hardly allow it to be called poetry. Many of the early divines of New England relieved their pens, in the intervals of sermon-writing, of epigrams, elegies, eulogistic verses, and similar grave trifles, distinguished by the crabbed wit of the so-called metaphysical poets, whose manner was in fashion when the Puritans left England, the manner of Dunn and Cowley, and those darlings of the New English muse, the emblems of quarrels, and the divine week of Dubartas, as translated by Sylvester. The Magnalia contains a number of these things, in Latin and English and is itself well bolstered with complimentary introductions in metre by the author's friends. For example, Catonius Mathras, Anagram, Tuos Tecum Ornasti. While thus the dead in thy rare pages rise, thine with thyself thou dost immortalize. To view the odds thy learned lives invite twixt Eleutherian and Edomite. But all succeeding ages shall despair a fitting monument for thee to rear. Thy own rich pen, peace, silly Momus, peace, hath given them a lasting writ of ease. The epitaphs and mortuary verses were especially ingenious in the matter of puns, anagrams, and similar conceits. The death of the Reverend Samuel Stone of Hartford afforded an opportunity of this sort not to be missed, and his threnodist accordingly celebrated him as a whetstone, a lodestone, an ebenezer a stone for kingly david's use so fit as would not fail goliath's front to hit etc the most characteristic popular and widely circulated poem of colonial new england was michael wigglesworth's day of doom sixteen sixty two a kind of doggerel inferno which went through nine editions and was the solace says lowell of every fireside the flicker of the pine knots by which it was conned perhaps adding a livelier relish to its premonitions of eternal combustion wigglesworth had not this technical equipment of a poet his verse is sing-song his language rude and monotonous and the lurid horrors of his material hell are more likely to move mirth than fear in a modern reader but there are an unmistakable vigor of imagination and a sincerity of belief in his gloomy poem which hold it far above contempt and easily account for its universal currency among a people like the puritans one stanza has been often quoted for its grim concession to unregenerate infants of the easiest room in hell a limbus infantum which even origen need not have scrupled at the most authoritative expounder of New England Calvinism was Jonathan Edwards, 1703-1758, to a native of Connecticut and a graduate of Yale, who was minister for more than twenty years over the church in Northampton, Mass., afterward missionary to the Stockbridge Indians, and at the time of his death had just been inaugurated president of Princeton College. By virtue of his Inquiry into the Freedom of the Will, 1754, Edwards holds rank as the subtlest metaphysician of his age. This treatise was composed to justify on philosophical grounds the Calvinistic doctrines of foreordination and election by grace, though its arguments are curiously coincident with those of the scientific necessitarians, whose conclusions are as far asunder from Edwards as from the center thrice to the utmost pole. His writings belong to a theology rather than to literature, but there is an intensity and a spiritual elevation about them, apart from the profundity and acuteness of the thought, which lift them here and there into the finer ether of purely emotional or imaginative art. 
he dwelt rather upon the terrors than the comfort of the word, and his chosen themes were the dogmas of predestination, original sin, total depravity, and eternal punishment. The titles of his sermons are significant. Men, naturally God's enemies, wrath upon the wicked to the uttermost, the final judgment, etc. A natural man, he wrote, in the first of these discourses, has a heart like the heart of a devil. The heart of a natural man is as destitute of love to God as a dead, stiff, cold corp is of vital heat. Perhaps the most famous of Edward's sermons was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, preached at Enfield, Connecticut, July 8, 1741, at a time of great awakenings. And upon the ominous text, Their foot shall slide in due time. The God that holds you over the pit of hell runs an oft-quoted passage from this powerful denunciation of the wrath to come. Much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you, and is dreadfully provoked. You are ten thousand times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful venomous serpent is in ours. You hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about it. If you cry to God to pity you, he will be so far from pitying you in your doleful case that he will only tread you under foot. He will crush out your blood and make it fly, and it shall be sprinkled on his garments so as to stain all his raiment. But Edwards was a rapt soul, possessed with the love as well as the fear of God, and there are some passages of sweet and exalted feeling in his Treatise Concerning Religious Affections, 1746. Such is his portrait of Sarah Pierpont, a young lady in New Haven, who afterward became his wife, and who will sometimes go about from place to place singing sweetly, and no one knows for what. She loves to be alone, walking in the fields and groves, and seems to have someone invisible always conversing with her. Edward's printed works numbered thirty-six titles. A complete edition of them in ten volumes was published in 1829 by his great-grandson Sereno Dwight. The memoranda from Edward's notebooks, quoted by his editor and biographer, exhibit a remarkable precocity. Even as a schoolboy and a college student, he had made deep guesses in physics as well as metaphysics, and as might have been predicted of a youth of his philosophical insight and ideal cast of mind, he had early anticipated Berkeley in denying the existence of matter. In passing from Mather to Edwards, we step from the seventeenth to the eighteenth century. There is the same difference between them in style and turn of thought as between Milton and Locke, or between Fuller and Dryden. The learned digressions, the witty conceits, the perpetual interlarding of the text with scraps of Latin have fallen off, even as the full-bottomed wig and the clerical gown and bands have been laid aside for the undistinguishing dress of the modern minister. In Edwards English, all is simple, precise, direct, and businesslike. Benjamin Franklin, 1706 to 1790, who was strictly contemporary with Edwards, was a contrast to him in every respect. As Edwards represents the spirituality and other worldliness of Puritanism, Franklin stands for the worldly and secular side of American character, and he illustrates the development of the New England Englishman into the modern Yankee. Clear rather than subtle, without ideality or romance or fineness of emotion or poetic lift, intensely practical and utilitarian, broad-minded, inventive, shrewd, versatile, Franklin's sturdy figure became typical of his time and his people. He was the first and the only man of letters in colonial America who acquired a cosmopolitan fame, and impressed his characteristic Americanism upon the mind of Europe. He was the embodiment of common sense and of the useful virtues, with the enterprise but without the nervousness of his modern compatriots, uniting the philosopher's openness of mind with the sagacity and quickness of resource of the self-made businessman. He was representative also of his age, an age of Aufklärung, Eclaircissement, or Clearing Up. By the middle of the eighteenth century a change had taken place in American society. Trade had increased between the different colonies. Boston, New York, and Philadelphia were considerable towns. Democratic feeling was spreading. Over forty newspapers were published in America at the outbreak of the Revolution. Politics claimed more attention than formerly, and theology less. With all this intercourse and mutual reaction of the various colonies upon one another, the isolated theocracy of New England naturally relaxed somewhat of its grip on the minds of the laity. When Franklin was a printer's apprentice in Boston, setting type on his brother's New England Courant, the fourth American newspaper, he got hold of an odd volume of The Spectator, and formed his style upon Addison, 
whose manner he afterward imitated in his busybody papers in the Philadelphia Weekly Mercury. He also read Locke and the English deistical writers, Collins and Shaftesbury, and became himself a deist and freethinker, and subsequently, when practicing his trade in London, in 1724-26, to he made the acquaintance of Dr. Mandeville, author of The Fable of the Bees, at a pale alehouse in Cheapside, called The Horns, where the famous freethinker presided over a club of wits and boon companions. Though a native of Boston, Franklin is identified with Philadelphia, whither he arrived in 1723, a runaway prentice boy whose stock of cash consisted of a Dutch dollar and about a shilling in copper. The description in his autobiography of his walking up Market Street munching a loaf of bread and passing his future wife, standing on her father's doorstep, has become almost as familiar as the anecdote about Whittington and his cat. It was in the practical sphere that Franklin was greatest, as an originator and executor of projects for the general welfare. The list of his public services is almost endless. He organized the Philadelphia Fire Department and street cleaning services, and the colonial postal system which grew into the United States Post Office Department. He started the Philadelphia Public Library, the American Philosophical Society, the University of Pennsylvania, and the first American magazine, the General Magazine and Historical Chronicle so that he was almost singly the father of whatever intellectual life the Pennsylvania colony could boast of. In 1754, when commissioners from the colonies met at Albany, Franklin proposed a plan which was adopted for the union of all the colonies under one government. But all these things, as well as his mission to England in 1757, on behalf of the Pennsylvania Assembly in its dispute with the proprietaries, his share in the Declaration of Independence, of which he was one of the signers, and his residence in France as ambassador of the United Colonies, belong to the political history of the country. To the history of American science belong his celebrated experiments in electricity, and his benefits to mankind in both of these departments were aptly summed up in the famous epigram of the French statesman Turgot. Eru puit coelo fulmen sceptrumque tyrannis. Franklin's success in Europe was such as no American had yet achieved, as few Americans since him have achieved. Hume and Voltaire were among his acquaintances and his professed admirers. In France he was fairly idolized, and when he died, Mirabeau announced, The genius which has freed America and poured a flood of light over Europe has returned to the bosom of the divinity. Franklin was a great man, but hardly a great writer, though as a writer, too, he had many admirable and some great qualities. Among these were the crystal clearness and simplicity of his style. His more strictly literary performances, such as his essays after the spectator, hardly rise above mediocrity, and are neither better nor worse than other imitations of Addison. But in some of his lighter bagatelles there are a homely wisdom and a charming playfulness which have won them enduring favor. Such are his famous stories of the whistle, his dialogue between Franklin and the gout, his letters to Madame Helvetius, and his verses entitled Paper. The greater portion of his writings consist of papers on general politics, commerce, and political economy, contributions to the public questions of the day. These are of the nature of journalism rather than of literature, and many of them were published in his newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, the medium through which for many years he most strongly influenced American opinion. The most popular of his writings were his autobiography and Poor Richard's Almanac. The former of these was begun in 1771, resumed in 1788, but never completed. It has remained the most widely current book in our colonial literature. Poor Richard's Almanac, begun in 1732 and continued for about twenty-five years, had an annual circulation of ten thousand copies. It was filled with proverbial sayings in prose and verse, inculcating the virtues of industry, honesty, and frugality. Some of these were original with Franklin, others were selected from the proverbial wisdom of the ages, but a new force was given them by pungent turns of expression. Poor Richard's saws were such as these, little strokes fell great oaks, three removes are as bad as a fire, early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise, never leave that till tomorrow what you can do today, what maintains one vice would bring up two children, it is hard for an empty bag to stand upright. Now and then there are truths of a higher kind than these in Franklin, and saint Beuve, the great French critic, quotes as an example of his occasional finer moods the saying, 
Truth and sincerity have a certain distinguishing native luster about them which cannot be counterfeited. They are like fire and flame that cannot be painted. But the sage who invented the Franklin stove had no disdain of small utilities, and in general the last word of his philosophy is well expressed in a passage of his autobiography. Human felicity is produced not so much by great pieces of good fortune that seldom happen, as by little advantages that occur every day. Thus, if you teach a poor young man to shave himself and keep his razor in order, you may contribute more to the happiness of his life than in giving him a thousand guineas. End of Part 2 Chapter 1 Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany On March 6, 2009Part two, chapter two of a brief history of English and American literature. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kalinda. A brief history of English and American literature by Henry A. Beers. Part two, chapter two. The Revolutionary Period, seventeen sixty five to eighteen fifteen. It will be convenient to treat the fifty years which elapsed between the meeting at New York in 1765 of a Congress of Delegates from nine colonies to protest against the Stamp Act, and the close of the Second War with England in 1815, as, for literary purposes, a single period. This half-century was the formative era of the American nation. Historically it is divisible into the years of revolution and the years of construction but the men who led the movement for independence were also in great part the same who guided in shaping the constitution of the new republic, and the intellectual impress of the whole period is one and the same. The character of the age was as distinctly political as that of the colonial era, in New England at least, was theological, and literature must still continue to borrow its interest from history. Pure literature, or what, for want of a better term, we call belle lettre was not born in America until the nineteenth century was well under way. It is true that the Revolution had its humor, its poetry, and even its fiction, but these were strictly for the home market. They hardly penetrated the consciousness of Europe at all, and are not to be compared with the contemporary work of English authors like Cowper and Sheridan and Burke. Their importance for us today is rather antiquarian than literary, though the most noteworthy of them will be mentioned in due course in the present chapter. It is also true that one or two of Irving's early books fall within the last years of the period now under consideration, but literary epics overlap one another at the edges, and these writings may best be postponed to a subsequent chapter. Among the most characteristic products of the intellectual stir that preceded and accompanied the revolutionary movement were the speeches of political orators like Samuel Adams, James Otis, and Josiah Quincy in Massachusetts, and Patrick Henry in Virginia. Oratory is the art of a free people, and as in the forensic assemblies of Greece and Rome, and in the Parliament of Great Britain, so in the conventions and congresses of revolutionary America it sprang up and flourished naturally. The age, moreover, was an eloquent, not to say a rhetorical age, and the influence of Johnson's oratund prose, of the declamatory letters of Junius, and of the speeches of Burke, Fox, Sheridan, and the elder Pitt, is perceptible in the debates of our early congresses. The fame of a great orator like that of a great actor is largely traditionary. The spoken word transferred to the printed page loses the glow which resided in the man and the moment. A speech is good if it attains its aim, if it moves the hearers to the end which is sought. But the fact that this end is often temporary and occasional rather than universal and permanent explains why so few speeches are really literature. If this is true, even where the words of an orator are preserved exactly as they were spoken, it is doubly true when we have only the testimony of contemporaries as to the effect which the oration produced. The fiery utterances of Adams, Otis, and Quincy were either not reported at all, or very imperfectly reported so that posterity can judge of them only at second hand. Patrick Henry has fared better, many of his orations being preserved in substance, if not in letter, in Wirt's biography. Of these the most famous was the defiant speech in the Convention of Delegates, March 28, 1775, 
throwing down the gauge of battle to the British ministry. The ringing sentences of this challenge are still declaimed by schoolboys, and many of them remain as familiar as household words. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of judging of the future but by the past. Gentlemen may cry, Peace, peace, but there is no peace. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the prices of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. The eloquence of Patrick Henry was fervid rather than weighty or rich. But if such specimens of the oratory of the American patriots as have come down to us fail to account for the wonderful impression that their words are said to have produced upon their fellow countrymen, we should remember that they are at a disadvantage when read instead of heard. The imagination should supply all those accessories which gave them vitality when first pronounced, the living presence and voice of the speaker, the listening senate, the grave excitement of the hour and of the impending conflict the wordiness and exaggeration, the highly Latinized diction, the rhapsodies about freedom which hundreds of Fourth of July addresses have since turned into platitudes, all these coming hot from the lips of men whose actions in the field confirmed the earnestness of their speech, were effective enough in the crisis and for the purpose to which they were addressed. The press was an agent in the cause of liberty no less potent than the platform, and patriots such as Adams, Otis, Quincy, Warren, and Hancock wrote constantly for the newspapers essays and letters on the public questions of the time, signed Vindex, Hyperion, Independent, Brutus, Cassius, and the like, and couched in language which to the taste of today seems rather over-rhetorical. Among the most important of these political essays were the Circular Letter to Each Colonial Legislature, published by Adams and Otis in 1768, Quincy's Observations on the Boston Port Bill, 1774, and Otis's Rights of the British Colonies, a pamphlet of 120 pages, printed in 1764. No collection of Otis's writings has ever been made. The Life of Quincy, published by his own son, preserves for posterity his journals and correspondence, his newspaper essays, and his speeches at the bar, taken from the Massachusetts Law Reports. Among the political literature which is of perennial interest to the American people are such state documents as the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States, and the messages, inaugural addresses, and other writings of our early presidents. Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, and the father of the Democratic Party, was the author of the Declaration of Independence, whose opening sentences have become commonplaces in the memory of all readers. One sentence in particular has been as a shibboleth, or war cry, or declaration of faith among Democrats of all shades of opinion. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Not so familiar to modern readers is the following, which an English historian of our literature calls the most eloquent clause of that great document, and the most interesting suppressed passage in American literature. Jefferson was a Southerner, but even at that early day the South had grown sensitive on the subject of slavery, and Jefferson's arraignment of King George for promoting the peculiar institution was left out from the final draft of the Declaration in deference to Southern members. He has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty, in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. This piratical warfare, the opprobrium of infidel powers, is the warfare of the Christian king of Great Britain. Determined to keep open a market where men should be bought and sold, he has prostituted his negative by suppressing every legislative attempt to restrain this execrable commerce. And, that this assemblage of horrors might want no fact of distinguished die, he is now exciting those very people to rise in arms against us, and purchase that liberty of which he deprived them by murdering the people upon whom he obtruded them, and thus paying off former crimes committed against the liberties of one people, by crimes which he urges them to commit against the lives of another. The tone of apology or defense which Calhoun and other southern statesmen afterward adopted on the subject of slavery was not taken by the men of Jefferson's generation. Another famous Virginian, John Randolph of Roanoke, 
himself a slaveholder, in his speech on the Militia Bill in the House of Representatives, December 10, 1811, said, I speak from facts when I say that the night bell never tolls for fire in Richmond, that the mother does not hug her infant more closely to her bosom. This was said apropos of the danger of a servile insurrection in the event of a war with England, a war which actually broke out in the year following, but was not attended with the slave rising which Randolph predicted. Randolph was a thorough-going states' rights man, and though opposed to slavery on principle, he cried hands off to any interference by the general government with the domestic institutions of the states. His speeches read better than most of his contemporaries. They are interesting in their exhibit of a bitter and eccentric individuality, witty, incisive, and expressed in a pungent and familiar style which contrasts refreshingly with the diplomatic language and glittering generalities of most congressional oratory, whose verbiage seems to keep its subject always at arm's length. Another noteworthy writing of Jefferson's was his inaugural address of March 4, 1801, with its program of equal and exact justice to all men, of whatever state or persuasion, religious or political, peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none, the support of the state governments in all their rights, absolute acquiescence in the decisions of the majority, the supremacy of the civil over the military authority, economy in the public expense, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, and freedom of person under the protection of habeas corpus, and trial by juries impartially selected. During his six years' residence in France as American minister, Jefferson had become indoctrinated with the principles of French democracy. His main service and that of his party, the Democratic, or as it was then called, the Republican Party, to the young republic, was in its insistence upon toleration of all beliefs and upon the freedom of the individual from all forms of governmental restraint. Jefferson has some claims to rank as an author in general literature. Educated at William and Mary College in the old Virginia capital, Williamsburg, he became the founder of the University of Virginia, in which he made special provision for the study of Anglo-Saxon, and in which the liberal scheme of instruction and discipline was conformed, in theory at least, to the university idea. His notes on Virginia are not without literary quality, and one description in particular has been often quoted, the passage of the Potomac through the Blue Ridge, in which is this poetically imaginative touch. The mountain being cloven asunder, she presents to your eye, through the cleft, a small catch of smooth blue horizon at an infinite distance in the plain country, inviting you, as it were, from the riot and tumult roaring around, to pass through the breach and participate of the calm below. After the conclusion of peace with England in 1783, political discussion centered about the Constitution, which in 1788 took the place of the looser Articles of Confederation adopted in 1778. The Constitution, as finally ratified, was a compromise between two parties, the Federalists, who wanted a strong central government, and the Anti-Federals, afterward called Republicans, or Democrats, who wished to preserve state sovereignty. The debates on the adoption of the Constitution, both in the General Convention of the States, which met at Philadelphia in 1787, and in the separate state conventions called to ratify its action, form a valuable body of comment and illustration upon the instrument itself. One of the most notable of the speeches in opposition was Patrick Henry's address before the Virginia Convention. That this is a consolidated government, he said, is demonstrably clear, and the danger of such a government is, to my mind, very striking. The leader of the Federal Party was Alexander Hamilton, the ablest constructive intellect among the statesmen of our revolutionary era, of whom Talleyrand said that he had never known his equal, whom Guizot classed with the men who have best known the vital principles and fundamental conditions of a government worthy of its name and mission. Hamilton's speech on the expediency of adopting the Federal Constitution, delivered in the Convention of New York, June 24, 1788, was a masterly statement of the necessity and advantages of the Union. But the most complete exposition of the constitutional philosophy of the Federal Party was the series of eighty-five papers entitled The Federalist, printed during the years 1787 to 88, and mostly in the Independent Journal of New York, over the signature Publius. These were the work of Hamilton, of John Jay, afterward Chief Justice, and of James Madison, afterward President of the United States. 
The Federalist Papers, though written in a somewhat ponderous diction, are among the great landmarks of American history, and were in themselves a political education to the generation that read them. Hamilton was a brilliant and versatile figure, a persuasive orator, a forcible writer, and as Secretary of the Treasury under Washington, the foremost of American financiers. He was killed in a duel by Aaron Burr at Hoboken in 1804. The Federalists were victorious, and under the provisions of the new Constitution, George Washington was inaugurated first President of the United States on March 4, 1789. Washington's writings have been collected by Jared Sparks. They consist of journals, letters, messages, addresses, and public documents, for the most part plain and businesslike in manner, and without any literary pretensions. The most elaborate and the best known of them is his farewell address, issued on his retirement from the presidency in 1796. In the composition of this he was assisted by Madison, Hamilton, and Jay. It is wise in substance and dignified, though somewhat stilted in expression. The correspondence of John Adams, second president of the United States, and his diary kept from 1755 to 85, should also be mentioned as important sources for a full knowledge of this period. In the long life-and-death struggle of Great Britain against the French Republic and its successor Napoleon Bonaparte, the Federalist Party in this country naturally sympathized with England and the Jeffersonian democracy with France. The Federalists, who distrusted the sweeping abstractions of the French Revolution and clung to the conservative notions of a checked and balanced freedom, inherited from English precedent, were accused of monarchical and aristocratic leanings. On their side they were not slow to accuse their adversaries of French atheism and French Jacobinism. By a singular reversal of the natural order of things, the strength of the Federalist Party was in New England, which was socially democratic, while the strength of the Jeffersonians was in the South whose social structure, owing to the system of slavery, was intensely aristocratic. The War of 1812 with England was so unpopular in New England, by reason of the injury which it threatened to inflict on its commerce, that the Hartford Convention of 1814 was more than suspected of a design to bring about the secession of New England from the Union. A good deal of oratory was called out by the debates on the commercial treaty with Great Britain negotiated by Jay in 1795, by the Alien and Sedition Law of 1798, and by other pieces of Federalist legislation previous to the downfall of that party and the election of Jefferson to the presidency in 1800. The best of the Federalist orators during those years was Fisher Ames of Massachusetts, and the best of his orations was, perhaps, his speech on the British Treaty in the House of Representatives, April 18, 1796. The speech was, in great measure, a protest against American chauvinism and the violation of international obligations. It has been said the world ought to rejoice if Britain was sunk in the sea. If, where there are now men and wealth and laws and liberty, there was no more than a sandbank for sea monsters to fatten on, space for the storms of the ocean to mingle in conflict. What is patriotism? Is it a narrow affection for the spot where a man was born? Are the very clods where we tread entitled to this ardent preference because they are greener? I see no exception to the respect that is paid among nations to the law of good faith. It is observed by barbarians. A whiff of tobacco smoke or a string of beads gives not merely binding force but sanctity to treaties. Even in Algiers a truce may be bought for money but when ratified, even Algiers is too wise or too just to disown and annul its obligation. Ames was a scholar, and his speeches are more finished and thoughtful, more literary in a way, than those of his contemporaries. His eulogiums on Washington and Hamilton are elaborate tributes, rather excessive, perhaps, in laudation and in classical allusions. In all the oratory of the revolutionary period, there is nothing equal in deep and condensed energy of feeling to the single clause in Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. A prominent figure during and after the War of Revolution was Thomas Paine, or, as he was somewhat disrespectfully called, Tom Paine. He was a dissenting minister, who, conceiving himself ill-treated by the British government, came to Philadelphia in 1774 and threw himself heart and soul into the colonial cause. His pamphlet, Common Sense, issued in 1776, began with the famous words, These are the times that try men's souls. 
This was followed by The Crisis, a series of political essays advocating independence and the establishment of a republic, published in periodical form, though at irregular intervals. Paine's rough and vigorous advocacy was of great service to the American patriots. His writings were popular, and his arguments were of a kind easily understood by plain people, addressing themselves to the common sense, the prejudices and passions of unlettered readers. He afterward went to France and took an active part in the popular movement there, crossing swords with Burke in his Rights of Man, 1791-92, written in defense of the French Revolution. He was one of the two foreigners who sat in the convention, but falling under suspicion during the days of the terror, he was committed to the prison of the Luxembourg, and only released upon the fall of Robespierre, July twenty seventh, 1794. While in prison he wrote a portion of his best-known work, The Age of Reason. This appeared in two parts, in 1794 and 1795, the manuscript of the first part having been entrusted to Joel Barlow, the American poet, who happened to be in Paris when Paine was sent to prison. The Age of Reason damaged Paine's reputation in America, where the name of Tom Paine became a stench in the nostrils of the godly and a synonym for atheism and blasphemy. His book was denounced from a hundred pulpits, and copies of it were carefully locked away from the sight of the young, whose religious beliefs it might undermine. It was, in effect, a crude and popular statement of the deistic argument against Christianity. What the cutting logic and persiflage, the sourire hideux, of Voltaire had done in France, Paine, with coarser materials, essayed to do for the English-speaking populations. Deism was in the air of the time. Franklin, Jefferson, Ethan Allen, Joel Barlow, and other prominent Americans were openly or unavowedly deistic. Free thought, somehow, went along with democratic opinions, and was a part of the liberal movement of the age. Paine was a man without reverence, imagination, or religious feeling. He was no scholar, and he was not troubled by any perception of the deeper and subtler aspects of the questions which he touched. In his examination of the Old and New Testaments, he insisted that the Bible was an imposition and a forgery, full of lies, absurdities, and obscenities. Supernatural Christianity, with all its mysteries and miracles, was a fraud practiced by priests upon the people, and churches were instruments of oppression in the hands of tyrants. This way of accounting for Christianity would not now be accepted by even the most advanced thinkers. The contest between skepticism and revelation has long since shifted to other grounds. Both the philosophy and the temper of the age of reason belong to the eighteenth century. But Paine's downright pugnacious method of attack was effective with shrewd, half-educated doubters, and in America well-thumbed copies of his book passed from hand to hand in many a rural tavern or store where the village atheist wrestled in debate with the deacon or the schoolmaster. Paine rested his argument against Christianity upon the familiar grounds of the incredibility of miracles, the falsity of prophecy, the cruelty or immorality of Moses and David and other Old Testament worthies, the disagreement of the evangelists in their gospels, etc. The spirit of his book and his competence as a critic are illustrated by his saying of the New Testament, Any person who could tell a story of an apparition, or of a man's walking, could have made such books, for the story is most wretchedly told. The sum total of a parson's learning is A, B, Ab, and Hick, Heck, Hock, and this is more than sufficient to have enabled them, had they lived at the time, to have written all the books of the New Testament. When we turn from the political and controversial writings of the Revolution to such lighter literature as existed, we find little that would deserve mention in a more crowded period. The few things in this kind that have kept afloat on the current of the time, rari nantes in gorgite vasto, attract attention rather by reason of their fewness than of any special excellence that they have. During the eighteenth century American literature continued to accommodate itself to changes of caste in the old country. The so-called classical or Augustan writers of the reign of Queen Anne replaced other models of style. The spectator set the fashion of almost all of our lighter prose, from Franklin's busybody down to the time of Irving, who perpetuated the Addisonian tradition later than any English writer. The influence of Locke, of Dr. Johnson, and of the parliamentary orators had has already been mentioned. In poetry the example of Pope was dominant, so that we find, for example, William Livingston, who became governor of New Jersey and a member of the Continental Congress, writing in 1747 a poem on philosophic solitude which reproduces the trick of Pope's antitheses and climaxes with the imagery of the rape of the lock, 
and the didactic morality of the imitations from Horace and the moral essays. Let ardent heroes seek renown in arms, pant after fame and rush to war's alarms. To shining palaces let fools resort, and dunces cringe to be esteemed at court. Mine be the pleasure of a rural life, from noise remote and ignorant of strife, far from the painted bell and white-gloved bow, the lawless masquerade and midnight show. From ladies, lapdogs, courtiers, garters, stars, fops, fiddlers, tyrants, emperors, and czars. The most popular poem of the revolutionary period was John Trumbull's McFingal, published in part at Philadelphia in 1775, and in complete shape at Hartford in 1782. It went through more than thirty editions in America, and was several times reprinted in England. McFingal was a satire in four cantos, directed against the American loyalists, and modeled quite closely upon Butler's mock heroic poem, Hudibras. As Butler's hero sallies forth to put down May games and bear baitings, so the Tory McFingal goes out against the liberty poles and bonfires of the patriots, but is tarred and feathered and otherwise ill-entreated, and finally takes refuge in the camp of General Gage at Boston. The poem is written with smartness and vivacity, attains often to drollery and sometimes to genuine humor. It remains one of the best of American political satires, and unquestionably the most successful of the many imitations of Hudibras, whose manner it follows so closely that some of its lines, which have passed into currency as proverbs, are generally attributed to Butler. For example, No man e'er felt the halter draw with good opinion of the law. Or this, For any man with half an eye what stands before him may espy, but optic sharp it needs, I ween, to see what is not to be seen. Trumbull's wit did not spare the vulnerable points of his own countrymen, as in his sharp skit at slavery in the couplet about the newly adopted flag of the Confederation, inscribed with inconsistent types of liberty and thirteen stripes. Trumbull was one of a group of Connecticut literati, who made much noise in their time as the Hartford Wits. The other members of the group were Lemuel Hopkins, David Humphreys, Joel Barlow, Elihu Smith, Theodore Dwight, and Richard Alsop. Trumbull, Humphreys, and Barlow had formed a friendship and a kind of literary partnership at Yale, where they were contemporaries of each other and of Timothy Dwight. During the war they served in the army in various capacities, and at its close they found themselves again together for a few years at Hartford, where they formed a club that met weekly for social and literary purposes. Their presence lent a sort of éclat to the little provincial capital, and their writings made it for a time an intellectual center quite as important as Boston or Philadelphia or New York. The Hartford Wits were staunch Federalists and used their pens freely in support of the administrations of Washington and Adams, and in ridicule of Jefferson and the Democrats. In 1786-87, to Trumbull, Hopkins, Barlow, and Humphreys published in the New Haven Gazette a series of satirical papers entitled The Anarchiad, suggested by the English Roliad, and purporting to be extracts from an ancient epic on the restoration of chaos and substantial night. These papers were an effort to correct, by ridicule, the anarchic condition of things which preceded the adoption of the Federal Constitution in 1789. It was a time of great confusion and discontent, when in parts of the country democratic mobs were protesting against the vote of five years' pay by the Continental Congress to the officers of the American army. The Anarchiad was followed by The Echo and The Political Greenhouse, written mostly by Alsop and Theodore Dwight, and similar in character and tendency to the earlier series. Time has greatly blunted the edge of these satires, but they were influential in their day, and are an important part of the literature of the old Federalist Party. Humphreys became afterward distinguished in the diplomatic service, and was successfully ambassador to Portugal and to Spain, whence he introduced into America the breed of merino sheep. He had been on Washington's staff during the war, and was several times an inmate of his house at Mount Vernon, where he produced in 1785 the best known of his writings, Mount Vernon, an ode of a rather mild description which once had admirers. Joel Barlow cuts a larger figure in contemporary letters. After leaving Hartford in 1788, he went to France, where he resided for seventeen years, made a fortune in speculations, and became imbued with French principles, writing a song in praise of the guillotine, which gave great scandal to his old friends at home. In 1805 he returned to America and built a fine residence near Washington, which he called Calorama. 
Barlow's literary fame in his own generation rested upon his prodigious epic, The Columbiad. The first form of this was The Vision of Columbus, published at Hartford in 1787. This he afterward recast and enlarged into The Columbiad, issued in Philadelphia in 1807 and dedicated to Robert Fulton, the inventor of the steamboat. This was by far the most sumptuous piece of bookmaking that had then been published in America, and was embellished with plates executed by the best London engravers. The Columbiad was a grandiose performance, and has been the theme of much ridicule by later writers. Hawthorne suggested its being dramatized, and put on to the accompaniment of artillery and thunder and lightning. And E. P. Whipple declared that no critic in the last fifty years has read more than a hundred lines of it. In its ambitiousness and its length, it was symptomatic of the spirit of the age which was patriotically determined to create, by tour de force, a national literature of a size commensurate with the scale of American nature and the destinies of the Republic. As America was bigger than Argos and Troy, we ought to have a bigger epic than the Iliad. Accordingly, Barlow makes Hesper fetch Columbus from his prison to a hill of vision, where he unrolls before his eye a panorama of the history of America, or, as our bards then preferred to call it, Columbia. He shows him the conquest of Mexico by Cortez, the rise and fall of the kingdoms of the Incas in Peru, the settlements of the English colonies in North America, the old French and Indian wars, the revolution ending with a prophecy of the future greatness of the newborn nation. The machinery of the vision was borrowed from the eleventh and twelfth books of Paradise Lost. Barlow's verse was the ten-syllabled rhyming couplet of Pope, and his poetic style was distinguished by the vague, glittering imagery and the false sublimity which marked the epic attempts of the Queen Anne poets. Though Barlow was but a masquerader in true heroic, he showed himself a true poet in mock heroic. His Hasty Pudding, written in Savoy in 1793, and dedicated to Mrs. Washington, was thoroughly American, in subject at least, and its humor, though over-elaborate, is good. One couplet in particular has prevailed against oblivion. E'en in thy native regions how I blush to hear the Pennsylvanians call thee mush. Another Connecticut poet, one of the seven who were fondly named the Pleiades of Connecticut, was Timothy Dwight, whose conquest of Canaan, written shortly after his graduation from college, but not published until 1785, was, like the Columbiad, an experiment toward the domestication of the epic muse in America. It was written like Barlow's poem, in rhymed couplets, and the patriotic impulse of the time shows oddly in the introduction of our Revolutionary War by way of episode among the wars of Israel. Greenfield Hill, 1794, was an idyllic and moralizing poem, descriptive of a rural parish in Connecticut, of which the author was for a time the pastor. It is not quite without merit, shows plainly the influence of Goldsmith, Thompson, and Beatty, but as a whole is tedious and tame. Byron was amused that there should have been an American poet christened Timothy, and it is to be feared that amusement would have been the chief emotion kindled in the breast of the wicked Voltaire, had he ever chanced to see the stern dedication to himself of the same poet's Triumph of Infidelity, 1788. Much more important than Dwight's poetry was his able Theology Explained and Defended, 1794, a restatement, with modifications, of the Calvinism of Jonathan Edwards, which was accepted by the Congregational Churches of New England as an authoritative exponent of the orthodoxy of the time. His Travels in New England and New York, including descriptions of Niagara, the White Mountains, Lake George, the Catskills, and other passages of natural scenery, not so familiar then as now, was published posthumously in 1821, was praised by Southey, and is still readable. As president of Yale College from 1795 to 1817, Dwight, by his learning and ability, his sympathy with young men, and the force and dignity of his character, exerted a great influence in the community. The strong political bias of the time drew into its vortex most of the miscellaneous literature that was produced. A number of ballads, serious and comic, Whig and Tory, dealing with the battles and other incidents of the long war, enjoyed a wide circulation in the newspapers, or were hawked about in printed broadsides. Most of these have no literary merit, and are now mere antiquarian curiosities. A favorite piece on the Tory side was The Cow Chase, a cleverish parody on Chevy Chase, written by the gallant and unfortunate Major Andre, and at the expense of mad Anthony Wayne. 
The national song Yankee Doodle was evolved during the Revolution, and, as is the case with John Brown's body and many other popular melodies, some obscurity hangs about its origin. The air was an old one, and the words of the chorus seem to have been adapted or corrupted from a Dutch song, and applied in derision to the provincials by the soldiers of the British army as early as 1755. Like many another nickname, the term Yankee Doodle was taken up by the nicknamed and proudly made their own. The stanza, Yankee Doodle came to town, etc., antedates the war, but the first complete set of words to the tomb was the Yankees' return from camp, which is apparently of the year 1775. The most popular humorous ballad on the Whig side was The Battle of the Kegs, founded on a laughable incident of the campaign at Philadelphia. This was written by Francis Hopkinson, a Philadelphian, and one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Hopkinson has some title rank as one of the earliest American humorists. Without the keen wit of McFingal, some of his miscellaneous essays and occasional writings, published in 1792, have more geniality and hardiness than Trumbull's satire. His letter on whitewashing is a bit of domestic humor that foretokens the Danbury newsman, and his modern learning, 1784, a burlesque on college examinations, in which a salt box is described from the point of view of metaphysics, logic, natural philosophy, mathematics, anatomy, surgery, and chemistry, long kept its place in school readers and other collections. His son, Joseph Hopkinson, wrote the song of Hail Columbia, which is saved from insignificance only by the music to which it was married the then popular air of The President's March. The words were written in 1798, on the eve of a threatened war with France, and at a time when party spirit ran high. It was sung nightly by crowds in the streets, and for a whole season by a favorite singer at the theater, for by this time there were theaters in Philadelphia, in New York, and even in Puritanic Boston. Much better than Hail Columbia was the Star-Spangled Banner, the words of which were composed by Francis Scott Key, a Marylander, during the bombardment of the British of Fort McHenry near Baltimore, in 1812. More pretentious than these was the once celebrated ode of Robert Treat Payne, Jr., Adams and Liberty, recited at an anniversary of the Massachusetts Charitable Fire Society. The sale of this is said to have netted its author over $750, but it is, notwithstanding, a very wooden performance. Payne was a young Harvard graduate who had married an actress playing at the old Federal Street Theatre, the first playhouse, opened in Boston, in 1794. His name was originally Thomas, but this was changed for him by the Massachusetts legislature, because he did not wish to be confounded with the author of The Age of Reason. Dim are those names erstwhile in battle loud, and many an old revolutionary worthy who fought for liberty with sword and pen is now utterly forgotten, or consigned to the limbo of Dukink's Cyclopedia and Griswold's Poets of America. Here and there a line has, by accident, survived to do duty as a motto or inscription, while all its context is buried in oblivion. Few have read anything more of Jonathan M. Sewell's, for example, than the couplet, No pent-up Utica contracts your powers, but the whole boundless continent is yours, taken from his epilogue to Cato, written in 1778. Another revolutionary poet was Philip Freneau, that rascal Freneau, as Washington called him, when annoyed by the attacks upon his administration in Freneau's National Gazette. He was of Huguenot descent, was a classmate of Madison at Princeton College, was taken prisoner by the British during the war, and when the war was over, engaged in journalism as an ardent supporter of Jefferson and the Democrats. Freneau's patriotic verses and political lampoons are now unreadable but he deserves to rank as the first real American poet, by virtue of his Wild Honeysuckle, Indian Burying Ground, Indian Student, and a few other little pieces, which exhibit a grace and delicacy inherited, perhaps, with his French blood. Indeed, to speak strictly, all of the poets hitherto mentioned were nothing but rhymers, but in Freneau we meet with something of beauty and artistic feeling, something which still keeps his verses fresh. In his treatment of Indian themes, in particular, appear for the first time a sense of the picturesque and poetic elements in the character and wild life of the red man, and that pensive sentiment which the fading away of the tribes toward the sunset has left in the wake of their retreating footsteps. In this, Freneau anticipates Cooper and Longfellow, though his work is slight compared with the Leatherstocking Tales or Hiawatha. At the time when the Revolutionary War broke out, the population of the colonies was over three millions. Philadelphia had 30,000 inhabitants, and the frontier had retired to a comfortable distance from the seaboard. 
The Indian had already grown legendary to town-dwellers, and Freneau fetches his Indian student not from the outskirts of the settlement, but from the remote backwoods of the state. From Susquehanna's farthest springs, where savage tribes pursue their game, his blanket tied with yellow strings, a shepherd of the forest came. Campbell lifted in his poem O'Connor's Child the last line of the following stanza from Freneau's Indian burying ground. By midnight moons or moistening dews, investments for the chase arrayed, the hunter still the deer pursues, the hunter and the deer a shade. And Walter Scott did Freneau the honor to borrow, in Marmion, the final line of one of the stanzas of his poem on the Battle of Utah Springs. They saw their injured country's woe, the flaming town, the wasted field. Then rushed to meet the insulting foe, they took the spear, but left the shield. Scott inquired of an American gentleman who wished him the authorship of this poem, which he had by heart, and pronounced it as fine a thing of the kind as there was in the language. The American drama and American prose fiction had their beginnings during the period now under review. A company of English players came to this country in 1752, and made the tour of many of the principal towns. The first play acted here by professionals on a public stage was The Merchant of Venice, which was given by the English company at Williamsburg, Virginia, in 1752. The first regular theater building was at Annapolis, Maryland, where in the same year this troupe performed, among other pieces, Farquhar's Bow's Stratagem. In 1753 a theater was built in New York, and one in 1759 in Philadelphia. The Quakers of Philadelphia and the Puritans of Boston were strenuously opposed to the acting of plays, and in the latter city the players were several times arrested during their performances, under a Massachusetts law forbidding dramatic performances. At Newport, Rhode Island, on the other hand, which was a health resort for planters from the southern states and the West Indies, and the largest slave market in the north, the actors were hospitably received. The first play known to have been written by an American was The Prince of Parthia, 1765, a closet drama by Thomas Godfrey of Philadelphia. The first play by an American writer acted by professionals in a public theater was Royal Tyler's Contrast, performed in New York in 1786. The former of these was very high tragedy, and the latter very low comedy, and neither of them is otherwise remarkable than as being the first of a long line of indifferent dramas. There is, in fact, no American dramatic literature worth speaking of, not a single American play of even the second rank, unless we accept a few graceful parlor comedies like Mr. Howell's Elevator and Sleeping Car. Royal Tyler, the author of Contrast, cut quite a figure in his day as a wit and a journalist, and eventually became Chief Justice of Vermont. His comedy, The Georgia Speck, 1797, had a great run in Boston, and his Algerine Captive, published in the same year, was one of the earliest American novels. It was a rambling tale of adventure, constructed somewhat upon the plan of Smollett's novels, and dealing with the piracies which led to the war between the United States and Algiers in 1815. Charles Brockton Brown, the first American novelist of any note, was also the first professional man of letters in this country who supported himself entirely by his pen. He was born in Philadelphia in 1771, lived a part of his life in New York and part in his native city, where he started in 1803 the literary magazine and American Register. During the years 1798 to 1801 he published in rapid succession six romances, Wieland, Ormond, Arthur Mervyn, Edgar Huntley, Clara Howard, and Jane Talbot. Brown was an invalid and something of a recluse, with a relish for the ghastly in incident and the morbid in character. He was in some points a prophecy of Poe and Hawthorne, though his art was greatly inferior to Poe's, and almost infinitely so to Hawthorne's. His books belong more properly to the contemporary school of fiction in England, which preceded the Waverley novels, to the class that includes Beckford's Vathek, Godwin's Caleb Williams and St. Leon, Mrs. Shelley's Frankenstein, and such Gothic romances as Lewis's Monk, Walpole's Castle of Otranto, and Mrs. Radcliffe's Mysteries of Udolpho. A distinguishing characteristic of this whole school is what we may call the clumsy horrible. Brown's romances are not wanting in inventive power, in occasional situations that are intensely thrilling, and in subtle analysis of character, but they are fatally defective in art. The narrative is by turns abrupt and tiresomely prolix, 
proceeding not so much by dialogue as by elaborate dissection and discussion of motives and states of mind, interspersed with the author's reflections. The wild improbabilities of plot and the unnatural and even monstrous developments of character are in startling contrast with the old-fashioned preciseness of the language, the conversations, when there are any, being conducted in that insipid dialect in which a fine woman was called an elegant female. The following is a sample description of one of Brown's heroines, and is taken from his novel of Ormond, the leading character in which, a combination of unearthly intellect with fiendish wickedness, is thought to have been suggested by Aaron Burr. Helena Cleves was endowed with every feminine and fascinating quality. Her features were modified by the most transient sentiments, and were the seat of a softness at all times blushful and bewitching. All those graces of symmetry, smoothness, and luster, which assemble in the imagination of the painter, when he calls from the bosom of her natal deep the Paphian divinity, blended their perfections in the shade, complexion, and hair of this lady. But alas! Helena's intellectual deficiencies could not be concealed. She was proficient in the elements of no science. The doctrine of lines and surfaces was as disproportionate with her intellects as with those of the mockbird. She had not reasoned on the principles of human action nor examined the structure of society. She could not commune in their native dialect with the sages of Rome and Athens. The constitution of nature, the attributes of its author, the arrangement of the parts of the external universe, and the substance, modes of operation, and ultimate destiny of human intelligence, were enigmas unsolved and insoluble by her. Brown frequently raises a superstructure of mystery on a basis ludicrously weak. Thus the hero of his first novel, Wieland, whose father anticipates old Crook in Dickens' Bleak House by dying of spontaneous combustion, is led on by what he mistakes for spiritual voices to kill his wife and children, and the voices turn out to be produced by the ventriloquism of one Carwin, the villain of the story. Similarly, in Edgar Huntley, the plot turns upon the phenomena of sleepwalking. Brown had the good sense to place the scene of his romances in his own country, and the only passages in them which have now a living interest are his descriptions of wilderness scenery in Edgar Huntley, and his graphic account in Arthur Mervyn of the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia in 1793. Shelley was an admirer of Brown, and his experiments in prose fiction, such as Zastrozzi and St. Irvin the Rosicrucian, are of the same abnormal and speculative type. Another book which falls within this period was the journal, 1774, of John Woolman, a New Jersey Quaker, which has received the highest praise from Channing, Charles Lamb, and many others. Get the writings of John Woolman by heart, wrote Lamb, and love the early Quakers. The charm of this journal resides in its singular sweetness and innocence of feeling, the deep inward stillness peculiar to the people called Quakers. Apart from his constant use of certain phrases peculiar to the friends, Woolman's English is also remarkably graceful and pure, the transparent medium of a soul absolutely sincere and tender and humble in its sincerity. When not working at his trade as a tailor, Woolman spent his time in visiting and ministering to the monthly, quarterly, and yearly meetings of friends, traveling on horseback to their scattered communities in the backwoods of Virginia and North Carolina, and northward along the coast as far as Boston and Nantucket. He was under a concern and a heavy exercise touching the keeping of slaves, and by his writing and speaking did much to influence the Quakers against slavery. His love went out indeed to all the wretched and oppressed, to sailors and to the Indians in particular. One of his most perilous journeys was made to the settlements of Moravian Indians in the wilderness of western Pennsylvania, at Bethlehem and at Wehalusing on the Susquehanna. Some of the scruples which Woolman felt, and the quaint naivete with which he expresses them, may make the modern reader smile, but it is a smile which is very close to a tear. Thus, when in England, where he died in 1772, he would not ride nor send a letter by mail-coach, because the poor post-boys were compelled to ride long stages in winter nights and were sometimes frozen to death. So great is the hurry in the spirit of this world, that in aiming to do business quickly and to gain wealth, the creation at this day doth loudly groan. Again, having reflected that war was caused by luxury in dress, etc., the use of dyed garments grew uneasy to him, and he got and wore a hat of the natural color of the fur. In attending meetings this singularity was a trial to me, and some friends who knew not from what motives I wore it grew shy of me. 
those who spoke with me I generally informed in a few words that I believed my wearing it was not in my own will. End of Part 2 Chapter 2 Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany On March 7, 2009Part 2, Chapter 3 of A Brief History of English and American Literature. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kalinda. A Brief History of English and American Literature by Henry A. Beers. Part 2, Chapter 3 The Era of National Expansion, 1815 to 1837. The attempt to preserve a strictly chronological order must here be abandoned. About all the American literature in existence that is of any value as literature is the product of the past three quarters of a century, and the men who produced it, though older or younger, were still contemporaries. Irving's Knickerbocker's History of New York, 1809, was published within the recollection of some yet living, and the venerable poet Richard H. Dana, Irving's junior by only four years, survived to 1879 when the youngest of the generation of writers that now occupy public attention had already won their spurs. Bryant, whose Thanatopsis was printed in 1816, lived down to 1878. He saw the beginnings of our national literature, and he saw almost as much of the latest phase of it as we see today in this year, 1887. Still, even within the limits of a single lifetime, there have been progress and change, and so, while it will happen that the consideration of writers, a part of whose work falls between the dates at the head of this chapter, may be postponed to subsequent chapters, we may, in a general way, follow the sequence of time. The period between the close of the Second War with England in 1815 and the Great Financial Crash of 1837 has been called, in language attributed to President Monroe, the Era of Good Feeling. It was a time of peace and prosperity, of rapid growth in population and rapid extension of territory. The new nation was entering upon its vast estates and beginning to realize its manifest destiny. The peace with Great Britain, by calling off the Canadian Indians and the other tribes in alliance with England, had opened up the Northwest to settlement. Ohio had been admitted as a state in 1802, but at the time of President Monroe's tour in 1817, Cincinnati had only 7,000 inhabitants, and half of the state was unsettled. The Ohio River flowed for most of its course through an unbroken wilderness. Chicago was merely a fort. Hitherto the emigration to the west had been sporadic. Now it took on the dimensions of a general and almost a concerted exodus. This movement was stimulated in New England by the cold summer of 1816 and the late spring of 1817, which produced a scarcity of food that amounted in parts of the interior to a veritable famine. All through this period sounded the axe of the pioneer clearing the forest about his log cabin, and the rumble of the canvas-covered emigrant wagon over the primitive highways which crossed the Alleghenies or followed the valley of the Mohawk. S. G. Goodrich, known in letters as Peter Parley, in his Recollections of a Lifetime, 1856, describes the part of the movement which he had witnessed as a boy in Fairfield County, Connecticut. I remember very well the tide of immigration through Connecticut, on its way to the west, during the summer of 1817. Some persons went in covered wagons, frequently a family consisting of father, mother, and nine small children, with one at the breast, some on foot and some crowded together under the cover with kettles, gridirons, feather beds, crockery, and the family Bible, Watts' Psalms and Hymns, and Webster's Spelling Book, the lairs and pennets of the household. Others started in ox-carts and trudged on at the rate of ten miles a day. Many of these persons were in a state of poverty and begged their way as they went. Some died before they reached the expected Canaan. Many perished after their arrival from fatigue and privation, and others from the fever and ague, which was then certain to attack the new settlers. It was, I think, in 1818 that I published a small tract entitled T'other Side of Aldo, that is, The Other View, in contrast to the popular notion that it was the paradise of the world. It was written by Dr. Hand, a talented young physician of Berlin, who had made a visit to the West about these days. 
It consisted mainly of vivid but painful pictures of the accidents and incidents attending this wholesale migration. The roads over the Alleghanies, between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, were then rude, steep, and dangerous, and some of the more precipitous slopes were consequently strewn with the carcasses of wagons, carts, horses, oxen, which had made shipwreck in their perilous descents. But in spite of the hardships of the settler's life, the spirit of that time, as reflected in its writings, was a hopeful and light-hearted one. Westward the course of empire takes its way runs the famous line from Berkeley's poem on America. The New Englanders who removed to the Western Reserve went there to better themselves, and their children found themselves the owners of broad acres of virgin soil, in place of the stony hill pastures of Berkshire and Litchfield. There was an attraction, too, about the wild, free life of the frontiersmen, with all its perils and discomforts. The life of Daniel Boone, the pioneer of Kentucky, that dark and bloody ground, is a genuine romance. Hardly less picturesque was the old river life of the Ohio boatmen, before the coming of steam banished their queer craft from the water. Between 1810 and 1840, the center of population in the United States had moved from the Potomac to the neighborhood of Clarksburg in West Virginia, and the population itself had increased from seven to seventeen millions. The gain was made partly in the east and south, but the general drift was westward. During the years now under review, the following new states were admitted, in the order named. Indiana, Mississippi, Illinois, Alabama, Maine, Missouri, Arkansas, Michigan. Kentucky and Tennessee had been made states in the last years of the 18th century, and Louisiana, acquired by purchase from France, in 1812. The settlers in their westward march left large tracts of wilderness behind them. They took up first the rich bottom lands along the river courses, the Ohio and Miami and Licking, and later the valleys of the Mississippi and Missouri, and the shores of the Great Lakes. But there still remained backwoods in New York and Pennsylvania, though the cities of New York and Philadelphia had each a population of more than 100,000 in 1815. When the Erie Canal was opened in 1825, it ran through a primitive forest. N. P. Willis, who went by canal to Buffalo and Niagara in 1827, describes the houses and stores at Rochester as standing among the burnt stumps left by the first settlers. In the same year that saw the opening of this great waterway, the Indian tribes, numbering now about 130,000 souls, were moving across the Mississippi. Their power had been broken by General Harrison's victory over Tecumseh at the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811 and they were in fact mere remnants and fragments of the race which had hung upon the skirts of civilization, and disputed the advance of the white man for two centuries. It was not until some years later than this that railroads began to take an important share in opening up new country. The restless energy, the love of adventure, the sanguine anticipation which characterized American thought at this time, the picturesque contrast to be seen in each mushroom town where civilization was encroaching on the raw edge of wilderness. All these found expression not only in such well-known books as Copper's Pioneers, 1823, and Irving's Tour on the Prairies, 1835, but in the minor literature which is read today, if at all, not for its own sake, but for the light that it throws on the history of the national development, in such books as Paulding's story of Westward Ho and his poem The Backwoodsman, 1818 or as Timothy Flint's Recollections, 1826, and his Geography and History of the Mississippi Valley, 1827. It was not an age of great books, but it was an age of large ideas and expanding prospects. The new consciousness of empire uttered itself hastily, crudely, ran into buncombe, spread egoism, and other noisy forms of patriotic exultation, but it was thoroughly democratic and American. Though literature, or at least the best literature of the time, was not yet emancipated from English models, thought and life, at any rate, were no longer in bondage, no longer provincial. And it is significant that the party in office during these years was the Democratic, the party which had broken most completely with conservative traditions. The famous Monroe Doctrine was a pronunciamento of this aggressive democracy, and though the Federalists returned to power for a single term under John Quincy Adams, 1825-1829, to 1829, Andrew Jackson received the largest number of electoral votes, and Adams was only chosen by the House of Representatives in the absence of a majority vote for any one candidate. At the close of his term, Old Hickory, the hero of the people, the most characteristically democratic of our presidents, and the first backwoodsman who entered the White House, 
was borne into office on a wave of popular enthusiasm. We have now arrived at the time when American literature, in the higher and stricter sense of the term, really began to have an existence. S. G. Goodrich, who settled at Hartford as a bookseller and publisher in 1818, says in his recollections, About this time I began to think of trying to bring out original American works. The general impression was that we had not, and could not have, a literature. It was the precise point at which Sidney Smith had uttered that bitter taunt in the Edinburgh Review, Who Reads an American Book? It was positively injurious to the commercial credit of a bookseller to undertake American works. Washington Irving, 1783 to 1859, was the first American author whose books, as books, obtained recognition abroad, whose name was thought worthy of mention besides the names of English contemporary authors like Byron, Scott, and Coleridge. He was also the first American writer whose writings are still read for their own sake. We read Mather's Magnalia and Franklin's Autobiography and Trumbull's McFingal, if we read them at all, as history and to learn about the times or the men. But we read the sketchbook and Knickerbocker's History of New York and the Conquest of Granada for themselves and for the pleasure that they give us as pieces of literary art. We have arrived, too, at a time when we may apply a more cosmopolitan standard to the works of American writers, and may disregard many a minor author whose productions would have cut some figure had they come to light amid the poverty of our colonial age. Hundreds of these forgotten names, with specimens of their unread writings, are consigned to a limbo of immortality in the pages of Dukink's Cyclopedia and of Griswold's Poets of America and Prose Writers of America. We may select here for special mention, and as most representative of the thought of the time, the names of Irving, Cooper, Webster, and Channing. A generation was now coming upon the stage who could recall no other government in this country than the government of the United States, and to whom the Revolutionary War was but a tradition. Born in the very year of the peace, it was a part of Irving's mission, by the sympathetic charm of his writings and by the cordial recognition which he won in both countries, to allay the soreness which the Second War of 1812 to 1815 had left between England and America. He was well fitted for the task of mediator. Conservative by nature, early drawn to the venerable worship of the Episcopal Church, retrospective in his tastes, with a preference for the past and its historic associations, which, even in young America, led him to invest the Hudson and the region about New York with a legendary interest. He wrote of American themes in an English fashion, and interpreted to an American public the mellow attractiveness that he found in the life and scenery of old England. He lived in both countries, and loved them both and it is hard to say whether Irving is more of an English or of an American writer. His first visit to Europe in 1804-6 to occupied nearly two years. From 1815 to 1832 he was abroad continuously, and his domicile, as the lawyers say, during these seventeen years, was really in England, though a portion of his time was spent upon the continent, and several successive years in Spain, where he engaged upon the life of Columbus, the conquest of Granada, the companions of Columbus, and the Alhambra, all published between 1828 to 1832. From 1842 to 1846 he was again in Spain as American minister in Madrid. Irving was the last and greatest of the Addisonians. His boyish letters, signed Jonathan Oldstyle, contributed in 1802 to his brother's newspaper, The Morning Chronicle, were, like Franklin's busybody, close imitations of the spectator. To the same family belonged his Salmagundi Papers, 1807, a series of town satires on New York society, written in conjunction with his brother William and with James K. Paulding. The little tales, essays, and sketches which composed the sketchbook were written in England and published in America in periodical numbers in 1819-1820. to 1820. In this, which is in some respects his best book, he still maintained that attitude of observation and spectatorship taught him by Addison. The volume had a motto taken from Burton, I have no wife or children, good or bad, to provide for, a mere spectator of other men's fortunes, etc. And the author's account of himself began in true Addisonian fashion. I was always fond of visiting new scenes and observing strange characters and manners. But though never violently American like some later writers who have consciously sought to throw off the trammels of English tradition, Irving was in a real way original. His most distinct addition to our national literature was in his creation of what has been called the Knickerbocker legend. 
he was the first to make use for literary purposes of the old dutch traditions which clustered about the romantic scenery of the hudson colonel t w higginson in his history of the united states tells how mrs josiah quincy sailing up that river in seventeen eighty six when irving was a child three years old records that the captain of the sloop had a legend either supernatural or traditional for every scene and not a mountain reared its head unconnected with some marvellous story the material thus at hand Irving shaped into his Knickerbocker's History of New York, into the immortal story of Rip Van Winkle and the Legend of Sleepy Hollow, both published in the sketchbook, and in later additions to the same realm of fiction, such as Dolph Haliger in Bracebridge Hall, The Money Diggers, Wolford Weber, and Kid the Pirate in The Tales of a Traveler, and in some of the miscellanies from the Knickerbocker magazine collected into a volume in 1855 under the title of Wolfert's Roost. The book which made Irving's reputation was his Knickerbocker's History of New York, 1809, a burlesque chronicle making fun of the old Dutch settlers of New Amsterdam, and attributed by a familiar and now somewhat threadbare device to a little old gentleman named Diedrich Knickerbocker, whose manuscript had come into the editor's hands. The book was gravely dedicated to the New York Historical Society, and it is said to have been quoted as authentic history by a certain German scholar named Goehler in a note on a passage in Thucydides. This story, though well vouched, is hard of belief, for Knickerbocker, though excellent fooling, has nothing of the grave irony of Swift in his modest proposal, or of Defoe in his short way with dissenters. Its mock heroic intention is as transparent as in Fielding's parodies of Homer, which it somewhat resembles, particularly in the delightfully absurd description of the mustering of the clans under Peter Stuyvesant and the attack on the Swedish fort Christina. Knickerbocker's History of New York was a real addition to the comic literature of the world, a work of genuine humor, original and vital. Walter Scott said that it reminded him closely of Swift, and had touches resembling Stern. It is not necessary to claim for Irving's little masterpiece a place beside Gulliver's Travels and Tristram Shandy, but it was at least the first American book in the lighter departments of literature which need no apology and stood squarely on its own legs. It was written, too, at just the right time. Although New Amsterdam had become New York as early as 1664, the impress of its first settlers with their quaint conservative ways was still upon it when Irving was a boy. The descendants of the Dutch families formed a definite element not only in Manhattan, but all up along the kills of the Hudson, at Albany, at Schenectady, in Westchester County, at Hoboken, and Communipaw, localities made familiar to him in many a ramble and excursion. He lived to see the little provincial town of his birth grow into a great metropolis in which all national characteristics were blended together, and a tide of immigration from Europe and New England flowed over the old landmarks and obliterated them utterly. Although Irving was the first to reveal to his countrymen the literary possibilities of their early history, it must be acknowledged that with modern American life he had little sympathy. He hated politics, and in the restless democratic movement of the time, as we have described it, he found no inspiration. This moderate and placid gentleman, with his distrust of all kinds of fanaticism, had no liking for the Puritans or for their descendants, the New England Yankees, if we may judge from his sketch of Ichabod Crane in The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. His genius was reminiscent, and his imagination, like Scott's, was the historic imagination. In crude America his fancy took refuge in the picturesque aspects of the past, in survivals like the Knickerbocker Dutch and the Acadian peasants, whose isolated communities on the lower Mississippi he visited and described. He turned naturally to the ripe civilization of the old world. He was our first picturesque tourist, the first American in Europe. He rediscovered England, whose ancient churches, quiet landscapes, memory-haunted cities, Christmas celebrations, and rural festivals had for him an unfailing attraction. With pictures of these, for the most part, he filled the pages of the sketchbook and Bracebridge Hall, 1822. Delightful as are these English sketches, in which the author conducts his readers to Windsor Castle, or Stratford-on-Avon, or the Boar's Head Tavern, or sits beside him on the box of the old English stagecoach, or shares with him the yuletide cheer at the ancient English country house, their interest has somewhat faded. The pathos of the broken heart and the pride of the village, the mild satire of the art of bookmaking, the rather obvious reflections in Westminster Abbey, are not exactly to the taste of this generation. 
They are literature of leisure and retrospection, and already Irving's gentle elaboration, the refined and slightly artificial beauty of his style, and his persistently genial and sympathetic attitude have begun to pall upon readers who demand a more nervous and accented kind of writing. It is felt that a little roughness, a little harshness even, would give relief to his pictures of life. There is, for instance, something a little irritating in the old-fashioned courtliness of his manner toward women and one reads with a certain impatience smoothly punctuated passages like the following. As the vine, which has long twined its graceful foliage about the oak and been lifted by it into sunshine, will, when the hardy plant is rifted by the thunderbolt, cling round it with its caressing tendrils and bind up its shattered boughs, so it is beautifully ordered by providence that woman, who is the mere dependent and ornament of man in his happier hours, should be his stay and solace when smitten with sudden calamity, winding herself into the rugged recesses of his nature, tenderly supporting the drooping head and binding up the broken heart. Irving's gifts were sentiment and humor, with an imagination sufficiently fertile and an observation sufficiently acute to support these two main qualities, but inadequate to the service of strong passion or subtle thinking though his pathos indeed sometimes reached intensity. His humor was always delicate and kindly, his sentiment never degenerated into sentimentality. His diction was graceful and eloquent, too elegant perhaps, and in his modesty he attributed the success of his books in England to the astonishment of Englishmen that an American could write good English. In Spanish history and legend Irving found a still newer and richer field for his fancy to work upon. He had not the analytic and philosophical mind of a great historian, and the merits of his conquest of Granada and life of Columbus are rather bellatristish than scientific. But he brought to these undertakings the same eager love of the romantic past which had determined the character of his writings in America and England, and the result, whether we call it history or romance, is at all events charming as literature. His life of Washington, completed in 1859, was his magnum opus, and is accepted as standard authority. Mahomet and his successors, 1850, was comparatively a failure. But of all Irving's biographies, his Life of Oliver Goldsmith, 1849, was the most spontaneous and perhaps the best. He did not impose it upon himself as a task, but wrote it from a native and loving sympathy with his subject, and it is therefore one of the choicest literary memoirs in the language. When Irving returned to America in 1832, he was the recipient of almost national honors. He had received the Medal of the Royal Society of Literature and the degree of D.C.L. from Oxford University, and had made American literature known and respected abroad. In his modest home at Sunnyside, on the banks of the river over which he had been the first to throw the witchery of poetry and romance, he was attended to the last by the admiring affection of his countrymen. He had the love and praises of the foremost English writers of his own generation and the generation which followed, of Scott, Byron, Coleridge, Thackeray, and Dickens, some of whom had been among his personal friends. He is not the greatest of American authors, but the influence of his writings is sweet and wholesome, and it is in many ways fortunate that the first American man of letters who made himself heard in Europe should have been, in all particulars, a gentleman. Connected with Irving, at least by name and locality, were a number of authors who resided in the city of New York, and who are known as the Knickerbocker writers, perhaps because they were contributors to Knickerbocker magazine. One of these was James K. Paulding, a connection of Irving by marriage, and his partner in the Salma Gundy papers. Paulding became Secretary of the Navy under Van Buren, and lived down to the year 1860. He was a voluminous author, but his writings had no power of continuance, and are already obsolete, with the possible exception of his novel, The Dutchman's Fireside, 1831. A finer spirit than Paulding was Joseph Rodman Drake, a young poet of great promise who died in 1820 at the age of twenty-five. Drake's patriotic lyric, The American Flag, is certainly the most spirited thing of the kind in our poetic literature and greatly superior to such national anthems as Hail Columbia and the Star-Spangled Banner. His Culprit Fay, published in 1819, was the best poem that had yet appeared in America, if we accept Bryant's Thanatopsis, which was three years the elder. The Culprit Fay was a fairy story in which, following Irving's lead, Drake undertook to throw the glamour of poetry about the highlands of the Hudson. Edgar Poe said that the poem was fanciful rather than imaginative, but it is prettily and even brilliantly fanciful, 
and has maintained its popularity to the present time. Such verse as the following, which seems to show that Drake had been reading Coleridge's Christabel, published three years before, was something new in American poetry. The winds are whist and the owl is still, the bat in the shelvy rock is hid, and naught is heard on the lonely hill but the cricket's chirp and the answer shrill of the gauze-winged katydid, and the plaint of the wailing whippoorwill. Who moans unseen and ceaseless sings ever a note of wail and woe, till morning spreads her rosy wings and earth and sky in her glances glow? Here we have at least the whippoorwill, an American bird, and not the conventional lark or nightingale, although the elves of the old world seem scarcely at home on the banks of the Hudson. Drake's memory has been kept fresh not only by his own poetry, but by the beautiful elegy written by his friend Fitzgreen Halleck, the first stanza of which is universally known. Green be the turf above thee, friend of my better days. None knew thee but to love thee, nor named thee but to praise. Halleck was born in Guilford, Connecticut, whither he retired in 1849, and resided there till his death in 1867. But his literary career is identified with New York. He was associated with Drake in writing the Croker Papers, a series of humorous and satirical verses contributed in 1814 to the Evening Post. These were of a merely local and temporary interest, but Alec's fine ode, Marco Bozaris, though declaimed until it has become hackneyed, gives him a sure title to a remembrance, and his Alnwick Castle, a monody, half serious and half playful, on the contrast between feudal associations and modern life, has much of that pensive lightness which characterizes Praed's best vers de société. A friend of Drake and Halleck was James Fenimore Cooper, 1789 to 1851, the first American novelist of distinction, and, if a popularity which has endured for nearly three-quarters of a century is any tests, still the most successful of all American novelists. Cooper was far more intensely American than Irving, and his books reached an even wider public. They are published as soon as he produces them, said Morse, the electrician, in 1833, in thirty-four different places in Europe. They have been seen by American travelers in the languages of Turkey and Persia, in Constantinople, in Egypt, at Jerusalem, at Isafan. Cooper wrote altogether too much. He published, besides his fictions, a naval history of the United States, a series of naval biographies, works of travel, and a great deal of controversial matter. He wrote over thirty novels, the greater part of which are little better than trash, and tedious trash at that. This is especially true of his Tendence novels and his novels of society. He was a man of strongly marked individuality, fiery, pugnacious, sensitive to criticism, and abounding in prejudices. He was embittered by the scurrilous attacks made upon him by a portion of the American press, and spent a great deal of time and energy in conducting libel suits against the newspapers. In the same spirit he used fiction as a vehicle for attack upon the abuses and follies of American life. Nearly all of his novels, written with this design, are worthless. Nor was Cooper well equipped by nature and temperament for depicting character and passion in social life. Even in his best romances, his heroines and his leading juveniles, to borrow a term from the amateur stage, are insipid and conventional. He was no satirist, and his humor was not of a high order. He was a rapid and uneven writer, and unlike Irving he had no style. Where Cooper was great was in the story, in the invention of incidents and plots, in a power of narrative and description in tales of wild adventure which keeps the reader in breathless excitement to the end of the book. He originated the novel of the sea and the novel of the wilderness. He created the Indian of literature, and in this, his peculiar field, although he has had countless imitators, he has had no equals. Cooper's experiences had prepared him well for the kingship of this new realm in the world of fiction. His childhood was passed on the borders of Otsego Lake, when central New York was still a wilderness, with boundless forests stretching westward, broken only here and there by the clearings of the pioneers. He was taken from college, Yale, when still a lad, and sent to sea in a merchant vessel before the mast. Afterward he entered the navy and did duty on the high seas and upon Lake Ontario, then surrounded by virgin forests. He married and resigned his commission in 1811, just before the outbreak of the war with England, so that he missed the opportunity of seeing active service in any of those engagements on the ocean and our great lakes which were so glorious to American arms. But he retained an active interest in naval affairs. His first successful novel was The Spy, 1821, a tale of the Revolutionary War, the scene of which was laid in Westchester County, New York, 
where the author was then residing. The hero of this story, Harvey Birch, was one of the most skillfully drawn figures on his canvas. In 1823 he published The Pioneers, a work somewhat overladen with description, in which he drew for material upon his boyish recollections of frontier life at Cooperstown. This was the first of the series of five romances known as the Leather Stocking Tales. The others were The Last of the Mohicans, 1826, The Prairie, 1827, The Pathfinder, 1840, and The Deerslayer, 1841. The hero of this series, Natty Bumpo, or Leather Stocking, was Cooper's one great creation in the sphere of character, his most original addition to the literature of the world in the way of a new human type. This backwoods philosopher, to the conception of whom the historic exploits of Daniel Boone perhaps supplied some hints, unschooled but moved by noble impulses and a natural sense of piety and justice, passionately attached to the wilderness and following its westering edge even unto the prairies, this man of the woods was the first real American in fiction. Hardly less individual and vital were the various types of Indian character, in Chingachuk, Uncas, Hist, and the Huron warriors. Inferior to these, but still vigorously, though somewhat roughly drawn, were the waifs and strays of civilization, whom duty, or the hope of gain, or the love of adventure, or the outlawry of crime had driven to the wilderness. The solitary trapper, the reckless young frontiersman, the officers and men of outpost garrisons, whether Cooper's Indian was the real being, or an idealized and rather melodramatic version of the truth, has been a subject of dispute. However this be, he has taken his place in the domain of art, and it is safe to say that his standing there is secure. No boy will ever give him up. Equally good with the leather-stocking novels, and especially national, were Cooper's Tales of the Sea, or at least the two best of them, The Pilot, 1823, founded upon the daring exploits of John Paul Jones, and the Red Rover, 1828. But here, though Cooper still holds the sea, he has had to admit competitors, and Britannia, who rules the waves in song, has put in some claim to a share in the domain of nautical fiction, in the persons of Mr. W. Clark Russell and others. Though Cooper's novels do not meet the deeper needs of the heart and the imagination, their appeal to the universal love of a story is perennial. We devour them when we are boys, and if we do not often return to them when we are men, that is perhaps only because we have read them before, and know the ending. They are good yarns for the foxhole and the campfire, and the scholar in his study, though he may put the deerslayer or the last of the Mohicans away on the top shelf, will take it down now and again, and sit up half the night over it. Before dismissing the belle lettre writings of these period, Mention should be made of a few poems of the fugitive kind which seem to have taken a permanent place in popular regard. John Howard Payne, a native of Long Island, a wandering actor and playwright who died American consul at Tunis in 1852, wrote about 1820 for Covent Garden Theatre an opera entitled Clary, the libretto of which include the now famous song of Home Sweet Home. Its literary pretensions were of the humblest kind, but it spoke a true word which touched the Anglo-Saxon heart in its tenderest spot, and being happily married to a plaintive heir, was sold by the hundred thousand, and is evidently destined to be sung forever. A like success has attended the old oaken bucket, composed by Samuel Woodworth, a printer and journalist from Massachusetts, whose other poems, of which two collections were issued in 1818 and 1826, were soon forgotten. Richard Henry Wilde, an Irishman by birth, a gentleman of scholarly tastes and accomplishments, who wrote a great deal on Italian literature, and sat for several times in Congress as representative of the state of Georgia, was the author of the favorite song, My Life is Like the Summer Rose. Another Southerner, and a member of a distinguished Southern family, was Edward Coate Pinckney, who served nine years in the Navy and died in 1828, at the age of twenty-six having published in 1825 a small volume of lyrical poems which had a fire and grace uncommon at the time in American verse. One of these, a health, beginning, I fill this cup to one made up of loveliness alone, though perhaps somewhat overpraised by Edgar Poe, has rare beauty of thought and expression. John Quincy Adams, sixth President of the United States, 1825-29, to was a man of culture and literary tastes, he published his lectures on rhetoric delivered during his tenure of the Boylston Professorship at Harvard in 1806-1809. to 1809. He left a voluminous diary, which has been edited since his death in 1848, 
and among his experiments in poetry is one of considerable merit, entitled The Wants of Man, an ironical sermon on Goldsmith's text. Man wants but little here below, nor wants that little long. As this poem is a curiously close anticipation of Dr. Holmes's contentment, so the very popular ballad Old Grimes, written about 1818 by Albert Gorton Green, an undergraduate of Brown University in Rhode Island, is in some respects an anticipation of Holmes's quaintly pathetic Last Leaf. The political literature and public oratory of the United States during this period, although not absolutely of less importance than that which preceded and followed the Declaration of Independence and the adoption of the Constitution, demands less relative attention in a history of literature by reason of the growth of other departments of thought. The age was a political one, but no longer exclusively political. The debates of the time centered about the question of states' rights, and the main forum of discussion was the old Senate chamber, then made illustrious by the presence of Clay, Webster, and Calhoun. The slavery question which had threatened trouble was put off for a while by the Missouri Compromise of 1820, only to break more fiercely in the debates of the Wilmot Proviso and the Kansas and Nebraska Bill. Meanwhile the abolition movement had been transferred to the press and the platform. Garrison started his Liberator in 1830, and the Anti-Slavery Society was founded in 1833. The Whig Party, which had inherited the constitutional principles of the old Federal Party, advocated internal improvements at national expense and a high protective tariff. The State Rights Party, which was strongest at the South, opposed these views, and in 1832 South Carolina claimed the right to nullify the tariff imposed by the general government. The leader of this party was John Caldwell Calhoun, a South Carolinian, who in his speech in the United States Senate on February 13, 1832, on nullification and the force bill, set forth most authoritatively the Carolina doctrine. Calhoun was a great debater, but hardly a great orator. His speeches are the arguments of a lawyer and a strict constitutionalist, severely logical, and with a sincere conviction in the soundness of his case. Their language is free from bad rhetoric, the reasoning is cogent, but there is an absence of emotion and imagination. They contain few quotable things, and no passages of commanding eloquence, such as strew the orations of Webster and Burke. They are not, in short, literature. Again, the speeches of Henry Clay of Kentucky, the leader of the Whigs, whose persuasive oratory is a matter of tradition, disappoint in the reading, the fire has gone out of them. Not so with Daniel Webster, the greatest of American forensic orators, if indeed he be not the greatest of all orators who have used the English tongue. Webster's speeches are of the kind that have power to move after the voice of the speaker is still. The thought and the passion in them lay hold on feelings of patriotism more lasting than the issues of the moment. It is indeed true of Webster's speeches, as of all speeches, that they are known to posterity more by single brilliant passages than as wholes. In oratory the occasion is of the essence of the thing, and only those parts of an address which are permanent and universal in their appeal take their place in literature. But of such detachable passages there are happily many in Webster's orations. One great thought underlay all his public life, the thought of the union of American nationality. What in Hamilton had been a principle of political philosophy had become in Webster a passionate conviction. The Union was his idol, and he was intolerant of any faction which threatened it from any quarter, whether the nullifiers of South Carolina or the abolitionists of the North. It is this thought which gives grandeur and elevation to all his utterances, and especially to the wonderful peroration of his reply to Hayne on Mr. Foote's resolution touching the sale of the public lands, delivered in the Senate on January 26, 1830, whose closing words, Liberty and Union, now and forever, one and inseparable, became the rallying cry of a great cause. Similar in sentiment was his famous speech of March 7, 1850, on the Constitution and the Union, which gave so much offense to the extreme anti-slavery party, who held with Garrison that a Constitution which protected slavery was a league with death and a covenant with hell. It is not claiming too much for Webster to assert that the sentences of these and other speeches, memorized and declaimed by thousands of schoolboys throughout the North, did as much as any single influence to train up a generation in hatred of secession, and to send into the fields of the Civil War armies of men animated with a stern resolution to fight till the last drop of blood was shed, rather than allow the Union to be dissolved. The figure of this great senator is one of the most imposing in American annals. 
the masculine form of his personality impressed itself upon men of a very different stamp, upon the unworldly Emerson, and upon the captious Carlyle, whose respect was not willingly accorded to any contemporary, much less to a representative of American democracy. Webster's looks and manner were characteristic. His form was massive, his skull and jaw solid, the under lip projecting, and the mouth firmly and grimly shut. His complexion was swarthy, and his black, deep-set eyes under shaggy brows glowed with a smoldering fire. He was rather silent in society. His delivery in debate was grave and weighty, rather than fervid. His oratory was massive and sometimes even ponderous. It may be questioned whether an American orator of today, with intellectual abilities equal to Webster's, if such a one there were, would permit himself the use of sonorous and elaborate pictures like the famous period which follows. On this question of principle, while actual suffering was yet afar off, they raised their flag against a power, to which, for purposes of foreign conquest and subjugation, Rome in the height of her glory is not to be compared a power which is dotted over the surface of the whole globe with her possessions and military posts, whose morning drum-beat, following the sun and keeping company with the hours, circles the earth with one continuous and unbroken strain of the martial airs of England. The secret of this kind of oratory has been lost. The present generation distrusts rhetorical ornament, and likes something swifter, simpler, and more familiar in its speakers. But everything— in declamation of this sort depends on the way in which it is done. Webster did it supremely well. A smaller man would merely have made buncombe of it. Among the legal orators of the time, the foremost was Rufus Choate, an eloquent pleader, and like Webster, a United States senator from Massachusetts. Some of his speeches, though excessively rhetorical, have literary quality, and are nearly as effective in print as Webster's own. Another Massachusetts orator, Edward Everett, who in his time was successively professor in Hartford College, Unitarian minister in Boston, editor of the North American Review, member of both houses of Congress, minister to England, governor of his state, and president of Harvard, was a speaker of great finish and elegance. His addresses were mainly of the memorial and anniversary kind, and were rather lectures and PHBK prolusions than speeches. Everett was an instance of careful culture, bestowed on a soil of no very great natural richness. It is doubtful whether his classical orations on Washington, the Republic, Bunker Hill Monument, and kindred themes have enough of the breath of life in them to preserve them much longer in recollection. New England during these years did not take that leading part in the purely literary development of the country which it afterward assumed. It had no names to match against those of Irving and Cooper. Drake and Halleck, slender as was their performance in point of quantity, were better poets than the Boston bards Charles Sprague, whose Shakespeare ode delivered at the Boston Theatre in 1823 was locally famous, and Richard Henry Dana, whose longish narrative poem The Buccaneer, 1827, once had admirers. But Boston has at no time been without a serious intellectual life of its own, nor without a circle of highly educated men of literary pursuits, even in default of great geniuses. The North American Review, established in 1815, though it has been wittily described as ponderously revolving through space for a few years after its foundation, did not exist in an absolute vacuum, but was scholarly, if somewhat heavy. Webster, to be sure, was a Massachusetts man, as were Everett and Choate, but his triumphs were won in the wider field of national politics. There was, however, a movement at the time in the intellectual life of Boston and eastern Massachusetts, which, though not immediately contributory to the finer kinds of literature, prepared the way, by its clarifying and stimulating influences, for the eminent writers of the next generation. This was the Unitarian revolt against Puritan orthodoxy, in which William Ellery Channing was the principal leader. In a community so intensely theological as New England, it was natural that any new movement in thought should find its point of departure in the churches. Accordingly, the progressive and democratic spirit of the age, which in other parts of the country took other shapes, assumed in Massachusetts the form of liberal Christianity. Arminianism, Socinianism, and other phases of anti-Trinitarian doctrine had been latent in some of the congregational churches of Massachusetts for a number of years. But about 1812 the heresy broke out openly, and within a few years from that date most of the oldest and wealthiest church societies of Boston and its vicinity had gone over to Unitarianism and Harvard College had been captured, too. 
in the controversy that ensued, and which was carried on in numerous books, pamphlets, sermons, and periodicals, there were eminent disputants on both sides. So far as this controversy was concerned with the theological doctrine of the Trinity, it has no place in a history of literature. But the issue went far beyond that. Channing asserted the dignity of human nature against the Calvinistic doctrine of innate depravity, and affirmed the rights of human reason and man's capacity to judge of God. We must start in religion from our own souls, he said, and in his moral argument against Calvinism, 1820, he wrote, Nothing is gained to piety by degrading human nature, for in the competency of this nature to know and judge of God all piety has its foundation. In opposition to Edward's doctrine of necessity, he emphasized the freedom of the will. He maintained that the Calvinistic dogmas of original sin, foreordination, election by grace, and eternal punishment were inconsistent with the divine perfection, and made God a monster. In Channing's view, the great sanction of religious truth is the moral sanction, is its agreement with the laws of conscience. He was a passionate vindicator of the liberty of the individual, not only as against political oppression, but against the tyranny of public opinion over thought and conscience. We were made for free action. This alone is life, and enters into all that is good and great. This jealous love of freedom inspired all that he did and wrote. It led him to join the anti-slavery party. It expressed itself in his elaborate arraignment of Napoleon in the Unitarian organ, the Christian Examiner, for 1827-28, to in his remarks on associations, and his paper on the character and writings of John Milton, 1826. This was his most considerable contribution to literary criticism. It took for the text Milton's recently discovered Treatise on Christian Doctrine, the tendency of which was anti-Trinitarian, but it began with a general defense of poetry against those who are accustomed to speak of poetry as light reading. This would now seem a somewhat superfluous introduction to an article in any American review, but it shows the nature of the milieu through which the liberal movement in Boston had to make its way. To reassert the dignity and usefulness of the beautiful arts was, perhaps, the chief service which the Massachusetts Unitarians rendered to humanism. The traditional prejudice of the Puritans against the ornamental side of life had to be softened before polite literature could find a congenial atmosphere in New England. In Channing's Remarks on National Literature, reviewing a work published in 1823, he asks the question, Do we possess what may be called a national literature? And answers it, by implication at least, in the negative. That we do now possess a national literature is in great part due to the influence of Channing and his associates, although his own writings, being in the main controversial and therefore of temporary interest, may not themselves take rank among the permanent treasures of that literature. End of Part 2, Chapter 3 Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany, on March 8, 2009
it extended to all the young writers within reach, who struck their roots deeper into the soil that it had loosened and freshened. We owe to it in great measure not merely Emerson, Alcott, Margaret Fuller, and Thoreau, but Hawthorne, Lowell, Whittier, and Holmes. In its strictest sense, transcendentalism was a restatement of the idealistic philosophy and an application of its beliefs to religion, nature, and life. But in a looser sense, and as including the more outward manifestations which drew popular attention most strongly, it was the name given to that spirit of dissent and protest, of universal inquiry and experiment, which marked the third and fourth decades of this century in America, and especially in New England. The movement was contemporary with political revolutions in Europe and with the preaching of many novel gospels in religion, in sociology, in science, education, medicine, hygiene. New sects were formed, like the Swedenborgians, Universalists, Spiritualists, Millerites, Second Adventists, Shakers, Mormons, and Come-Outers, some of whom believed in trances, miracles, and direct revelations from the Divine Spirit others in the quick coming of Christ, as deduced from the opening of the seals and the number of the beast in the apocalypse, and still others in the reorganization of society and of the family on a different basis. New systems of education were tried, suggested by the writings of the Swiss reformer Pestalozzi and others. The pseudo-sciences of mesmerism and of phrenology, as taught by Gall and Spurzheim, had numerous followers. In medicine, Homeopathy, hydropathy, and what Dr. Holmes calls kindred delusions made many disciples. Numbers of persons influenced by the doctrines of Graham and other vegetarians abjured the use of animal food, as injurious not only to health but to a finer spirituality. Not a few refused to vote or pay taxes. The writings of Fourier and Saint-Simon were translated, and societies were established where cooperation and a community of goods should take the place of selfish competition. About the year 1840 there were some thirty of these phalansteries in America, many of which had their organs in the shape of a weekly or monthly journals, which advocated the principle of association. The best known of these was probably the Harbinger, the mouthpiece of the famous Brook Farm community, which was founded at West Roxbury, Massachusetts in 1841 and lasted until 1847. The head man of Brook Farm was George Ripley, a Unitarian clergyman who had resigned his pulpit in Boston to go into the movement, and who after its failure became and remained for many years literary editor of the New York Tribune. Among his associates were Charles A. Dana, now the editor of The Sun, Margaret Fuller, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and others not unknown to fame. The Harbinger, which ran from 1845 to 1849, two years after the break-up of the community, had among its contributors many who were not brook farmers, but who sympathized more or less with the experiment. Of the number were Horace Greeley, Dr. F. H. Hedge, who did so much to introduce American readers to German literature, J. S. Dwight, the musical critic, C. P. Cranch, the poet, and the younger men like G. W. Curtis and T. W. Higginson. A reader of today, looking into an odd volume of The Harbinger, will find in it some stimulating writing, together with a great deal of unintelligible talk about harmonic unity, love germination, and other matters now fallen silent. The most important literary result of this experiment, at plain living and high thinking, with its queer mixture of culture and agriculture, was Hawthorne's Blythedale Romance, which has for its background an idealized picture of the community life, whose heroine, Zenobia, has touches of Margaret Fuller, and whose hero, with his hobby of prison reform, was a type of the one-idead philanthropists that abounded in such an environment. Hawthorne's attitude was always in part one of reserve and criticism, an attitude which is apparent in the reminiscences of Brook Farm in his American notebooks, wherein he speaks with a certain resentment of Miss Fuller's transcendental heifer, which hooked the other cows, and was evidently, to Hawthorne's mind, not unsymbolic in this respect of Miss Fuller herself. It was the day of seers and orphic utterances. The air was full of the enthusiasm of humanity, and thick with philanthropic projects and plans for the regeneration of the universe. The figure of the wild-eyed, long-haired reformer, the man with a panacea, the crank of our later terminology, became a familiar one. He abounded at non-resistance conventions and meetings of universal peace societies and of women's rights associations. The movement had its grotesque aspects, which Lowell has described in his essay on Thoreau. Bran had its apostles and the pre-sartorial simplicity of Adam its martyrs. 
tailored impromptu from the tar-pot. Not a few impecunious zealots abjured the use of money, unless earned by other people, professing to live on the internal revenues of the spirit. Communities were established where everything was to be common but common sense. This ferment has long since subsided, and much of what was then seething has gone off in vapor or other volatile products. But some very solid matters have also been precipitated, some crystals of poetry translucent, symmetrical, enduring. The immediate practical outcome was disappointing, and the external history of the agitation is a record of failed experiments, spurious sciences, utopian philosophies, and sects founded only to dwindle away or be reabsorbed into some form of orthodoxy. In the eyes of the conservative, or the worldly-minded, or of the plain people who could not understand the enigmatic utterances of the reformers, the dangerous or ludicrous sides of transcendentalism were naturally uppermost. Nevertheless, the movement was but a new avatar of the old Puritan spirit, its moral earnestness, its spirituality, its tenderness for the individual conscience. Puritanism, too, in its day, had run into grotesque extremes. Emerson bore about the same relation to the absurder outcroppings of transcendentalism that Milton bore to the new lights, ranters, fifth monarchy men, etc., of his time. There is in him that mingling of idealism with an abiding sanity, and even a Yankee shrewdness which characterized the race. The practical, inventive, calculating, money-getting side of the Yankee has been made sufficiently obvious, but the deep heart of New England is full of dreams, mysticism, romance. And in the day of sacrifice when heroes piled the pyre, the dismal Massachusetts ice burned more than others' fire. The one element which the odd and eccentric developments of this movement shared in common with the real philosophy of transcendentalism was the rejection of authority and the appeal to the private consciousness as the sole standard of truth and right. This principle certainly lay in the ethical systems of Kant and Fichte, the great transcendentalists of Germany. It had been strongly asserted by Channing. Nay, it was the starting point of Puritanism itself which had drawn away from the ceremonial religion of the English church, and by its congregational system had made each church society independent in doctrine and worship. And although Puritan orthodoxy in New England had grown rigid and dogmatic, it had never used the weapons of obscurantism. By encouraging education to the utmost, it had shown its willingness to submit its beliefs to the fullest discussion, and had put into the hands of dissent the means with which to attack them. In its theological aspect, transcendentalism was a departure from conservative Unitarianism, as that had been from Calvinism. From Edwards to Channing, from Channing to Emerson and Theodore Parker, there was a natural and logical unfolding. Not logical in the sense that Channing adopted Edwards' premises and pushed them out to their conclusions, or that Parker accepted all of Channing's premises, but in the sense that the rigid pushing out of Edwards' premises into their conclusions by himself and his followers had brought about a moral reductio ad absurdum, and a state of opinion against which Channing rebelled, and that Channing, as it seemed to Parker, stopped short in the carrying out of his own principles. Thus the Channing Unitarians, while denying that Christ was God, had held that he was of divine nature, was the Son of God, and had existed before he came into the world. While rejecting the doctrine of the vicarious sacrifice, they maintained that Christ was a mediator and intercessor, and that his supernatural nature was testified by miracles. For Parker and Emerson it was easy to take the step to the assertion that Christ was a good and great man, divine only in the sense that God possessed him more fully than any other man known in history, that it was his preaching and example that brought salvation to men, and not any special mediation or intercession, and that his own words and acts, and not miracles, are the only and the sufficient witness to his mission. In the view of the transcendentalists, Christ was as human as Buddha, Socrates, or Confucius, and the Bible was but one among the ethnical scriptures, or sacred writings of the people, passages from which were published in the transcendental organ, the dial. As against these new views, Channing Unitarianism occupied already a conservative position. The Unitarians as a body had never been very numerous outside of eastern Massachusetts. They had a few churches in New York and in the larger cities and towns elsewhere, but the sect as such was a local one. Orthodoxy made a sturdy fight against the heresy under leaders like Leonard Woods and Moses Stewart of Andover and Lyman Beecher of Connecticut. 
In the neighboring state of Connecticut, for example, there was until lately, for a period of several years, no distinctly Unitarian congregation worshipping in a church edifice of its own. On the other hand, the Unitarians claimed with justice that their opinions had to a great extent modified the theology of the Orthodox churches. The writings of Horace Bushnell, of Hartford, one of the most eminent congregational divines, approach Unitarianism in their interpretation of the doctrine of the atonement and the progressive orthodoxy of Andover is certainly not the Calvinism of Thomas Hooker or of Jonathan Edwards. But it seemed to the transcendentalists that conservative Unitarianism was too negative and cultured, and Margaret Fuller complained of the coldness of the Boston pulpits. While contrariwise the central thought of transcendentalism, that the soul has an immediate connection with God, was pronounced by Dr. Channing a crude speculation. This was the thought of Emerson's address in 1838, before the Cambridge Divinity School, and it was at once made the object of attack by conservative Unitarians like Henry Ware and Andrews Norton. The latter, in an address before the same audience, on the latest form of infidelity, said, Nothing is left that can be called Christianity of its miraculous character be denied. There can be no intuition, no direct perception of the truth of Christianity and in a pamphlet supporting the same side of the question he added it is not an intelligible error but a mere absurdity to maintain that we are conscious or have an intuitive knowledge of the being of god of our own immortality or of any other fact of religion ripley and parker replied in emerson's defense but emerson himself would never be drawn into controversy he said that he could not argue he announced truths his method was that of the seer not of the disputant in 1832, Emerson, who was a Unitarian clergyman, and descended from eight generations of clergymen, had resigned the pastorate of the Second Church of Boston because he could not conscientiously administer the sacrament of the communion, which he regarded as a mere act of commemoration, in the sense in which it was understood by his parishioners. Thenceforth, though he sometimes occupied Unitarian pulpits, and was, indeed, all his life a kind of lay preacher, he never assumed the pastorate of a church. The representative of transcendentalism in the pulpit was Theodore Parker, an eloquent preacher, an eager debater, and a prolific writer on many subjects, whose collected works fill fourteen volumes. Parker was a man of strongly human traits, passionate, independent, intensely religious, but intensely radical, who made for himself a large personal following. The more advanced wing of the Unitarians were called, after him, Parkerites. Many of the Unitarian churches refused to fellowship with him, and the large congregation or audience which assembled in the music hall to hear his sermons was stigmatized as a boisterous assembly which came to hear Parker preach irreligion. It has been said on its philosophical side, New England transcendentalism was a restatement of idealism. The impulse came from Germany, from the philosophical writings of Kant, Fichte, Jacobi, and Schelling, and from the works of Coleridge and Carlyle, who had domesticated German thought in England. In Channing's Remarks on a National Literature, quoted in our last chapter, the essayist urged that our scholars should study the authors of France and Germany as one means of emancipating American letters from a slavish dependence on British literature. And in fact, German literature began not long after to be eagerly studied in New England. Emerson published an American edition of Carlyle's Miscellanies, including his essays on German writers that had appeared in England between 1822 and 1830. In 1838, Ripley began to publish Specimens of Foreign Standard Literature, which extended to fourteen volumes. In his work of translating and supplying introductions to the matter selected, he was helped by Ripley, Margaret Fuller, John S. Dwight, and others who had more or less connection with the transcendental movement. The definition of the new faith given by Emerson in his lecture on the Transcendentalist, 1842, is as follows. What is popularly called transcendentalism among us is idealism. The idealism of the present day acquired the name of transcendental from the use of that term by Immanuel Kant, who replied to the skeptical philosophy of Locke, which insisted that there was nothing in the intellect which was not previously in the experience of the senses by showing that there was a very important class of ideas, or imperative forms, which did not come by experience, but through which experience was acquired, that these were intuitions of the mind itself, and he denominated them transcendental forms. Idealism denies the independent existence of matter. 
Transcendentalism claims for the innate ideas of God and the soul a higher assurance of reality than for the knowledge of the outside world derived through the senses. Emerson shares the noble doubt of idealism. He calls the universe a shade, a dream, this great apparition. It is a sufficient account of that experience we call the world, he wrote in Nature, that God will teach a human mind, and so makes it the receiver of a certain number of congruent sensations which we call sun and moon, man and woman, house and trade. In my utter impotence to test the authenticity of the report of my senses, to know whether the impressions on me correspond with outlying objects, what difference does it make whether Orion is up there in heaven, or some god paints the image in the firmament of the soul? On the other hand, our evidence of the existence of God and of our own souls, and our knowledge of right and wrong, are immediate, and are independent of the senses. We are in direct communication with the Oversoul, the Infinite Spirit. The soul in man is the background of our being, an immensity not possessed that cannot be possessed. From within or from behind, a light shines through us upon things, and makes us aware that we are nothing, but the light is all. Revelation is an influx of the divine into our mind. It is an ebb of the individual rivulet before the flowing surges of the sea of life. In moods of exultation, and especially in the presence of nature, this contact of the individual soul with the absolute is felt. All mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part and particle of God. The existence and attributes of God are not deducible from history or from natural theology, but are thus directly given us in consciousness. In his essay on the Transcendentalist, Emerson says, His experience inclines him to behold the procession of facts you call the world, as flowing perpetually outward from an invisible, unsounded center in himself, center alike of him and of them, and necessitating him to regard all things as having a subjective or relative existence relative to that aforesaid unknown center of him. There is no bar or wall in the soul where man, the effect, ceases, and God, the cause, begins. We lie open on one side to the deeps of spiritual nature, to the attributes of God. Emerson's point of view, though familiar to students of philosophy, is strange to the popular understanding, and hence has arisen the complaint of his obscurity. Moreover, he apprehended and expressed these ideas as a poet, in figurative and emotional language, and not as a metaphysician, in a formulated statement. His own position in relation to systematic philosophers is described in what he says of Plato, in his series of sketches entitled Representative Men, 1850. He has not a system. The dearest disciples and defenders are at fault. He attempted a theory of the universe, and his theory is not complete or self-evident. One man thinks he means this, and another that. He has said one thing in one place, and the reverse of it in another place. It happens, therefore, that to many students of more formal philosophies, Emerson's meaning seems elusive, and he appears to write from temporary moods and to contradict himself. Had he attempted a reasoned exposition of the transcendental philosophy, instead of writing essays and poems, he might have added one more to the number of system-mongers, but he would not have taken that significant place which he occupies in the general literature of the time, nor exerted that wide influence upon younger writers which has been one of the stimulating forces in the American thought. It was because Emerson was a poet that he is our Emerson, and yet it would be impossible to disentangle his peculiar philosophical ideas from the body of his writings, and to leave the latter to stand upon their own merits as literature merely. He is the poet of certain high abstractions, and his religion is central to all his work, excepting perhaps his English Traits, 1856, an acute study of national characteristics, and a few of his essays and verses, which are independent of any particular philosophical standpoint. When Emerson resigned his parish in 1832, he made a short trip to Europe, where he visited Carlyle at Craigenputtoch and Landor at Florence. On his return he retired to his birthplace, the village of Concord, Massachusetts, and settled down among his books and his fields, becoming a sort of glorified farmer, but issuing frequently from his retirement to instruct and delight audiences of thoughtful people at Boston and at other points all through the country. Emerson was the perfection of a lyceum lecturer. His manner was quiet but forcible, his voice of charming quality, and his enunciation clean-cut and refined. 
The sentence was his unit in composition. His lectures seemed to begin anywhere and to end anywhere, and to resemble strings of exquisitely polished sayings rather than continuous discourses. His printed essays, with unimportant exceptions, were first written and delivered as lectures. In 1836 he published his first book, Nature, which remains the most systematic statement of his philosophy. It opened a fresh springhead in American thought, and the words of its introduction announced that its author had broken with the past. Why should not we also enjoy an original relation to the universe? Why should we not have a poetry and philosophy of insight and not of tradition, and a religion by revelation to us and not the history of theirs? It took eleven years to sell five hundred copies of this little book. But the year following its publication, the remarkable Phi Beta Kappa address at Cambridge on the American scholar electrified the little public of the university. This is described by Lowell as an event without any former parallel in our literary annals, a scene to be always treasured in the memory for its picturesqueness and its inspiration. What crowded and breathless aisles, what windows clustering with eager heads, what grim silence of foregone descent. To Concord came many kindred spirits, drawn by Emerson's magnetic attraction. Thither came from Connecticut Amos Bronson Alcott, born a few years before Emerson, whom he outlived. A quaint and benignant figure, a visionary and a mystic even among the transcendentalists themselves, and one who lived in unworldly simplicity the life of the soul. Alcott had taught school at Cheshire, Connecticut, and afterward at Boston on an original plan, compelling his scholars, for example, to flog him when they did wrong, instead of taking a flogging themselves. The experiment was successful until his conversations on the Gospels in Boston, and his insistence upon admitting colored children to his benches offended conservative opinion and broke up his school. Alcott renounced the eating of animal food in 1835. He believed in the union of thought and manual labor, and supported himself for some years by the work of his hands, gardening, cutting wood, etc. He traveled into the West and elsewhere, holding conversations on philosophy, education, and religion. He set up a little community at the village of Harvard, which was rather less successful than Brook Farm, and he contributed Orphic sayings to the Dial, which were harder for the exoteric to understand than even Emerson's Brahma or the Oversoul. That there came also Sarah Margaret Fuller, the most intellectual woman of her time in America, an eager student of Greek and German literature, and an ardent seeker after the true, the good, and the beautiful. She threw herself into many causes, temperance, anti-slavery, and the higher education of women. Her brilliant conversation classes in Boston attracted many minds of her own sex. Subsequently, as literary editor of the New York Tribune, she furnished a wider public with reviews and book notices of great ability. She took part in the Brook Farm experiment, and she edited the Dial for a time, contributing to it the papers afterward expanded into her most considerable book, Woman in the Nineteenth Century. In 1846 she went abroad, and at Rome took part in the revolutionary movement of Mazzini, having charge of one of the hospitals during the siege of the city by the French. In 1847 she married an impecunious Italian nobleman, the Marquis Ossoli. In 1850 the ship on which she was returning to America with her husband and child was wrecked on Fire Island Beach, and all three were lost. Margaret Fuller's collected writings are somewhat disappointing, being mainly of temporary interest. She lives less through her books than through the memoirs of her friends, Emerson, James Freeman Clark, T. W. Higginson, and others who knew her as a personal influence. Her strenuous and rather overbearing individuality made an impression not altogether agreeable on many of her contemporaries. Lowell introduced a caricature of her as Miranda into his Fable for Critics, and Hawthorne's caustic sketch of her, preserved in the biography written by his son, has given great offense to her admirers. Such a determination to eat this huge universe, was Carlyle's characteristic comment on her appetite for knowledge and aspirations after perfection. To Concord also came Nathaniel Hawthorne, who took up his residence there first at the Old Manse and afterward at the Wayside. Though naturally an idealist, he said that he came too late to Concord to fall decidedly under Emerson's influence. Of that he would have stood in little danger even if he had come earlier. He appreciated the deep and subtle quality of Emerson's imagination, but his own shy genius always jealously guarded its independence and resented the too close approaches of an alien mind. 
Among the native disciples of Emerson at Concord, the most noteworthy were Henry Thoreau and his friend and biographer William Ellery Channing, Jr., a nephew of the great Channing. Channing was a contributor to the Dial, and he published a volume of poems which elicited a fiercely contemptuous review from Edgar Poe. Though disfigured by affectation and obscurity, many of Channing's verses were distinguished by true poetic feeling, and the last line of his little piece, A Poet's Hope, If my bark sink tis to another sea, has taken a permanent place in the literature of transcendentalism. The private organ of the Transcendentalists was The Dial, a quarterly magazine published from 1840 to 1844, and edited by Emerson and Margaret Fuller. Among its contributors, besides those already mentioned, were Ripley, Thoreau, Parker, James Freeman Clark, Charles A. Dana, John S. Dwight, C. P. Cranch, Charles Emerson, and William H. Channing, another nephew of Dr. Channing. It contained, along with a good deal of rubbish, some of the best poetry and prose that have been published in America. The most lasting part of its contents were those contributions of Emerson and Thoreau. But even as a whole, it is so unique a waymark in the history of our literature that all its four volumes, copies of which had become scarce, have been recently reprinted in answer to a demand certainly very unusual in the case of an extinct periodical. From time to time Emerson collected and published his lectures under various titles. A first series of essays came out in 1841 and a second in 1844, The Conduct of Life in 1860, Society and Solitude in 1870, Letters and Social Aims in 1876, and The Fortune of the Republic in 1878. In 1847 he issued a volume of poems, and 1865 May Day and other poems. These writings as a whole were variations on a single theme, expansions and illustrations of the philosophy set forth in Nature and his early addresses. They were strikingly original, rich in thought, filled with wisdom, with lofty morality and spiritual religion. Emerson, said Lowell, first cut the cable that bound us to English thought and gave us a chance at the dangers and glories of blue water. Nevertheless, as it used to be the fashion to find an English analog for every American writer, so that Cooper was called the American Scot and Mrs. Sigourney was described as the Hemans of America, a well-worn critical tradition has coupled Emerson with Carlyle. That his mind received a nudge from Carlyle's early essays and from Sartor Resartus is beyond a doubt. They were lifelong friends and correspondents, and Emerson's representative men is in some sort a counterpart of Carlyle's hero-worship. But in temper and style the two writers were widely different. Carlyle's pessimism and dissatisfaction with the general drift of things gained upon him more and more, while Emerson was a consistent optimist to the end. The last of his writings published during his lifetime, The Fortune of the Republic, contrasts strangely in its hopefulness with the desperation of Carlyle's later utterances. Even in presence of the doubt as to man's personal immortality, he takes refuge in a high and stoical faith. I think all sound minds rest on a certain preliminary conviction, namely, that if it be best that conscious personal life shall continue, it will continue, and if not best, then it will not and we, if we saw the whole, should of course see that it was better so. It is this conviction that gives to Emerson's writings their serenity and their tonic quality at the same time that it narrows the range of his dealings with life. As the idealist declines to cross-examine those facts which he regards as merely phenomenal, and looks upon this outward face of things as upon a mask not worthy to dismay the fixed soul, so the optimist turns away his eyes from the evil which he disposes of as merely negative and as the shadow of good. Hawthorne's interest in the problem of sin finds little place in Emerson's philosophy. Passion comes not nigh him, and Faust disturbs him with its disagreeableness. Pessimism is to him the only skepticism. The greatest literature is that which is the most broadly human, or in other words, that which will square best with all philosophies. But Emerson's genius was interpretive rather than constructive. The poet dwells in the cheerful world of phenomena. He is most the poet who realizes most intensely the good and bad of human life. But idealism makes experience shadowy and subordinates action to contemplation. To it the cities of men with their frivolous populations are but sailing foam bells along thought's causing stream. Shakespeare does not forget that the world will one day vanish like the baseless fabric of a vision, 
and that we ourselves are such stuff as dreams are made on. But this is not the mood in which he dwells. Again, while it is for the philosophers to reduce variety to unity, it is the poet's task to detect the manifold under uniformity. In the great creative poets, in Shakespeare and Dante and Goethe, how infinite the swarm of persons, the multitude of forms. But with Emerson, the type is important, the common element. In youth we are mad for persons, but the larger experience of man discovers the identical nature appearing through them all. The same, the same, he exclaims in his essay on Plato. Friend and foe are of one stuff, the plowman, the plow, and the furrow are of one stuff. And this is the thought in Brahma. They reckon ill who leave me out. When me they fly I am the wings, I am the doubter and the doubt, and I the hymn the Brahmin sings. It is not easy to fancy a writer who holds this altitude toward persons descending to the composition of a novel or a play. Emerson showed, indeed, a fine power of character analysis in his English traits and representative men, and in his memoirs of Thoreau and Margaret Fuller. There is even a sort of dramatic humor in his portrait of Socrates. But upon the whole he stands midway between constructive artists whose instinct it is to tell a story or sing a song, and philosophers like Schelling who give poetic expression to a system of thought. He belongs to the class of minds of which Sir Thomas Brown is the best English example, he set a high value upon Brown, to whose style his own, though far more sententious, bears a resemblance. Brown's saying, for example, all things are artificial for nature is the art of God, sounds like Emerson, whose workmanship for the rest, in his prose essays, was exceedingly fine and close. He was not afraid to be homely and racy in expressing thought of the highest spirituality. Hitch your wagon to a star is a good instance of his favorite manner. Emerson's verse often seems careless in technique. Most of his pieces are scrappy and have the air of runic rhymes, or little oracular voicings, as they say in Concord, in rhythmic shape, of single thoughts on worship, character, heroism, art, politics, culture, etc. The content is the important thing, and the form is too frequently awkward or bald. Sometimes, indeed, in the clear obscure of Emerson's poetry, the deep wisdom of the thought finds its most natural expression in the imaginative simplicity of the language. But though this artlessness in him became too frequently in his imitators, like Thoreau and Ellery Channing, an obtruded simplicity, among his own poems are many that leave nothing to be desired in point of wording and of verse. His hymn sung at the completion of the Concord Monument in 1836 is the perfect model of an occasional poem. Its lines were on everyone's lips at the time of the centennial celebrations in 1876, and the shot heard round the world has hardly echoed farther than the song which chronicled it. Equally current is the stanza from Voluntaries. So nigh is grandeur to our dust, so near is God to man, when duty whispers low, thou must, and the youth replies, I can. So too the famous lines from The Problem, the hand that rounded Peter's dome and groined the isles of Christian Rome, wrought in a sad sincerity. Himself from God he could not free, he builded better than he knew. The conscious stone to beauty grew. The most noteworthy of Emerson's pupils was Henry David Thoreau, the poet naturalist. After his graduation from Harvard College in 1837, Thoreau engaged in school teaching and in the manufacture of lead pencils, but soon gave up all regular business and devoted himself to walking, reading, and the study of nature. He was at one time private tutor in a family on Staten Island, and he supported himself for a season by doing odd jobs in land surveying for the farmers about Concord. In 1845 he built with his own hands a small cabin on the banks of Walden Pond near Concord, and lived there in seclusion for two years. His expenses during these years were nine cents a day, and he gave an account of his experiment in his most characteristic book, Walden, published in 1854. His week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers appeared in 1849. From time to time he went farther afield, and his journeys were reported in Cape Cod, the Maine Woods, Excursions, and A Yankee in Canada, all of which, as well as a volume of Letters and Early Spring in Massachusetts, have been given to the public since his death, which happened in 1862. No one has lived so close to nature and written of it so intimately as Thoreau. 
His life was a lesson in economy and a sermon on Emerson's text, Lessen Your Denominator. He wished to reduce existence to its simplest terms, to live all alone close to the bone and where life is sweet constantly eat. He had a passion for the wild and seemed like an Anglo-Saxon reversion to the type of the Red Indian. The most distinctive note in Thoreau is his inhumanity. He had a passion for the wild, and seems like an Anglo-Saxon reversion to the type of the Red Indian. The most distinctive note in Thoreau is his inhumanity. Emerson spoke of him as a perfect piece of stoicism. Man, said Thoreau, is only the point on which I stand. He strove to realize the objective life of nature, nature in its aloofness from man, to identify himself with the moose and the mountain. He listened with his ear close to the ground for the voice of the earth. What are the trees saying? he exclaimed. Following upon the trail of the lumberman, he asked the primeval wilderness for its secret, and saw beneath dim aisles in odorous beds the slight Linnea hang its twin-born heads. He tried to interpret the thought of Ktaadn, and to fathom the meaning of the billows on the back of Cape Cod in their indifference to the shipwrecked bodies that they rolled ashore. After sitting in my chamber many days, reading the poets, I have been out early on a foggy morning and heard the cry of an owl in a neighboring wood as from a nature behind the common, unexplored by science or by literature. None of the feathered race has yet to realize my youthful conceptions of the woodland depths. I had seen the red election birds brought from their recesses on my comrade's string, and fancied that their plumage would assume stranger and more dazzling colors, like the tints of the evening, in proportion as I advanced farther into the darkness and solitude of the forest. Still less have I seen such strong and wild tints on any poet's string. It was on the mystical side that Thoreau apprehended transcendentalism. Mysticism has been defined as the soul's recognition of its identity with nature. This thought lies plainly in Schelling's philosophy, and he illustrated it by his famous figure of the magnet. Mind and nature are one, they are the positive and negative poles of the magnet. In man the absolute, that is, God, becomes conscious of himself, makes of himself as nature, an object to himself as mind. The souls of men, said Schelling, are but the innumerable individual eyes with which our infinite world spirit beholds himself. This thought is also clearly present in Emerson's view of nature, and has caused him to be accused of pantheism. But if by pantheism is meant the doctrine that the underlying principle of the universe is matter or force, none of the transcendentalists was a pantheist. In their view nature was divine. Their poetry is always haunted by the sense of a spiritual reality which abides beyond the phenomena. Thus, in Emerson's Two Rivers, Thy summer voice, Muscatacquit, repeats the music of the rain, but sweeter rivers pulsing flit through thee as though through conquered plain. Thou in thy narrow banks art pent, the stream I love unbounded goes, through flood and sea and firmament, through light, through life, it forward flows. I see the inundation sweet, I hear the spending of the stream, through years, through men, through nature fleet, through passion, thought, through power and dream. This mood occurs frequently in Thoreau. The hard world of matter becomes suddenly all fluent and spiritual, and he sees himself in it, sees God. This earth, he cries, which is spread out like a map around me, is but the lining of my inmost soul exposed. In me is the succor that I see. And of Walden Pond, I am its stony shore and the breeze that passes o'er. Suddenly old time winked at me. Oh, you know me, you rogue. And news had come that it was well. That ancient universe is in such capital health, I think, undoubtedly, it will never die. I see, smell, taste, hear, feel that everlasting something to which we are allied, at once our maker, our abode, our destiny, our very selves. It was something ulterior that Thoreau sought in nature. The other world, he wrote, is all my art. My pencils will draw no other. My jackknife will cut nothing else. Thoreau did not scorn, however, like Emerson, to examine too microscopically the universal tablet. He was a close observer and accurate reporter of the ways of birds and plants and the minuter aspects of life. He has had many followers who have produced much pleasant literature on outdoor life, but in none of them is there that unique combination of the poet, the naturalist, and the mystic which gives his page its wild original flavor. He had the woodcraft of a hunter and the eye of a botanist, but his imagination did not stop short with the fact. 
The sound of a tree falling in the main woods was to him as though a door had shut somewhere in the damp and shaggy wilderness. He saw small things in cosmic relations. His trip down the tame Concord has for the reader the excitement of a voyage of exploration into far and unknown regions. The river just above Sherman's Bridge in time of flood, when the wind blows freshly on a raw March day, heaving up the surface into dark and sober billows, was like Lake Huron. And you may run aground on Cranberry Isle and get as good a freezing there as anywhere on the northwest coast. He said that most of the phenomena described in Kane's voyage could be observed in Concord. The literature of transcendentalism was like the light of the stars in a winter night, keen and cold and high. It had the pale cast of thought, and was almost too spiritual and remote to hit the sense of mortal sight. But it was at least indigenous. If not an American literature, not national and not inclusive of all sides of American life, it was, at all events, a genuine New England literature and true to the spirit of its section. The tough Puritan stock had at last put forth a blossom which compared with the warm, robust growths of English soil, even as the delicate wind-flower of the northern spring compares with the cowslips and daisies of old England. In 1842 Nathaniel Hawthorne, 1804-1864, the greatest American romancer, came to Concord. He had recently left Brook Farm, had just been married, and with his bride he settled down in the old manse for three paradisiacal years. A picture of this protracted honeymoon and this sequestered life, as tranquil as the slow stream on whose bank it was passed, is given in the introductory chapter to his Mosses from an Old Manse, 1846, and in the more personal and confidential records of his American notebooks, posthumously published. Hawthorne was thirty-eight when he took his place among the Concord literati. His childhood and youth had been spent partly at his birthplace, the old and already somewhat decayed seaport town of Salem, and partly at his grandfather's farm on Sebago Lake in Maine, then on the edge of the primitive forest. Maine did not become a state, indeed, until 1820, the year before Hawthorne entered Bowdoin College, whence he was graduated in 1825, in the same class with Henry W. Longfellow, and one year behind Franklin Pierce, afterward President of the United States. After leaving college, Hawthorne buried himself for years in the seclusion of his home at Salem. His mother, who was early widowed, had withdrawn entirely from the world. For months at a time Hawthorne kept to his room, seeing no other society than that of his mother and sisters, reading all sorts of books and writing wild tales, most of which he destroyed as soon as he had written them. At twilight he would emerge from the house for a solitary ramble through the streets of the town or along the seaside. Old Salem had much that was picturesque in its associations. It had been the scene of the witch trials in the seventeenth century, and it abounded in ancient mansions, the homes of retired whalers and Indian merchants. Hawthorne's father had been a ship captain, and many of his ancestors had followed the sea. One of his forefathers, moreover, had been a certain Judge Hawthorne, who in 1691 had sentenced several of the witches to death. The thought of this affected Hawthorne's imagination with a pleasing horror, and he utilized it afterward in his House of the Seven Gables. Many of the old Salem houses, too, had their family histories, with now and then the hint of some obscure crime or dark misfortune which haunted posterity with its curse till all the stock died out or fell into poverty and evil ways, as in the Pynchon family of Hawthorne's romance. In the preface to The Marble Fawn, Hawthorne wrote, no author without a trial can conceive of the difficulty of writing a romance about a country where there is no shadow, no antiquity, no mystery, no picturesque and gloomy wrong, nor anything but a commonplace prosperity in broad and simple daylight. And yet it may be doubted whether any environment could have been found more fitted to his peculiar genius than that of his native town, or any preparation better calculated to ripen the faculty that was in him than these long, lonely years of waiting and brooding thought. From time to time he contributed a story or a sketch to some periodical, such as S. G. Goodrich's annual The Token, or the Knickerbocker magazine. Some of these attracted the attention of the judicious, but they were anonymous and signed by various nom de plume, and their author was at this time, to use his own words, the obscurest man of letters in America. In 1828 he had issued anonymously, and at his own expense, a short romance entitled Fanshawe, it had little success, and copies of the first edition are now exceedingly rare. In 1837 he published a collection of his magazine pieces under the title Twice Told Tales. 
The book was generously praised in the North American Review by his former classmate Longfellow, and Edgar Poe showed his keen critical perception by predicting that the writer would easily put himself at the head of imaginative literature in America if he would discard allegory, drop short stories, and compose a genuine romance. Poe compared Hawthorne's work with that of the German romancer Tieck, and it is interesting to find confirmation of this dictum in passages of the American notebooks, in which Hawthorne speaks of laboring over Tieck with a German dictionary. The twice-told tales are the work of a recluse, who makes guesses at life from a knowledge of his own heart, acquired by a habit of introspection, but who has had little contact with men. Many of them were shadowy, and others were morbid and unwholesome, but their gloom was of an interior kind, never the physically horrible of Poe. It arose from weird psychological situations, like that of Ethan Brand, in his search for the unpardonable sin. Hawthorne was true to the inherited instinct of Puritanism. He took the conscience for his theme, and in these early tales he was already absorbed in the problem of evil, the subtle ways in which sin works out its retribution, and the species of fate or necessity that the wrongdoer makes for himself in the inevitable sequences of his crime. Hawthorne was strongly drawn towards symbols and types, and never quite followed Poe's advice to abandon allegory. The Scarlet Letter and his other romances are not, indeed, strictly allegories, since the characters are men and women, and not mere personifications of abstract qualities. Still, they all have a certain allegorical tinge. In The Marble Fawn, for example, Hilda, Kenyon, Miriam, and Donatello have been ingeniously explained as personifications respectively of the conscience, the reason, the imagination, and the senses. Without going so far as this, it is possible to see in these, and in Hawthorne's other creations, something typical and representative. He uses his characters like algebraic symbols to work out certain problems with. They are rather more, and yet rather less, than flesh and blood individuals. The stories in Twice Told Tales and in the second collection, Mosses from an Old Manse, 1846, are more openly allegorical than his later work. Thus, the minister's black veil is a sort of anticipation of Arthur Dimsdale in The Scarlet Letter. From 1846 to 1849, Hawthorne held the position of surveyor of the Custom House of Salem. In the preface to The Scarlet Letter, he sketched some of the government officials with whom this office had brought him into contact, in a way that gave some offense to the friends of the victims and a great deal of amusement to the public. Hawthorne's humor was quiet and fine like Irving's, but less genial and with more a satiric edge to it. The book last named was written at Salem and published in 1850, just before its author's removal to Lenox, now a sort of inland Newport, but then an unfashionable resort among the Berkshire Hills. Whatever obscurity may have hung over Hawthorne hitherto was effectually dissolved by this powerful tale, which was as vivid in coloring as the implication of its title. Hawthorne chose for his background the somber life of the early settlers in New England, he had always been drawn toward this part of American history, and in twice-told tales had given some illustrations of it in Endicott's Red Cross and Legends of the Province House. Against this dark foil moved in strong relief the figures of Hester Prynne, the woman taken in adultery, her paramour the Reverend Arthur Dimsdale, her husband old Roger Chillingworth, and her illegitimate child. In tragic power, in its grasp of the elementary passions of human nature, and its deep and subtle insight into the inmost secrets of the heart, this is Hawthorne's greatest book. He never crowded his canvas with figures. In the Blythedale Romance and the Marble Fawn there is the same partie carré, or group of four characters. In the House of the Seven Gables there are five. The last mentioned of these, published in 1852, was of a more subdued intensity than The Scarlet Letter, but equally original, and upon the whole perhaps equally good. The Blythedale Romance, published in the same year, though not strikingly inferior to the others, adhered more to conventional patterns in its plot, and in the sensational nature of its ending. The suicide of the heroine by drowning, and the terrible scene of the recovery of her body, were suggested to the author by an experience of his own on Concord River, the account of which, in his own words, may be read in Julian Hawthorne's Nathaniel Hawthorne and His Wife. In 1852 Hawthorne returned to Concord and bought the wayside property, which he retained until his death. But in the following year, his old college friend Pierce, now become president, appointed him consul to Liverpool, and he went abroad for seven years. The most valuable fruit of his foreign residence was the Romance of the Marble Fawn, 1860, the longest of his fictions and the richest in descriptive beauty. The theme of this was the development of the soul through the experience of sin. There is a haunting mystery thrown about the story like a soft veil of mist, 
veiling the beginning and the end. There is even a delicate teasing suggestion of the preternatural in Donatello, the Faun, a creation as original as Shakespeare's Caliban or Fouquet's Undine, and yet quite on this side the borderline of the human. Our Old Home, a book of charming papers on England, was published in 1863. Manifold experience of life and contact with men, affording scope for his always keen observation, had added range, fullness, warmth to the imaginative subtlety which had manifested itself even in his earliest tales. Two admirable books for children, The Wonder Book and Tanglewood Tales, in which the classic mythologies were retold, should also be mentioned in the list of Hawthorne's writings, as well as the American, English, and Italian notebooks, the first of which contains the seed thoughts of some of his finished works, together with hundreds of hints for plots, episodes, descriptions, etc., which he never found time to work out. Hawthorne's style, in his first sketches and stories a little stilted and bookish, gradually acquired an exquisite perfection, and is as well worth study as that of any prose classic in the English tongue. Hawthorne was no transcendentalist. He dwelt much in a world of ideas, and he sometimes doubted whether the tree on the bank or its image in the stream were the more real. But this had little in common with the philosophical idealism of his neighbors. He reverenced Emerson, and he held kindly intercourse, albeit a silent man and easily bored, with Thoreau and Ellery Channing, and even with Margaret Fuller. But his sharp eye saw whatever was whimsical or weak in the apostles of the new faith. He had little enthusiasm for causes or reforms, and among so many abolitionists he remained a Democrat, and even wrote a campaign life of his friend Pierce. The village of Concord has perhaps done more for American literature than the city of New York. Certainly there are few places where associations both patriotic and poetic cluster so thickly. At one side of the grounds of the old manse, which has the river at its back, runs down a shaded lane to the Concord monument and the figure of the Minuteman, and the successor of the rude bridge that arched the flood. Scarce two miles away among the woods is little Walden, God's Drop. The men who made Concord famous are asleep in Sleepy Hollow, yet still their memory prevails to draw seekers after truth to the Concord Summer School of Philosophy, which meets every year to reason high of God, freedom, and immortality, next door to the wayside, and under the hill on whose ridge Hawthorne wore a path as he paced up and down beneath the hemlocks. End of Part 2, Chapter 4 Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany on March 12, 2009Part 2, Chapter 5 of A Brief History of English and American Literature. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kalinda. A Brief History of English and American Literature by Henry A. Beers. Part 2, Chapter 5 The Cambridge Scholars, 1837 to 1861. With few exceptions, the men who have made American literature what it is have been college graduates and yet our colleges have not commonly been, in themselves, literary centers. Most of them have been small and poor, and situated in little towns or provincial cities. Their alumni scatter far and wide immediately after graduation, and even those of them who may feel drawn to a life of scholarship or letters find little to attract them at the home of their alma mater, and seek by preference the larger cities where periodicals and publishing houses offer some hope of support in a literary career. Even in the older and better equipped universities, the faculty is usually a corps of working scholars, each man intent upon his speciality and rather inclined to undervalue merely literary performance. In many cases the fastidious and hypercritical turn of mind which besets the scholar, the timid conservatism which naturally characterizes an ancient seat of learning, and the spirit of theological conformity which suppresses free discussion, have exerted their benumbing influence upon the originality and creative impulse of their inmates. Hence it happens that while the contributions of American college teachers to the exact sciences, to theology and philology, metaphysics, political philosophy, and the severer branches of learning have been honorable and important, they have as a class made little mark upon the general literature of the country. The professors of literature in our colleges are usually persons who have made no additions to literature, 
and the professors of rhetoric seem ordinarily to have been selected to teach students how to write, for the reason that they themselves have never written anything that anyone has ever read. To these remarks the Harvard College of some fifty years ago offers a striking exception. It was not the large and fashionable university that it has lately grown to be, with its multiplied elective courses, its numerous faculty, and its somewhat motley crew of undergraduates, but a small school of the classics and mathematics, with something of ethics, natural science, and the modern language added to its old-fashioned scholastic curriculum, and with a very homogeneous clientele, drawn mainly from the Unitarian families of eastern Massachusetts. Nevertheless, a finer intellectual life in many respects was lived at Old Cambridge within the years covered by this chapter than nowadays at the same place, or at any date in any other American university town. The neighborhood of Boston, where the commercial life has never so entirely overlain the intellectual as in New York and Philadelphia, has been a standing advantage to Harvard College. The recent upheaval in religious thought had secured toleration, and made possible that free and even audacious interchange of ideas without which a literary atmosphere is impossible. From these, or from whatever causes, it happened that the old Harvard scholarship had an elegant and tasteful side to it, so that the dry erudition of the schools blossomed into a generous culture, and there were men in the professors' chairs who were no less efficient as teachers because they were also poets, orators, wits, and men of the world. In the seventeen years from 1821 to 1839 there were graduated from Harvard College Emerson, Holmes, Sumner, Phillips, Motley, Thoreau, Lowell, and Edward Everett Hale, some of whom took up their residence at Cambridge, others at Boston, and others at Concord, which was quite as much a spiritual suburb of Boston as Cambridge was. In 1836, when Longfellow became professor of modern languages at Harvard, Sumner was lecturing in the law school. The following year, in which Thoreau took his bachelor's degree, witnessed the delivery of Emerson's Phi Beta Kappa lecture on the American scholar in the college chapel, and Wendell Phillips' speech on the murder of Lovejoy in Faneuil Hall. Lowell, whose description of the impression produced by the former of these famous addresses has been quoted in a previous chapter, was an undergraduate at the time. He took his degree in 1838, and in 1855 succeeded Longfellow in the chair of modern languages. Holmes had been chosen in 1847 Professor of Anatomy and Physiology in the Medical School, a position that he held until 1882. The historians Prescott and Bancroft had been graduated in 1814 and 1817 respectively. The former's first important publication, Ferdinand and Isabella, appeared in 1837. Bancroft had been a tutor in the college in 1822-23, to and the initial volume of his History of the United States was issued in 1835. Another of the Massachusetts School of Historical Writers, Francis Parkman, took his first degree at Harvard in 1844. Cambridge was still hardly more than a village, a rural outskirt of Boston, such as Lowell described it in his article, Cambridge Thirty Years Ago, originally contributed to Putnam's Monthly in 1853, and afterward reprinted in his Fireside Travels, 1864. The situation of a university scholar in old Cambridge was thus an almost ideal one, Within easy reach of a great city, with its literary and social clubs, its theatres, lecture courses, public meetings, dinner parties, etc., he yet lived withdrawn in an academic retirement among elm-shaded avenues and leafy gardens, the dome of the Boston State House looming distantly across the meadows, where the Charles laid its steel-blue sickle upon the variegated, plush-like ground of the wide marsh. There was thus at all times, during the quarter of a century embraced between 1837 and 1861, a group of brilliant men resident in or about Cambridge and Boston, meeting frequently and intimately, and exerting upon one another a most stimulating influence. Some of the closer circles, all concentric to the university, of which this group was loosely composed, were laughed at by outsiders as mutual admiration societies. Such was, for instance, the five of clubs, whose members were Longfellow, Sumner, C. C. Tellen, professor of Greek at Harvard, and afterward president of the college, G. S. Hillard, a graceful lecturer, essayist, and poet, of a somewhat amateurish kind, and Henry R. Cleveland of Jamaica Plain, a lover of books and a writer of them. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, 1807-1882, to 1882, the most widely read and loved of American poets, or indeed of all contemporary poets in England and America. Though identified with Cambridge for nearly fifty years, was a native of Portland, Maine, 
and a graduate of Bowdoin College, in the same class with Hawthorne. Since leaving college in 1825, he had studied and traveled for some years in Europe, and had held the professorship of modern languages at Bowdoin. He had published several textbooks, a number of articles on the Romance languages and literatures in the North American Review, a thin volume of metrical translations from the Spanish, a few original poems in various periodicals, and the pleasant sketches of European travel entitled Outre-mer. But Longfellow's fame began with the appearance in 1839 of his Voices of the Night. Accepting an earlier collection by Bryant, this was the first volume of real poetry published in New England, and it had more warmth and sweetness, a greater richness and variety than Bryant's work ever possessed. Longfellow's genius was almost feminine in its flexibility and its sympathetic quality. It readily took the color of its surroundings and opened itself eagerly to impressions of the beautiful from every quarter, but especially from books. This first volume contained a few things written during his student days at Bowdoin, one of which, a blank verse piece on Autumn, clearly shows the influence of Bryant's Thanatopsis. Most of these juvenilia had nature for their theme, but they were not so sternly true to the New England landscape as Thoreau or Bryant. The skylark and the ivy appear among their scenic properties, and in the best of them, woods in winter, it is the English hawthorn and not any American tree through which the gale is made to blow, just as later Longfellow uses rooks instead of crows. The young poet's fancy was instinctively putting out feelers toward the storied lands of the old world, and in his Hymn of the Moravian Nuns of Bethlehem he transformed the rude church of the Moravian sisters to a cathedral with glimmering tapers, swinging censers, chancel, altar, cowls, and dim, mysterious aisle. After his visit to Europe, Longfellow returned deeply imbued with the spirit of romance. It was his mission to refine our national taste by opening to American readers, in their own vernacular, new springs of beauty in the literatures of foreign tongues. The fact that this mission was interpretative, rather than creative, hardly detracts from Longfellow's true originality. It merely indicates that his inspiration came to him, in the first instance, from other sources than the common life about him. He naturally began as a translator, and this first volume contained, among other things, exquisite renderings from the German of Uland, Salis, and Müller, from the Danish, French, Spanish, and Anglo-Saxon, and a few passages from Dante. Longfellow remained all his life a translator, and in subtler ways than by direct translation he infused the fine essence of European poetry into his own. He loved tales that have the rhyme of age and chronicles of eld. The golden light of romance is shed upon his page, and it is his habit to borrow medieval and Catholic imagery from his favorite Middle Ages, even when writing of American subjects. To him the clouds are hooded friars that tell their beads in drops of rain. The midnight winds blowing through woods and mountain passes are chanting solemn masses for the repose of the dying year, and the strain ends with the prayer, Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison. In his journal he wrote characteristically, The black shadows lie upon the grass like engravings in a book. Autumn has written his rubric on the illuminated leaves. The wind turns them over and chants like a friar. This in Cambridge of a moonshiny night on the first day of the American October. But several of the pieces in Voices of the Night sprang more immediately from the poet's own inner experience. The hymn to the night, the psalm of life, the reaper and the flowers, footsteps of angels, the light of stars, and the beleaguered city spoke of love, bereavement, comfort, patience, and faith. In these lovely songs, and in many others of the same kind which he afterward wrote, Longfellow touched the hearts of all his countrymen. America is a country of homes, and Longfellow, as the poet of sentiment and of the domestic affections, became and remains far more general in his appeal than such a cosmic singer as Whitman, who is still practically unknown to the fierce democracy to which he has addressed himself. It would be hard to overestimate the influence for good exerted by the tender feeling and the pure and sweet morality which the hundreds of thousands of copies of Longfellow's writing that have been circulated among readers of all classes in America and England have brought with them. Three later collections, Ballads and Other Poems, 1842, The Belfry of Bruges, 1846, and The Seaside and the Fireside, 1850, comprise most of what is noteworthy in Longfellow's minor poetry. 
The first of these embraced, together with some renderings from the German and the Scandinavian languages, specimens of stronger original work than the author had yet put forth, namely the two powerful ballads of The Skeleton in Armor and The Wreck of the Hesperus. The former of these, written in the swift leaping meter of Drayton's Ode to the Cambro Britons on their Harp, was suggested by the digging up of a mail-clad skeleton at Fall River, a circumstance which the poet linked with the traditions about the round tower at Newport, and gave to the whole the spirit of a Norse Viking song of war and of the sea. The wreck of the Hesperus was occasioned by the news of shipwrecks on the coast near Gloucester, and by the name of a reef, Norman's Woe, where many of them took place. It was written one night, between twelve and three, and cost the poet, he said, hardly an effort. Indeed, it is the spontaneous ease and grace, the unfailing taste of Longfellow's lines, which are their best technical quality. There is nothing obscure or esoteric about his poetry. If there is little passion or intellectual depth, there is always genuine poetic feeling, often a very high order of imagination, and almost invariably the choice of the right word. In this volume were also include The Village Blacksmith and Excelsior. The latter and The Psalm of Life have had a damnable iteration which causes them to figure as Longfellow's most popular pieces. They are by no means, however, among his best. They are vigorously expressed commonplaces of that hortatory kind which passes for poetry, but is in reality a vague species of preaching. In The Belfry of Bruges and The Seaside and the Fireside, the translations were still kept up, and among the original pieces were The Occultation of Orion, the most imaginative of all Longfellow's poems, Seaweed, which has very noble stanzas, The Favorite Old Clock on the Stairs, The Building of the Ship, with its magnificent closing apostrophe to the Union, and The Fire of Driftwood, the subtlest in feeling of anything that the poet ever wrote. With these were verses of a more familiar quality, such as The Bridge, Resignation, and The Day is Done, and many others, all reflecting moods of gentle and pensive sentiment, and drawing from analogies in nature or in legend lessons which, if somewhat obvious, were expressed with perfect art. Like Keats, he apprehended everything on its beautiful side. Longfellow was all poet. Like Ophelia in Hamlet, thought and affection, passion, hell itself, he turns to favor and to prettiness. He cared very little about the intellectual movement of the age. The transcendental ideas of Emerson passed over his head and left him undisturbed. For politics he had that gentlemanly distaste which the cultivated class in America had already begun to entertain. In 1842 he printed a small volume of poems on slavery, which drew commendation from his friend Sumner, but had nothing of the fervor of Whittier's or Lowell's utterances on the same subject. It is interesting to compare his journals with Hawthorne's American notebooks, and to observe in what very different ways the two writers made prey of their daily experiences for literary material. A favorite haunt of Longfellow's was the bridge between Boston and Cambridgeport, the same which he put into verse in his poem The Bridge. I always stop on the bridge, he writes in his journal. Tide waters are beautiful. From the ocean up into the land they go, like messengers, to ask why the tribute has not been paid. The brooks and rivers answer that there has been little harvest of snow and rain this year. Floating seaweed and kelp is carried up into the meadows, as returning sailors bringing oranges and bandana handkerchiefs to friends in the country. And again, we leaned for a while on the wooden rail and enjoyed the silvery reflection on the sea, making sundry comparisons. Among other thoughts we had this cheering one, that the whole sea was flashing with this heavenly light, though we saw it only in a single track. The dark waves are the dark providences of God, luminous, though not to us, and even to ourselves in another position. Walk on the bridge, both ends of which are lost in the fog, like human life midway between two eternities, beginning and ending in mist. In Hawthorne an allegoric meaning is usually something deeper and subtler than this, and seldom so openly expressed. Many of Longfellow's poems, The Beleaguered City, for example, may be definitely divided into two parts. In the first, a story is told or a natural phenomenon described. In the second, the spiritual application of the parable is formally set forth. This method became with him almost a trick of style, and his readers learned to look for the heck fabula docet at the end as a matter of course. As for the prevailing optimism in Longfellow's view of life, of which the above passage is an instance, 
it seemed to be in him an affair of temperament, and not, as in Emerson, the result of philosophic insight. Perhaps, however, in the last analysis, optimism and pessimism are subjective. The expression of temperament or individual experience, since the facts of life are the same, whether seen through Schopenhauer's eyes or through Emerson's. If there is any particular in which Longfellow's inspiration came to him at first hand and not through books, it is in respect to the aspects of the sea. On this theme no American poet has written more beautifully and with a keener sympathy than the author of The Wreck of the Hesperus and of Seaweed. In 1847 was published the long poem of Evangeline, the story of the Acadian peasant girl who was separated from her lover in the dispersion of her people by the English troops, and after weary wanderings and a lifelong search found him at last an old man dying in a Philadelphia hospital, was told to Longfellow by the Rev. H. L. Connolly, who had previously suggested it to Hawthorne as a subject for a story. Longfellow, characteristically enough, got up the local color for his poem from Halliburton's account of the dispersion of the Grand Prix Acadians, from Darby's geographical description of Louisiana and Watson's Annals of Philadelphia. He never needed to go much outside of his library for literary impulse and material. Whatever may be held as to Longfellow's inventive powers as a creator of characters or as an interpreter of American life, his originality as an artist is manifested by his successful domestication in Evangeline of the dactylic hexameter which no English poet had yet used with effect. The English poet, Arthur Hugh Clough, who lived for a time in Cambridge, followed Longfellow's example in the use of hexameter in his Bothy of Tabernavolach, so that we have now arrived at the time, a proud moment for American letters, when the works of our writers begin to react upon the literature of Europe. But the beauty of the descriptions in Evangeline, and the pathos, somewhat too drawn out, of the story, made it dear to a multitude of readers who cared nothing about the technical disputes of Poe and other critics, as to whether or not Longfellow's lines were sufficiently spondaic to truthfully represent the quantitative hexameters of Homer and Virgil. In 1855 appeared Hiawatha, Longfellow's most aboriginal and American book. The tripping trochaic measure he borrowed from the Finnish epic Kalevala. The vague, childlike mythology of the Indian tribes, with its anthropomorphic sense of the brotherhood between men, animals, and the forms of inanimate nature, he took from Schoolcraft's Algic Researches, 1839. He fixed forever, in a skillfully chosen poetic form, the more inward and imaginative part of Indian character, as Cooper had given permanence to its external and active side. Of Longfellow's dramatic experiments, the Golden Legend, 1851, alone deserves mention here. This was in his chosen realm, a tale taken from the ecclesiastical annals of the Middle Ages, precious with martyr's blood and bathed in the rich twilight of the cloister. It contains some of his best work, but its merit is rather poetic than dramatic, although Ruskin praised it for the closeness with which it entered into the temper of the monk. Longfellow has pleased the people more than the critics. He gave freely what he had, and the gift was beautiful. Those who have looked in his poetry for something else than poetry, or for poetry of some other kind, have not been slow to assert that he was a ladies' poet, one who satisfied callow youths and schoolgirls by uttering commonplaces in graceful and musical shape, but who offered no strong meat for men. Miss Fuller called his poetry thin, and the poet himself a dandy pindar. This is not true of his poetry, or of the best of it. But he had a singing and not a talking voice, and in his prose one becomes sensible of a certain weakness. Hyperion, for example, published in 1839, a loitering fiction interspersed with descriptions of European travel, is upon the whole a weak book, over-flowery in diction and sentimental in tone. The crown of Longfellow's achievements as a translator was his great version of Dante's Divina Commedia, published between 1867 and 1870. It is a severely literal, almost a line-for-line -line rendering. The meter is preserved, but the rhyme sacrificed. If not the best English poem constructed from Dante, it is at all events the most faithful and scholarly paraphrase. The sonnets which accompanied it are among Longfellow's best work. He seems to have been raised by daily communion with the great Tuscan into a habit of deeper and more subtle thought than is elsewhere common in his poetry. Oliver Wendell Holmes, 1809, is a native of Cambridge and a graduate of Harvard in the class of twenty-nine. 
a class whose anniversary reunions he has celebrated in something like forty distinct poems and songs. For sheer cleverness and versatility, Dr. Holmes is, perhaps, unrivaled among American men of letters. He has been poet, wit, humorist, novelist, essayist, and a college lecturer and writer on medical topics. In all of these departments he has produced work which ranks high, if not with the highest. His father, Dr. Abiel Holmes, was a graduate of Yale and an orthodox minister of liberal temper, but the son early threw in his lot with the Unitarians, and as was natural to a man of satiric turn and with a very human enjoyment of a fight, whose youth was cast in an age of theological controversy, he has always had his fling at Calvinism and has prolonged the slogans of old battles into a later generation, sometimes perhaps insisting upon them rather wearisomely and beyond the limits of good taste. He had, even as an undergraduate, a reputation for cleverness at writing comic verses, and many of his good things in this kind, such as The Dorchester Giant and The Height of the Ridiculous, were contributed to The Collegian, a student's paper. But he first drew the attention of a wider public by his spirited ballad of Old Ironsides. I tear her tattered ensign down, composed about 1830, when it was proposed by the government to take to pieces the unseaworthy hulk of the famous old man-of-war constitution. Holmes's indignant protest, which has been a favorite subject for schoolboy declamation, had the effect of postponing the vessel's fate for a great many years. From 1830 to 35, the young poet was pursuing his medical studies in Boston and Paris, contributing now and then some verses to the magazines. Of his life as a medical student in Paris, there are many pleasant reminiscences in his Autocrat and other writings, as where he tells, for instance, of a dinner party of Americans in the French capital, where one of the company brought tears of homesickness into the eyes of his sodales by saying that the tinkle of the ice in the champagne glasses reminded him of the cowbells in the rocky old pastures of New England. In 1836 he printed his first collection of poems. The volume contained, among a number of pieces broadly comic like The September Gale, The Music Grinders, and The Ballad of the Oystermen, which at once became widely popular, a few poems of a finer and quieter temper, in which there was a quaint blending of the humorous and the pathetic. Such were My Aunt and The Last Leaf, which Abraham Lincoln found inexpressibly touching, and which it is difficult to read without the double tribute of a smile and a tear. The volume contained also Poetry, a Metrical Essay, read before the Harvard chapter of the Phi Beta Kappa Society, which was the first of that long line of capital occasional poems which Holmes has been spinning for half a century, with no sign of fatigue, and with scarcely any falling off in freshness. Poems read or spoken or sung at all manner of gatherings, public and private at Harvard commencements, class days, and other academic anniversaries, at inaugurations, centennials, dedications of cemeteries, meetings of medical associations, mercantile libraries, Burns clubs and New England societies, at rural festivals and city fairs, openings of theaters, layings of cornerstones, birthday celebrations, jubilees, funerals, commemoration services, dinners of welcome or farewell to Dickens, Bryant, Everett, Whittier, Longfellow, Grant, Farragut, the Grand Duke Alexis, the Chinese Embassy, and what not probably no poet of any age or clime has written so much and so well to order. He has been particularly happy in verses of a convivial kind, toasts for big civic feasts or postprandial rhymes for the petit comité, the snug little dinners of the chosen few. His, the quaint trick to cram the pithy line that cracks so crisply over bubbling wine. And although he could write on occasion a song for a temperance dinner, he has preferred to chant the praise of the punch-bowl, and to feel the old convivial glow unaided o'er me stealing, the warm champagne old particular brandy punchy feeling. It would be impossible to enumerate the many good things of this sort which Holmes has written, full of wit and wisdom, and of humor lightly dashed with sentiment, and sparkling with droll analogies, sudden puns, and unexpected turns of rhyme and phrase. Among the best of them are Nux Post Coenetica, A Modest Request, Ode for a Social Meeting, The Boys, and Rip Van Winkle, M.D. Holmes' favorite measure in his longer poems is the heroic couplet which Pope's example seems to have consecrated forever to satiric and didactic verse. He writes as easily in this meter as if it were prose, and with much of Pope's epigrammatic neatness. He also manages with facility the anapestics of Moore and the ballad stanza which Hood had made the vehicle for his drolleries. 
It cannot be expected that verses manufactured to pop with the corks and fizz with the champagne at academic banquets should much outlive the occasion, or that the habit of producing such verses on demand should foster in the producer that high seriousness which Matthew Arnold asserts to be one mark of all great poetry. Holmes's poetry is mostly on the colloquial level excellent society verse, but even in its serious moments too smart and too pretty to be taken very gravely, with a certain glitter, knowingness, and flippancy about it, and an absence of that self-forgetfulness and intense absorption in its theme which characterize the work of the higher imagination. This is rather the product of fancy and wit. Wit, indeed, in the old sense, of quickness in the perception of analogies is the staple of his mind. His resources in the way of figure, illustration, allusion, and anecdote are wonderful. Age cannot wither him, nor custom stale his infinite variety, and there is as much powder in his latest pyrotechnics as in the rockets which he sent up half a century ago. Yet, though the humorist in him rather outweighs the poet, he has written a few things, like the chambered nautilus and homesick in heaven, which are as purely and deeply poetic as the one hoss shay and the prologue are funny. Dr. Holmes is not of the stuff of which idealists and enthusiasts are made. As a physician and a student of science, the facts of the material universe have counted for much with him. His clear, positive, alert intellect was always impatient of mysticism. He had the sharp eye of the satirist and the man of the world for oddities of dress, dialect, and manners. Naturally, the transcendental movement struck him on its ludicrous side, and in his after-dinner poem, read at the Phi Beta Kappa dinner at Cambridge in 1843, he had his laugh at the Orphic odes and runes of the Bedlamite seer and bard of mystery, who rides a beetle which he calls a sphinx, and oh, what questions asked in clubfoot rhyme of earth, the tongueless, and the deaf-mute time. Here babbling insight shouts in nature's ear, his last conundrum on the orbs and spheres. There self-inspection sucks its little thumb with Whence am I, and wherefore did I come? Curiously enough, the author of these lines lived to write an appreciative life of the poet who wrote the Sphinx. There was a good deal of Toryism or social conservatism in Holmes. He acknowledged a preference for the man with a pedigree, the man who owned family portraits, had been brought up in familiarity with books, and could pronounce view correctly. Readers, unhappily not of the Brahmin caste of New England, have sometimes resented as snobbishness Holmes harping on family and his perpetual application of certain favorite shibboleths to other people's ways of speech. The old woman who calculates is lost. Learning condemns beyond the reach of hope the careless lips that speak of soap for soap. Do put your accents in the proper spot. Don't let me beg you. Don't say how for what. The things named pants in certain documents, a word not made for gentlemen, but gents. With the rest of society, he was disposed to ridicule the abolition movement as a crotchet of the eccentric and the long-haired. But when the Civil War broke out, he lent his pen, his tongue, and his own flesh and blood to the cause of the Union. The individuality of Holmes's writings comes in part from their local and provincial bias. He has been the laureate of Harvard College and the bard of Boston City, an urban poet, with a cockneyish fondness for old Boston ways and things, the Common and the Frog Pond, Faneuil Hall and King's Chapel and the Old South, Bunker Hill, Long Wharf, the Tea Party and the Town Crier. It was Holmes who invented the playful saying that Boston State House is the hub of the solar system. In 1857 was started the Atlantic Monthly, a magazine which has published a good share of the best work done by American writers within the past thirty years. Its immediate success was assured by Dr. Holmes's brilliant series of papers, The Autocrat of the Breakfast Table, 1858, followed at once by The Professor at the Breakfast Table, 1859, and later by The Poet at the Breakfast Table, 1873. The Autocrat is its author's masterpiece, and holds the fine quintessence of his humor, his scholarship, his satire, genial observation, and ripe experience of men and cities. The form is as unique and original as the contents, being something between an essay and a drama, a succession of monologues or table talks at a typical American boarding house, with a thread of story running through the whole. The variety of mood and thought is so great that these conversations never tire, and the prose is interspersed with some of the author's choicest verse. The professor at the breakfast table followed too closely on the heels of the autocrat, and had less freshness. The third number of the series was better, 
and was pleasantly reminiscent and slightly garrulous, Dr. Holmes being now sixty-four years old, and entitled to the gossiping privilege of age. The personnel of the breakfast-table series, such as the landlady and the landlady's daughter and her son, Benjamin Franklin, the schoolmistress, the young man named John the divinity student, the Kohinoor, the Sculpin, the Scarabaeus, and the old gentleman who sits opposite, are not fully drawn characters, but outlined figures, lightly sketched, as is the autocrat's wont, by means of some trick of speech or dress or feature, but they are quite lifelike enough for their purpose, which is mainly to furnish listeners and foils to the eloquence and wit of the chief talker. In 1860 and 1867, Holmes entered the field of fiction with two medicated novels, Elsie Venner and The Guardian Angel. The first of these was a singular tale, whose heroine united with her very fascinating human attributes something of the nature of a serpent, her mother having been bitten by a rattlesnake a few months before the birth of the girl, and kept alive, meanwhile, by the use of powerful antidotes. The heroine of the guardian angel inherited lawless instincts from a vein of Indian blood in her ancestry. These two books were studies of certain medico-psychological problems. They preached Dr. Holmes's favorite doctrines of heredity and of the modified nature of moral responsibility, by reason of transmitted tendencies which limit the freedom of the will. In Elsie Venner, in particular, the weirdly imaginative and speculative character of the leading motive suggests Hawthorne's method in fiction, but the background and the subsidiary figures have a realism that is in abrupt contrast with this, and gives a kind of doubleness and want of keeping to the whole. The Yankee characters, in particular, and the satirical pictures of New England country life are open to the charge of caricature. In The Guardian Angel, the figure of Biles Gridley, the old scholar, is drawn with thorough sympathy, and though some of his acts are improbable, he is on the whole Holmes's most vital conception in the region of dramatic creation. James Russell Lowell, 1819, the foremost of American critics and of living American poets, is, like Holmes, a native of Cambridge, and like Emerson and Holmes, a clergyman's son. In 1855 he succeeded Longfellow as professor of modern languages in Harvard College. Of late years he has held important diplomatic posts, like Everett, Irving, Bancroft, Motley, and other Americans distinguished in letters, having been United States Minister to Spain, and under two administrations to the court of St. James. Lowell is not so spontaneously and exclusively a poet as Longfellow. His fame has been of slower growth, and his popularity with the average reader has never been so great. His appeal has been to the few rather than the many to an audience of scholars and of the judicious, rather than to the groundlings of the general public. Nevertheless, his verse, though without the evenness, instinctive grace, and unerring good taste of Longfellow's, has more energy and a stronger intellectual fiber, while in prose he is very greatly the superior. His first volume, A Year's Life, 1841, gave little promise. In 1843 he started a magazine, The Pioneer, which only reached its third number, though it counted among its contributors Hawthorne, Poe, Whittier, and Miss Barrett, afterward Mrs. Browning. A second volume of poems, printed in 1844, showed a distinct advance, and such pieces as The Shepherd of King Admetus, Rochus, a classical myth told in excellent blank verse, and the same in subject with one of Landor's polished intaglios, and The Legend of Brittany, a narrative poem which had fine passages but no firmness in the management of the story. As yet it was evident the young poet had not found his theme. This came with the outbreak of the Mexican War, which was unpopular in New England, and which the Free Soil Party regarded as a slaveholders' war waged without provocation against a sister republic, and simply for the purpose of extending the area of slavery. In 1846, accordingly, the Biglow Papers began to appear in the Boston Courier, and were collected and published in book form in 1848. These were a series of rhymed satires upon the government and the war party, written in the Yankee dialect, and supposed to be the work of Hosea Biglow, a homespun genius in a down-east country town, whose letters to the editor were endorsed and accompanied by the comments of the Rev. Homer Wilbur, A.M., pastor of the First Church in Jalam, and prospective member of many learned societies. The first paper was a derisive address to a recruiting sergeant, with a denunciation of the nigger-driving states and the northern dough-faces, a plain hint that the North would do better to secede than to continue doing dirty work for the South, and an expression of those universal peace doctrines which were then in the air, 
and to which Longfellow gave serious utterance in his occultation of Orion. "'As for war, I call it murder. There you have it, plain and flat. I don't want to go no further than my testament for that. God has said so plump and fairly. It's as long as it is broad, and you've got to get up early if you want to take in God.' The second number was a versified paraphrase of a letter received from Mr. Bird of Freedom Sawin, a young feller of our town that was cussed fool enough to go a-trottin' into mischief arter a drum and a fife, and who finds when he gets to Mexico that this kind of soldierin' ain't a mite like our October trainin'. Of the subsequent papers the best was, perhaps, what Mr. Robinson thinks, an election ballad which caused universal laughter and was on everybody's tongue. The Biglow papers remain Lowell's most original contribution to American literature. They are, all in all, the best political satires in the language, and unequaled as portraitures of the Yankee character, with its cuteness, its homely wit, and its latent poetry. Under the racy humor of the dialect, which became in Lowell's hand a medium of literary expression almost as effective as Burns' Ayrshire Scotch, burned that moral enthusiasm and that hatred of wrong and deification of duty, stern daughter of the voice of God, which in the tough New England stock stands instead of the passion in the blood of the southern races. Lowell's serious poems on political questions such as the present crisis, ode to freedom, and the capture of fugitive slaves have the old Puritan fervor, and such lines as, They are slaves who dare not be in the right with two or three. And the passage beginning, Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne became watchwords in the conflict against slavery and disunion. Some of these were published in his volume of 1848, and the collected edition of his poems in two volumes, issued in 1850. They also included his most ambitious narrative poem, The Vision of Sir Launfal, an allegorical and spiritual treatment of one of the legends of the Holy Grail. Lowell's genius was not epical, but lyric and didactic. The merit of Sir Launfal is not in the telling of the story, but in the beautiful descriptive episodes, one of which commencing, And what is so rare as a day in June, that if ever come perfect days, is as current as anything that he has written. It is significant of the lack of a natural impulse toward narrative invention in Lowell, that unlike Longfellow and Holmes, he never tried his hand at a novel. One of the most important parts of a novelist's equipment he certainly possesses namely, an insight into character, and an ability to delineate it. This gift is seen especially in his sketch of Parson Wilbur, who edited the Biglow Papers with a delightfully pedantic introduction, glossary, and notes, in the prose essay on a certain condescension in foreigners, and in the uncompleted poem Fitzadam's Story. See also the sketch of Captain Underhill in the essay on New England two centuries ago. The Biglow Papers, when brought out in a volume, were prefaced by imaginary notices of the press, including a capital parody of Carlyle, and a reprint from the Jalam Independent Blunderbuss, of the first sketch, afterward amplified and enriched, of that perfect Yankee idol, the Corton. Between 1862 and 1865 a second series of Biglow Papers appeared, called out by the events of the Civil War. Some of these, as for instance Jonathan to John, a remonstrance with England for her unfriendly attitude toward the North, were not inferior to anything in the earlier series, and others were even superior as poems, equal indeed in pathos and intensity to anything that Lowell has written in his professedly serious verse. In such passages the dialect wears rather thin, and there is a certain incongruity between the rustic spelling and the vivid beauty and power and the figurative cast of the phrase in stanzas like the following. What's words to them whose faith and truth on war's red touchstone rang true metal, who ventured life and love and youth for the great prize of death and battle? To him who, deadly hurt, again flashed on afore the charge's thunder, tippin' with fire the bolt of men that rived the rebel line asunder. Charles Sumner, a somewhat heavy person, with little sense of humor, wished that the author of the Biglow Papers could have used good English. In the lines just quoted, indeed, the bad English adds nothing to the effect. In 1848 Lowell wrote A Fable for Critics, something after the style of Sir John Suckling's Session of the Poets, a piece of rollicking doggerel in which he surveyed the American Parnassus, scattering about headlong fun, sharp satire, and sound criticism in equal proportion. Never an industrious workman like Longfellow at the poetic craft, but preferring to wait for the mood to seize him, 
He allowed eighteen years to go by, from 1850 to 1868, before publishing another volume of verse. In the latter year appeared Under the Willows, which contained some of his ripest and most perfect work, notably A Winter Evening Hymn to My Fire, with its noble and touching close, suggested by, perhaps, at any rate recalling, the dedication of Goethe's Faust. Ihr naht euch wieder, schwankende Gestalten. The subtle footpath and in the twilight, the lovely little poems Auf Wiedersehen and After the Funeral, and a number of spirited political pieces such as Villa Franca and The Washers of the Shroud. This volume contained also his ode recited at the Harvard Commemoration in 1865. This, although uneven, is one of the finest occasional poems in the language, and the most important contribution which our civil war has made to song. It was charged with the grave emotion of one who not only shared the patriotic grief and exultation of his alma mater in the sacrifice of her sons, but who felt a more personal sorrow in the loss of kindred of his own, fallen in the front of the battle. Particularly noteworthy in this memorial ode are the tribute to Abraham Lincoln, the third strophe beginning, Many Love Truth. The exordium, O beautiful, my country, ours once more, and the close of the eighth strophe, where the poet chants of the youthful heroes who come transfigured back, secure from change in their high-hearted ways, beautiful evermore and with the rays of morn on their white shields of expectation. From 1857 to 1862 Lowell edited the Atlantic Monthly, and from 1863 to 1872 the North American Review. His prose, beginning with an earlier volume of Conversations on Some of the Old Poets, 1844, has consisted mainly of critical essays on individual writers, such as Dante, Chaucer, Spencer, Emerson, Shakespeare, Thoreau, Pope, Carlyle, etc., together with papers of a more miscellaneous kind, like Witchcraft, New England Two Centuries Ago, My Garden Acquaintance, A Good Word for Winter, Abraham Lincoln, etc., etc. Two volumes of these were published in 1870 and 1876, under the title Among My Books, and another, My Study Windows, in 1871. As a literary critic, Lowell ranks easily among the first of living writers. His scholarship is thorough, his judgment sure, and he pours out upon his page an unwithholding wealth of knowledge, humor, wit, and imagination from the fullness of an overflowing mind. His prose has not the chastened correctness and low tone of Matthew Arnold's. It is rich, exuberant, and sometimes over-fanciful, running away into excesses of illusion, or following the lead of a chance pun so as sometimes to lay itself open to the charge of pedantry and bad taste. Lowell's resources in the way of illustration and comparison are endless, and the readiness of his wit and his delight in using it put many temptations in his way. Purists in style accordingly take offense at his saying that, Milton is the only man who ever got much poetry out of a cataract, and that was a cataract in his eye. Or of his speaking of, a gentleman for whom the bottle before him reversed the wonder of the stereoscope, and substituted the Gaston V for the B in binocular, which is certainly a puzzling and roundabout fashion of telling us that he had drunk so much that he saw double. The critics also find fault with his coining such words as undisprivacied, and with his writing such lines as the famous one from the Cathedral, 1870, spume sliding down the baffled decumen. It must be acknowledged that his style lacks the crowning grace of simplicity, but it is precisely by reason of its elusive quality that scholarly readers take pleasure in it. They like a diction that has stuff in it and is woven thick, and where a thing is said in such a way as to recall many other things. Mention should be made, in connection with this Cambridge circle, of one writer who touched its circumference briefly. This was Sylvester Judd, a graduate of Yale who entered the Harvard Divinity School in 1837, and in 1840 became minister of a Unitarian church in Augusta, Maine. Judd published several books, but the only one of them at all memorable was Margaret, 1845, a novel of which Lowell said in A Fable for Critics that it was the first Yankee book with the soul of the Down East in it. It was very imperfect in point of art, and its second part, a rhapsodical description of a sort of Unitarian utopia, is quite unreadable. But in the delineation of the few chief characters, and of the rude, wild life of an outlying New England township just after the close of the Revolutionary War, as well as in the tragic power of the catastrophe, there was a genius of high order. 
As the country has grown older and more populous, and works in all departments of thought have multiplied, it becomes necessary to draw more strictly the line between the literature of knowledge and the literature of power. Political history in and of itself scarcely falls within the limits of this sketch, and yet it cannot be altogether dismissed. For the historian's art at its highest demands imagination, narrative skill, and a sense of unity and proportion in the selection and arrangement of his facts, all of which are literary qualities. It is significant that many of our best historians have begun authorship in the domain of imaginative literature. Bancroft with an early volume of poems, Motley with his historical romances Mary Mount and Morton's Hope, and Parkman with a novel, Vassal Morton. The oldest of that modern group of writers that have given America an honorable position in the historical literature of the world was William Hickling Prescott, 1796 to 1859. Prescott chose for his theme the history of the Spanish conquests in the New World, a subject full of romantic incident and susceptible of that glowing and perhaps slightly over-gorgeous coloring which he laid on with a liberal hand. His completed histories in their order are The Reign of Ferdinand and Isabella, 1837, The Conquest of Mexico, 1843, a topic which Irving has relinquished to him, and The Conquest of Peru, 1847. Prescott was fortunate in being born to leisure and fortune, but he had difficulties of another kind to overcome. He was nearly blind, and had to teach himself Spanish and look up authorities through the help of others, and to write with a noctograph or by amanuensis. George Bancroft, 1800, issued the first volume of his great History of the United States in 1834, and exactly half a century later the final volume of the work, bringing the subject down to 1789. Bancroft had studied at Göttingen, and imbibed from the German historian Herren, the scientific method of historical study. He had access to original sources in the nature of collections and state papers in the governmental archives of Europe, of which no American had hitherto been able to avail himself. His history and thoroughness of treatment leaves nothing to be desired, and has become the standard authority on the subject. As a literary performance merely, it is somewhat wanting in flavor, Bancroft's manner being heavy and stiff when compared with Motley's or Parkman's. The historian's services to his country have been publicly recognized by his successive appointments as Secretary of the Navy, Minister to England, and Minister to Germany. The greatest, on the whole, of American historians was John Lothrop Motley, 1814 to 1877, who, like Bancroft, was a student at Göttingen and United States Minister to England. His Rise of the Dutch Republic, 1856, and History of the United Netherlands, published in installments from 1861 to 1868, equaled Bancroft's work in scientific thoroughness and philosophic grasp, and Prescott's in the picturesque brilliancy of the narrative while it excelled them both in its masterly analysis of great historic characters, reminding the reader, in this particular, of Macaulay's figure-painting. The episodes of the siege of Antwerp and the sack of the cathedral, and of the defeat and the wreck of the Spanish Armada, are as graphic as Prescott's famous description of Cortez's capture of the city of Mexico. While the elder historian has nothing to compare with Motley's vivid personal sketches of Queen Elizabeth, Philip II, Henry of Navarre, and William the Silent, the life of john of barneveld eighteen seventy four completed this series of studies upon the history of the netherlands a theme to which motley was attracted because the heroic struggle of the dutch for liberty offered in some respects a parallel to the growth of political independence in anglo-saxon communities and especially in his own america the last of these massachusetts historical writers whom we shall mention is francis parkman eighteen twenty three whose subject has the advantage of being thoroughly american his Oregon Trail, 1847, a series of sketches of prairie and rocky mountain life, originally contributed to the Knickerbocker magazine, displays his early interest in the American Indians. In 1851 appeared his first historical work, The Conspiracy of Pontiac. This has been followed by the series entitled France and England in North America, the six successive parts of which are as follows, The Pioneers of France in the New World, The Jesuits in North America, La Salle and the Discovery of the Great West, The Old Regime in Canada, Count Frontenac and New France, and Montcalm and Wolfe. These narratives have a wonderful vividness and a romantic interest not inferior to Cooper's novels. Parkman made himself personally familiar with the scenes which he described, and some of the best descriptions of American woods and waters are to be found in his histories. 
If any fault is to be found with his books, indeed, it is that their picturesqueness and fine writing are a little in excess. The political literature of the years from 1837 to 1861 hinged upon the anti-slavery struggle. In this irrepressible conflict Massachusetts led the van. Garrison had written in his Liberator in 1830, I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. But the Garrisonian abolitionists remained for a long time, even in the North, a small and despised faction. It was a great point gained when men of education and social standing like Wendell Phillips, 1811 to 1884, and Charles Sumner, 1811 to 1874, joined themselves to the cause. Both of these were graduates of Harvard and men of scholarly pursuits. They became the representative orators of the anti-slavery party, Phillips on the platform and Sumner in the Senate. The former first came before the public in his fiery speech delivered in Faneuil Hall, December 8, 1837, before a meeting called to denounce the murder of Lovejoy, who had been killed at Alton, Illinois, while defending his press against a pro-slavery mob. Thenceforth Phillips' voice was never idle in behalf of the slave. His eloquence was impassioned and direct, and his English singularly pure, simple, and nervous. He is perhaps nearer to Demosthenes than any other American orator. He was a most fascinating platform speaker on themes outside of politics, and his lecture on the lost arts was a favorite with audiences of all sorts. Sumner was a man of intellectual tastes who entered politics reluctantly, and only in obedience to the resistless leading of his conscience. He was a student of literature and art, a connoisseur of engravings, for example, of which he made a valuable collection. He was fond of books, conversation, and foreign travel and in Europe, while still a young man, had made a remarkable impression in society. But he left all this for public life, and in 1851 was elected as Webster's successor to the Senate of the United States. Thereafter he remained the leader of the abolitionists in Congress until slavery was abolished. His influence throughout the North was greatly increased by the brutal attack upon him in the Senate chamber in 1856 by Bully Brooks of South Carolina. Sumner's oratory was stately and somewhat labored, while speaking, he always seemed, as has been wittily said, to be surveying a broad landscape of his own convictions. His most impressive qualities as a speaker were his intense moral earnestness and his thorough knowledge of his subject. The most telling of his parliamentary speeches are perhaps his speech on the Kansas-Nebraska Bill of February 3, 1854, and on the Crime Against Kansas, May 9th and 20th, 1856, of his platform addresses the Oration on the True Grandeur of Nations. End of Part 2, Chapter 5 Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany on March 15, 2009Part 2, Chapter 6 of A Brief History of English and American Literature This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kalinda a Brief History of English and American Literature by Henry A. Beers Part 2, Chapter 6 Literature in the Cities, 1837-1861 to 1861. Literature as a profession has hardly existed in the United States until very recently. Even now the number of those who support themselves by purely literary work is small, Although the growth of the reading public and the establishment of great magazines such as Harper's, The Century, and The Atlantic have made a market for intellectual wares which forty years ago would have seemed a godsend to poorly paid bohemians like Poe or obscure men of genius like Hawthorne. About 1840, two Philadelphia magazines, Godey's Ladies Book and Graham's Monthly, began to pay their contributors twelve dollars a page, a price then thought wildly munificent. But the first magazine of the modern type was Harper's Monthly, founded in 1850. American books have always suffered, and still continue to suffer, from the want of an international copyright, which has flooded the country with cheap reprints and translations of foreign works, with which the domestic product has been unable to contend on such uneven terms. With the first ocean steamers there started up a class of large-paged weeklies in New York and elsewhere, such as Brother Jonathan, The New World, and The Corsair, which furnished their readers with the freshest writings of Dickens and Bulwer and other British celebrities within a fortnight after their appearance in London. 
This still further restricted the profits of native authors, and nearly drove them from the field of periodical literature. By special arrangement, the novels of Thackeray and other English writers were printed in Harper's in installments simultaneously with their issue in English periodicals. The Atlantic was the first of our magazines which was founded expressly for the encouragement of home talent, and which had a purely Yankee flavor. Journalism was the profession which naturally attracted men of letters, as having most in common with their chosen work, and as giving them a medium, under their own control, through which they could address the public. A few favored scholars, like Prescott, were made independent by the possession of private fortunes. Others, like Holmes, Longfellow, and Lowell, gave to literature such leisure as they could get in the intervals of an active profession or of college work. Still others, like Emerson and Thoreau, by living in the country and making their modest competence, eked out in Emerson's case by lecturing here and there, suffice for their simple needs, secured themselves freedom from the restraints of any regular calling. But in default of some such pousse d'eau, our men of letters have usually sought the cities and allied themselves with the press. It will be remembered that Lowell started a short-lived magazine on his own account, and that he afterward edited The Atlantic and The North American. Also, that Ripley and Charles A. Dana betook themselves to journalism after the breakup of the Brook Farm community. In the same way, William Cullen Bryant, 1794-1878, the earliest American poet of importance, whose impulses drew him to the solitudes of nature, was compelled to gain a livelihood by conducting a daily newspaper, or as he himself puts it, was forced to drudge from the dregs of men and scrawl strange words with the barbarous pen. Bryant was born at Cummington in Berkshire, the westernmost county of Massachusetts. After two years in Williams College he studied law and practiced for nine years as a country lawyer in Plainfield and Great Barrington. Following the line of the Housatonic Valley, the social and theological affiliations of Berkshire have always been closer with Connecticut and New York than with Boston and eastern Massachusetts. Accordingly, when, in 1825, Bryant yielded to the attractions of a literary career, he betook himself to New York City, where, after a brief experiment in conducting a monthly magazine, the New York Review and Athenaeum, he assumed the editorship of the Evening Post, a democratic and free trade journal, with which he remained connected till his death. He already had a reputation as a poet when he entered the ranks of metropolitan journalism. In 1816, his Thanatopsis had been published in the North American Review, and had attracted immediate and general admiration. It had been finished indeed two years before, when the poet was only in his nineteenth year, and was a wonderful instance of precocity. The thought in this stately hymn was not that of a young man, but of a sage who has reflected long upon the universality, the necessity, and the majesty of death. Bryant's blank verse, when at its best, as in Thanatopsis and the Forest Hymn, is extremely noble. In gravity and dignity it is surpassed by no English blank verse of this century, though in rich and various modulation it falls below Tennyson's Ulysses and Mort d'Artour. It was characteristic of Bryant's limitations that he came thus early into possession of his faculty. His range was always a narrow one, and about his poetry as a whole there was a certain coldness, rigidity, and solemnity. His fixed position among American poets is described in his own hymn to the North Star. And thou dost see them rise, star of the pole, and thou dost see them set. Alone in thy cold skies thou keep'st thy old, unmoving station yet, nor joints the dances of that glittering train, nor dips thy virgin orb in the blue western main. In 1821 he read The Ages, a didactic poem in thirty-five stanzas, before the Phi Beta Kappa Society at Cambridge, and in the same year brought out his first volume of poems. A second collection appeared in 1832, which was printed in London under the auspices of Washington Irving. Bryant was the first American poet who had much of an audience in England, and Wordsworth is said to have learned Thanatopsis by heart. Bryant was indeed, in a measure, a scholar of Wordsworth's school, and his place among American poets corresponds roughly, though not precisely, to Wordsworth's among English poets. With no humor, with somewhat restricted sympathies, with little flexibility or openness to new impressions, but gifted with a high, austere imagination, Bryant became the meditative poet of nature. His best poems are those in which he draws lessons from nature, or sings of its calming, purifying, and bracing influences upon the human soul. His office, in other words, is the same which Matthew Arnold asserts to be the peculiar office of modern poetry, the moral interpretation of nature. Poems of this class are Green River, To a Waterfowl, June, The Death of the Flowers, and The Evening Wind. 
the song, O fairest of the rural maids, which has more fancy than is common in Bryant, and which Poe pronounced his best poem, has an obvious resemblance to Wordsworth's Three Years She Grew in Sun and Shade, and both of these nameless pieces might fitly be entitled, as Wordsworth's is in Mr. Palgrave's Golden Treasury, The Education of Nature. Although Bryant's career is identified with New York, his poetry is all of New England. His heart was always turning back fondly to the woods and streams of the Berkshire Hills. There was nothing of that urban strain in him which appears in Holmes and Willis. He was, in especial, the poet of autumn, of the American October and the New England Indian summer, that season of dropping nuts and smoky light, to whose subtle analogy with the decay of the young by the New England disease consumption he gave such tender expression in the death of the flowers, and amid whose bright, late quiet he wished himself to pass away. Bryant is our poet of the melancholy days, as Lowell is of June. If by chance he touches upon June, it is not with the exultant gladness of Lowell, in meadows full of bobolinks, and in the summer day that is simply perfect from its own resource, as to the bee the new campanulas illuminate seclusion swung in the air. Rather, the stir of new life in the clod suggests to Bryant by contrast the thought of death, and there is nowhere in his poetry a passage of deeper feeling than the closing stanzas of June, in which he speaks of himself by anticipation, as of one whose part in all the pomp that fills the circuit of the summer hills is that his grave is green. Bryant is, par excellence, the poet of New England wildflowers, the yellow violet, the fringed gentian, to each of which he dedicated an entire poem, the orchis and the goldenrod, the aster in the wood and the yellow sunflower by the brook. With these his name will be associated as Wordsworth's with the daffodil and the lesser celandine, and Emerson's with the Rhodora. Except when writing of nature he was apt to be commonplace, and there are not many such energetic lines in his purely reflective verse as these famous ones from the battlefield. Truth crushed to the earth shall rise again, the eternal years of God are hers, but error, wounded, writhes in pain and dies among his worshippers. He added but slowly to the number of his poems, publishing a new collection in 1840, another in 1844 and thirty poems in 1864. His work at all ages was remarkably even. Thanatopsis was as mature as anything that he wrote afterward, and among his later pieces, The Planting of the Apple Tree and The Flood of Years, were as fresh as anything he had written in the first flesh of youth. Bryant's poetic style was always pure and correct, without any tincture of affectation or extravagance. His prose writings are not important, consisting mainly of papers of the Salmagundi variety, contributed to the talisman, an annual published in 1827 to 1830, some rather sketchy stories, Tales of the Glauber Spa, 1832, and Impressions of Europe, entitled Letters of a Traveler, issued in two series, in 1849 and 1858. In 1869 and 1871 appeared his blank verse translations of the Iliad and Odyssey, a remarkable achievement for a man of his age, and not excelled upon the whole by any recent metrical version of Homer in the English tongue. Bryant's half-century of service as the editor of a daily paper should not be overlooked. The Evening Post, under his management, was always honest, gentlemanly, and courageous, and did much to raise the tone of journalism in New York. Another Massachusetts poet, who was outside the Boston coterie, like Bryant, and like him tried his hand at journalism, was John Greenleaf Whittier, 1807. He was born in a solitary farmhouse near Haverhill, in the valley of the Merrimack, and his life has been passed mostly at his native place and at the neighboring town of Amesbury. The local color, which is very pronounced in his poetry, is that of the Merrimack from the vicinity of Haverhill to its mouth at Newburyport, a region of hillside farms opening out below into wide marshes, the low green prairies of the sea, and the beaches of Hampton and Salisbury. The scenery of the Merrimack is familiar to all readers of Whittier, the cotton-spinning towns along its banks, with their factories and dams the sloping pastures and orchards of the back country, the sands of Plum Island, and the level reaches of water meadow between which glide the broad-sailed gundalows, a local corruption of gondolo, laden with hay. Whittier was a farmer lad, and had only such education as the district schools could supply, supplemented by two years at the Haverhill Academy. In his school days he gives a picture of the little old country schoolhouse as it used to be, the only alma mater of so many distinguished Americans, and to which many others who have afterward trodden the pavements of great universities look back so fondly as to their first wicket-gate into the land of knowledge. Still sits the schoolhouse by the road, a ragged beggar sunning, 
around it still the sumacs grow and blackberry vines are running within the master's desk is seen deep scarred by raps official the warping floor the battered seats the jackknife's carved initial a copy of burns awoke the slumbering instinct in the young poet and he began to contribute verses to garrison's free press published at newburyport and to the haverhill gazette then he went to boston and became editor for a short time of the manufacturer next he edited the essex gazette at haverhill and in eighteen thirty he took charge of george d prentice's paper the new england weekly review at hartford connecticut here he fell in with a young connecticut poet of much promise j g c brainard editor of the connecticut mirror whose remains Whittier edited in 1832. At Hartford, too, he published his first book, a volume of prose and verse entitled Legends of New England, 1831, which is not otherwise remarkable than as showing his early interest in Indian colonial traditions, especially those which had a touch of the supernatural, a mine which he afterward worked to good purpose in The Bridal of Pennacook, The Witch's Daughter, and similar poems. Some of the legends testify to Brainerd's influence and to the influence of Whittier's temporary residence at Hartford. One of the prose pieces, for example, deals with the famous Moodus noises at Haddam on the Connecticut River, and one of the poems is the same in subject with Brainerd's Black Fox of Salmon River. After a year and a half at Hartford, Whittier returned to Haverhill and to farming. The anti-slavery agitation was now beginning, and into this he threw himself with all the ardor of his nature. He became the poet of reform, as Garrison was its apostle, and Sumner and Phillips its speakers. In 1833 he published Justice and Expediency, a prose tract against slavery, and in the same year he took part in the formation of the American Anti-Slavery Society at Philadelphia, sitting in the convention as a delegate of the Boston abolitionists. Whittier was a Quaker, and that denomination, influenced by the preaching of John Woolman and others, had long since quietly abolished slavery within its own communion. The Quakers of Philadelphia and elsewhere took an earnest, though peaceful, part in the Garrisonian movement. But it was a strange irony of fate that had made the fiery-hearted Whittier a friend. His poems against slavery and disunion have the martial ring of a Tertius or a Kerner, added to the stern religious zeal of Cromwell's Ironsides. They are like the sound of the trumpet blown before the walls of Jericho, or the Psalms of David denouncing woe upon the enemies of God's chosen people. If there is any purely Puritan strain in American poetry, it is in the war hymns of the Quaker Hermit of Amesbury. Of these patriotic poems there were three principal collections, Voices of Freedom, 1849, The Panorama and Other Poems, 1856, and In Wartime, 1863. Whittier's work as the poet of freedom was done when on hearing the bells ring for the passage of the constitutional amendment abolishing slavery he wrote his splendid Laus Deo, thrilling with the ancient Hebrew spirit. Loud and long lift the old exulting song, Sing with Miriam by the sea. He has cast the mighty down, Horse and rider sink and drown, He hath triumphed gloriously. Of his poems distinctly relating to the events of the Civil War, the best, or at all events the most popular, is Barbara Fritchi. Ichabod, expressing the indignation of the Free Soilers at Daniel Webster's 7th of March speech in defense of the fugitive slave law, is one of Whittier's best political poems, and not altogether unworthy of comparison with Browning's Lost Leader. The language of Whittier's warlike lyrics is biblical, and many of his purely devotional pieces are religious poetry of a high order, and have been included in numerous collections of hymns. Of his songs of faith and doubt, the best are, perhaps, Our Master, chapel of the hermits, and eternal goodness, one stanza from the last of which is familiar. I know not where his islands lift their fronded palms in air, I only know I cannot drift beyond his love and care. But from politics and war Whittier turned gladly to sing the homely life of the New England countryside. His rural ballads and idols are as genuinely American as anything that our poets have written, and have been recommended as such to English working men by Whittier's co-religionist, John Bright. The most popular of these is probably Maud Muller, whose closing couplet has passed into proverb. Skipper Ireson's ride is also very current. Better than either of them as poetry is Telling the Bees. But Whittier's masterpiece in work of a descriptive and reminiscent kind is Snowbound, 1866, a New England fireside idyll which in its truthfulness recalls the winter evening of Cowper's task and Burns Cotter's Saturday night, but in sweetness and animation is superior to either of them. Although in some things a Puritan of the Puritans, Whittier has never forgotten that he is also a friend, 
and several of his ballads and songs have been upon the subject of the early Quaker persecutions in Massachusetts. The most impressive of these is Cassandra Southwick. The latest of them, The King's Missive, originally contributed to the Memorial History of Boston in 1880, and reprinted the next year in a volume with other poems, has been the occasion of a rather lively controversy. The Bridal of Pennacook, 1848, and The Tent on the Beach, 1867, which contain some of his best work, were series of ballads told by different narrators, after the fashion of Longfellow's Tales of a Wayside Inn. As an artist in verse, Whittier is strong and fervid, rather than delicate or rich. He uses only a few metrical forms, by preference the eight-syllabled rhyming couplet. Maud Muller on a summer's day raked the meadow sweet with hay, etc., and the emphatic tramp of this measure becomes very monotonous, as do some of Whittier's mannerisms, which proceed, however, never from affectation, but from a lack of study and variety, and so, no doubt in part from the want of that academic culture, and through technical equipment which Lowell and Longfellow enjoyed. Though his poems are not in dialect, like Lowell's Biglow papers, he knows how to make an artistic use of homely provincial words, such as chore, which gives his idols of the hearth and the barnyard a genuine Doric cast. Whittier's prose is inferior to his verse. The fluency which was a besetting sin of his poetry when released from the fetters of rhyme and meter ran into wordiness. His prose writings were partly contributions to the slavery controversy, partly biographical sketches of English and American reformers, and partly studies of the scenery and folklore of the Merrimack Valley. Those of most literary interest were The Supernaturalism of New England, 1847, and some of the papers in Literary Recreations and Miscellanies, 1854. While Massachusetts was creating an American literature, other sections of the Union were by no means idle. The West, indeed, was as yet too raw to add anything of importance to the artistic product of the country. The South was hampered by circumstances which will presently be described. But in and about the seaboard cities of New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Richmond, many pens were busy filling the columns of literary weeklies and monthlies and there was a considerable output, such as it was, of books of poetry, fiction, travel, and miscellaneous light literature. Time has already relegated most of these to the dusty top shelves. To rehearse the names of numerous contributors to the old Knickerbocker magazine, to Godey's and Graham's, and the New Mirror, and the Southern Literary Messenger, or to run over the list of authorlings and poetasters in Poe's papers on the Literati of New York, would be very much like reading the inscriptions on the headstones of an old graveyard. In the columns of these prehistoric magazines, and in the book notices and reviews away back in the thirties and forties, one encounters the handiwork and the names of Emerson, Holmes, Longfellow, Hawthorne, and Lowell, embodied in this mass of forgotten literature. It would have required a good deal of critical acumen at the time to predict that these and a few others would soon be thrown out into bold relief as the significant and permanent names in the literature of their generation while Paulding, Hurst, Fay, Dawes, Mrs. Osgood, and scores of others who figured beside them in the fashionable periodicals, and filled quite as large a space in the public eye, would sink into oblivion in less than thirty years. Some of these latter were clever enough people. They entertained their contemporary public sufficiently, but their work had no vitality or power of continuance. The great majority of the writings of any period are necessarily ephemeral, and time, by a slow process of natural selection, is constantly sifting out the few representative books which shall carry on the memory of the period to posterity. Now and then it may be predicted of some undoubted work of genius, even at the moment that it sees the light, that it is destined to endure. But tastes and fashions change, and few things are better calculated to inspire the literary critic with humility than to read the prophecies in old reviews and see how the future, now become the present, has quietly given them the lie. From among the professional literateurs of his day emerges with ever sharper distinctness as time goes on the name of Edgar Allan Poe, 1809 to 1849. By the irony of fate, Poe was born at Boston, and his first volume, Tamerlane and Other Poems, 1827, was printed in that city and bore upon its title page the words, By a Bostonian. But his parentage, so far as it was anything, was Southern. His father was a Marylander who had gone upon the stage and married an actress herself the daughter of an actress, and a native of England. Left an orphan by the early death of both parents, Poe was adopted by a Mr. Allen, a wealthy merchant of Richmond, Virginia. He was educated partly at an English school, was student for a time at the University of Virginia, and afterwards a cadet in the military academy at West Point. His youth was wild and irregular, he gambled and drank, was proud, bitter, and perverse. 
finally quarreled with his guardian and adopted father, by whom he was disowned, and then betook himself to the life of a literary hack. His brilliant but underpaid work for various periodicals soon brought him into notice, and he was given the editorship of the Southern Literary Messenger, published at Richmond, and subsequently of the Gentleman's, afterward Graham's Magazine, in Philadelphia. These and all other positions Poe forfeited through his dissipated habits and wayward temper, and finally in 1844 he drifted to New York, where he found employment on the Evening Mirror and then on the Broadway Journal. He died of delirium tremens at the Marine Hospital in Baltimore. His life was one of the most wretched in literary history. He was an extreme instance of what used to be called the eccentricity of genius. He had the irritable vanity which is popularly supposed to accompany the poetic temperament, and was so insanely egotistic as to imagine that Longfellow and others were constantly plagiarizing from him. The best side of Poe's character came out in his domestic relations, in which he displayed great tenderness, patience, and fidelity. His instincts were gentlemanly, and his manner and conversation were often winning. In the place of moral feeling he had the artistic conscience. In his critical papers, except where warped by passion or prejudice, he showed neither fear nor favor, denouncing bad work by the most illustrious hands and commending obscure merit. The impudent literary cliques, who puffed each other's books, the feeble chirrupings of the bardlings who manufactured verses for the annuals, and the twaddle of the genial incapables who praised them in flabby reviews, all these Poe exposed with ferocious honesty. Nor, though his writings are unmoral, can they be called in any sense immoral. His poetry is as pure in its unearthliness as Bryant's in its austerity. In 1831 Poe had published three thin books of verse, none of which had attracted notice although the latest contained the drafts of a few of his more perfect poems, such as Israfel, The Valley of Unrest, The City in the Sea, and one of the two pieces inscribed To Helen. It was his habit to touch and retouch his work until it grew under his more practiced hand into a shape that satisfied his fastidious taste. Hence the same poem frequently reappears in different stages of development in successive editions. Poe was a subtle artist in the realm of the weird and the fantastic, in his intellectual nature there was a strange conjunction, an imagination as spiritual as Shelley's, though unlike Shelley's, haunted perpetually with the shapes of fear and the imagery of ruin. With this, an analytic power, a scientific exactness, and a mechanical ingenuity more casual in a chemist or a mathematician than a poet. He studied carefully the mechanism of his verse and experimented endlessly with verbal and musical effects such as repetition and monotone and the selection of words in which the consonants alliterated and the vowels varied. In his philosophy of composition he described how his best-known poem, The Raven, was systematically built upon a preconceived plan in which the number of lines was first determined and the word nevermore selected as a starting point. No one who knows the mood in which poetry is composed will believe that this ingenious piece of dissection really describes the way in which The Raven was conceived and written or that any such deliberate and self-conscious process could originate the associations from which a true poem springs. But it flattered Poe's pride of intellect to assert that his cooler reason had control not only over the execution of his poetry, but over the very wellhead of thought and emotion. Some of his most successful stories, like The Gold Bug, The Mystery of Marie Roget, The Purloined Letter, and The Murders in the Rue Morgue, were applications of this analytic faculty to the solution of puzzles, such as the finding of buried treasure or of a lost document, or the ferreting out of a mysterious crime. After the publication of The Gold Bug, he received from all parts of the country specimens of cipher writing, which he delighted to work out. Others of his tales were clever pieces of mystification, like Hans Pfahl, the story of a journey to the moon, or experiments at giving verisimilitude to wild improbabilities by the skilful introduction of scientific details, as in The Facts of the Case of Monsieur Valdemar and Von Kempelen's Discovery. In his narratives of this kind, Poe anticipated the detective novels of Gaborio and Wilkie Collins, the scientific hoaxes of Jules Verne, and, though in a less degree, the artfully worked-up likeness to fact in Edward Everett Hale's Man Without a Country and similar fictions. While Dickens' Barnaby Rudge was publishing in parts, Poe showed his skill as a plot-hunter by publishing a paper in Graham's magazine in which the very tangled intrigue of the novel was correctly raveled and the finale predicted in advance. In his union of imagination and analytic power, Poe resembled Coleridge, who, if any one, was his teacher in poetry and criticism. Poe's verse often reminds one of Christabel and the Ancient Mariner, still oftener of Kublai Khan. 
Like Coleridge, too, he indulged at times in the opium habit. But in Poe the artist predominated over everything else. He began not with sentiment or thought, but with technique, with melody and color, tricks of language, and effects of verse. It is curious to study the growth of his style in his successive volumes of poetry. At first these are metrical experiments and vague images, original and with a fascinating suggestiveness, but with so little meaning that some of his earlier pieces are hardly removed from nonsense. Gradually, like distant music drawing nearer and nearer, his poetry becomes fuller of imagination and of an inward significance, without ever losing, however, its mysterious aloofness from the real world of the senses. It was a part of Poe's literary creed, formed upon his own practice and his own limitations, but set forth with a great display of a priori reasoning in his essay on the poetic principle and elsewhere, that pleasure, and not instruction or moral exhortation, was the end of poetry that beauty and not truth or goodness was its means, and furthermore that the pleasure which it gave should be indefinite. About his own poetry there was always this indefiniteness. His imagination dwelt in a strange country of dream, a ghoul-haunted region of weir, out of space, out of time, filled with unsubstantial landscapes and peopled by spectral shapes. And yet there is a wonderful hidden significance in this uncanny scenery. The reader feels that the wild, phantasmal imagery is in itself a kind of language, and that it in some way expresses a brooding thought or passion, the terror and despair of a lost soul. Sometimes there is an obvious allegory, as in the haunted palace, which is the parable of a ruined mind, or in the raven, the most popular of all Poe's poems, originally published in the American Whig Review for February 1845. Sometimes the meaning is more obscure, as in Ulalum, which to most people is quite incomprehensible, and yet to all readers of poetic feeling is among the most characteristic and therefore the most fascinating of its author's creations. Now and then, as in the beautiful ballad Annabel Lee, and To One in Paradise, the poet emerges into the light of common human feeling and speaks a more intelligible language. But in general his poetry is not the poetry of the heart, and its passion is not the passion of the flesh and blood. In Poe the thought of death is always near, and of the shadowy borderland between death and life. The play is the tragedy man, and its hero the conqueror worm. The prose tale, Lygia, in which these verses are inserted, is one of the most powerful of all Poe's writings, and its theme is the power of the will to overcome death. In that singularly impressive poem, The Sleeper, the morbid horror which invests the tomb springs from the same source, the materiality of Poe's imagination, which refuses to let the soul go free from the body. This quality explains why Poe's Tales of the Grotesque and Arabesque, 1840, are on a lower plane than Hawthorne's romances, to which a few of them, like William Wilson and The Man of the Crowd, have some resemblance. The former of these, in particular, is in Hawthorne's peculiar province, The Allegory of the Conscience. But in general the tragedy in Hawthorne is a spiritual one, while Poe calls in the aid of material forces. The passion of physical fear or of superstitious horror is that which his writings most frequently excite. These tales represent various grades of the frightful and the ghastly, from the mere bugaboo story like the black cat, which makes children afraid to go in the dark, up to the breathless terror of the cask of Amontillado or the Red Death. Poe's masterpiece in this kind is the fateful tale of the fall of the House of Usher, with its solemn and magnificent close. His prose at its best often recalls in its richly imaginative cast the manner of De Quincey in such passages as his Dream Fugue or Our Lady's Sorrow. In descriptive pieces like The Domain of Arnheim and the stories of adventure like The Descent into the Maelstrom, and his long sea tale, The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, 1838, he displayed a realistic inventiveness almost equal to Swift's or Defoe's. He was not without a mocking irony, but he had no constructive humor, and his attempts at the facetious were mostly failures. Poe's magical creations were rootless flowers. He took no hold upon the life about him, and cared nothing for the public concerns of his country. His poems and tales might have been written in vacuo for anything American in them. Perhaps for this reason, in part, his fame has been so cosmopolitan. In France especially his writings have been favorites. Charles Baudelaire, the author of the Fleur de Mal, translated them into French, and his own impressive but unhealthy poetry shows evidence of Poe's influence. The defect in Poe was in character, a defect which will make itself felt in art as in life. If he had had the sweet home feeling of Longfellow or the moral fervor of Whittier, he might have been a greater poet than either. 
If I could dwell where Israfel hath dwelt, and he where I, he might not sing so wildly well a mortal melody. While a bolder note than this might swell from my lyre within the sky. Though Poe was a southerner, if not by birth, at least by race and breeding, there was nothing distinctly southern about his peculiar genius, and in his wandering life he was associated as much with Philadelphia and New York as with Baltimore and Richmond. The conditions which had made the southern colonies unfruitful in literary and educational works before the Revolution continued to act down to the time of the Civil War. Eli Whitney's invention of the cotton gin in the closing years of the last century gave extension to slavery, making it profitable to cultivate the new staple by enormous gangs of field hands working under the whip of the overseer in large plantations. Slavery became henceforth a business speculation in the states furthest south, and not, as in old Virginia and Kentucky, a comparatively mild domestic system. The necessity of defending its peculiar institution against the attacks of a growing faction in the North compelled the South to throw all its intellectual strength into politics, which, for that matter, is the natural occupation and excitement of a social aristocracy. Meanwhile, immigration sought the free states, and there was no middle class at the South. The poor whites were ignorant and degraded. There were people of education in the cities and on some of the plantations, but there was no great educated class from which a literature could proceed. And the culture of the South, such as it was, was becoming old-fashioned and local, as the section was isolated more and more from the rest of the Union and from the enlightened public opinion of Europe by its reactionary prejudices and its sensitiveness on the subject of slavery. Nothing can be imagined more ridiculously provincial than the sophomorical editorials in the Southern press just before the outbreak of the war or than the backward and ill-informed articles which passed for reviews in the poorly supported periodicals of the South. In the general dearth of work of high and permanent value, one or two Southern authors may be mentioned, whose writings have at least done something to illustrate the life and scenery of their section. When in 1833 the Baltimore Saturday Visitor offered a prize of a hundred dollars for the best prose tale, one of the committee, who awarded the prize to Poe's first story, the manuscript Found in a Bottle, was John P. Kennedy a Whig gentleman of Baltimore, who afterward became Secretary of the Navy in Fillmore's administration. The year before he had published Swallow Barn, a series of agreeable sketches of country life in Virginia. In 1835 and 1838 he published his two novels, Horseshoe Robinson and Rob of the Bowl, the former a story of the Revolutionary War in South Carolina, the latter an historical tale of colonial Maryland. These had sufficient success to warrant reprinting as late as 1852. But the most popular and voluminous of all Southern writers of fiction was William Gilmore Sims, a South Carolinian, who died in 1870. He wrote over thirty novels, mostly romances of revolutionary history, Southern life, and wild adventure, among the best of which were The Partisan, 1835, and The Yemesi. Sims was an inferior Cooper with a difference. His novels are good boys' books, but are crude and hasty in composition. He was strongly Southern in his sympathies though his newspaper, the Charleston City Gazette, took part against the nullifiers. His miscellaneous writings include several histories and biographies, political tracts, addresses and critical papers contributed to Southern magazines. He also wrote numerous poems, the most ambitious of which was Atlantis, A Story of the Sea, 1832. His poems have little value except as here and there illustrating local scenery and manners, as in Southern Passages and Pictures, 1839. Mr. John Eston Cook's pleasant but not very strong Virginia comedians was perhaps in literary quality the best Southern novel produced before the Civil War. When Poe came to New York, the most conspicuous literary figure of the metropolis, with the possible exception of Bryant and Halleck, was N. P. Willis, one of the editors of the Evening Mirror, upon which journal Poe was for a time engaged. Willis had made a literary reputation when a student at Yale by his scripture poems, written in smooth blank verse. Afterward he had edited the American Monthly in his native city of Boston, and more recently he had published Pencilings by the Way, 1835, a pleasant record of European saunterings, Inklings of Adventure, 1836, a collection of dashing stories and sketches of American and foreign life, and Letters from Under a Bridge, 1839, a series of charming rural letters from his country place at Owego on the Susquehanna. Willis's work, always graceful and sparkling, sometimes even brilliant, though light in substance and jaunty in style, had quickly raised him to the summit of popularity. 
During the years from 1835 to 1850 he was the most successful American magazinist, and even down to the day of his death in 1867 he retained his hold upon the attention of the fashionable public by his easy paragraphing and correspondence in the mirror and its successor the home journal, which catered to the literary wants of the beau monde. Much of Willis's work was ephemeral, though clever of its kind, but a few of his best tales and sketches, such as F. Smith, The Ghost Ball at Congress Hall, Edith Lindsay, and The Lunatic's Skate, together with some of the letters from under a bridge, are worthy of preservation not only as readable stories, but as society studies of life at American watering-places like Nahant and Saratoga and Boston Spa half a century ago. A number of his simpler poems, like Unseen Spirits, Spring, To M from Abroad, and Lines on Leaving Europe, still retain a deserved place in collections and anthologies. The senior editor of The Mirror, George P. Morris, was once a very popular songwriter, and his Woodman Spare That Tree still survives. Other residents of New York City who have written single famous pieces were Clement C. Moore, a professor in the General Theological Seminary, whose Visit from St. Nicholas, Twas the Night Before Christmas, etc., is a favorite ballad in every nursery in the land, Charles Fenno Hoffman, a novelist of reputation in his time, but now remembered only as the author of the song Sparkling and Bright and the Patriotic Ballad of Monterey. Robert H. Messenger, a native of Boston but long resident in New York, where he was a familiar figure in fashionable society, who wrote Give Me the Old, a fine ode with a choice Horatian flavor. And William Allen Butler, a lawyer and occasional writer, whose capital satire of Nothing to Wear was published anonymously and had a great run. Of younger poets like Stoddard and Aldrich, who formerly wrote for the Mirror, and who are still living and working in the maturity of their powers, it is not within the limits and design of this sketch to speak. But one of their contemporaries, Bayard Taylor, who died, American minister at Berlin in 1878, though a Pennsylvanian by birth and rearing, may be reckoned among the literati of New York. A farmer lad from Chester County, who had learned the printer's trade and printed a little volume of his juvenile verses in 1844, he came to New York shortly after, with credentials from Dr. Griswold, the editor of Graham's, and obtaining encouragement and aid from Willis, Horace Greeley, and others, he set out to make the tour of Europe, walking from town to town in Germany, and getting employment now and then at his trade to help pay the expenses of the trip. The story of these Vandoyare he told in his Views Afoot, 1846. This was the first of eleven books of travel written during the course of his life. He was an inveterate nomad, and his journeyings carried him to the remotest regions, to California, India, China, Japan, and the Isles of the Sea, to Central Africa and the Sudan, Palestine, Egypt, Iceland, and the byways of Europe. His headquarters at home were in New York, where he did literary work for the Tribune. He was a rapid and incessant worker, throwing off many volumes of verse and prose, fiction, essays, sketches, translations, and criticism, mainly contributed in the first instance to the magazines. His versatility was very marked, and his poetry ranged from Rhymes of Travel, 1848, and Poems of the Orient, 1854, to Idols and Home Ballads of Pennsylvania Life, like The Quaker Widow and The Old Pennsylvania Farmer, and on the other side to ambitious and somewhat mystical poems like The Mask of the Gods, 1872, written in four days, and dramatic experiments like The Prophet, 1874, and Prince Deucalion, 1878. He was a man of buoyant and eager nature, with a great appetite for new experience, a remarkable memory, a talent for learning languages, and a too great readiness to take the hue of his favorite books. From his facility, his openness to external impressions of scenery and costume, and his habit of turning these at once into the service of his pen, it results that there is something newspapery and superficial about most of his prose. It is reporter's work, though reporting of a high order. His poetry, too, though full of glow and picturesqueness, is largely imitative, suggesting Tennyson not unfrequently, but more often Shelley. His spirited Bedouin song, for example, has an echo of Shelley's lines to an Indian air. From the desert I come to thee on a stallion shod with fire, and the winds are left behind in the speed of my desire. Under thy window I stand, and the midnight hears my cry, I love thee, I love but thee, with a love that shall not die. The dangerous quickness with which he caught the manner of other poets made him an admirable parodist and translator. His Echo Club, 1876, contained some of the best travesties in the tongue, 
and his great translation of Goethe's Faust, 1870-71, with its wonderfully close reproduction of the original meters, is one of the glories of American literature. All in all, Taylor may unhesitatingly be put first among our poets of the second generation, the generation succeeding that of Longfellow and Lowell, although the lack in him of original genius self-determined to a peculiar sphere, or the want of an inward fixity and concentration to resist the rich tumult of outward impressions, has made him less significant in the history of our literary thought than some other writers less generously endowed. Taylor's novels had the qualities of his verse. They were profuse, eloquent, and faulty. John Godfrey's Fortune, 1864, gave a picture of bohemian life in New York. Hannah Thurston, 1863, and the story of Kennett, 1866, introduced many incidents and persons from the old Quaker life of rural Pennsylvania, as Taylor remembered it in his boyhood. The former was like Hawthorne's Blythedale romance, a satire on fanatics and reformers, and its heroine is a nobly conceived character, though drawn with some exaggeration. The story of Kennett, which is largely autobiographic, has a greater freshness and reality than the others, and is full of personal recollections. In these novels, as in his short stories, Taylor's pictorial skill is greater on the whole than his power of creating characters or inventing plots. Literature in the West now began to have an existence. Another young poet from Chester County, Pennsylvania, namely Thomas Buchanan Reed, went to Cincinnati, and not to New York, to study sculpture and painting about 1837, and one of his best-known poems, Pons Maximus, was written on the occasion of the opening of the suspension bridge across the Ohio. Reed came east, to be sure, in 1841, and spent many years in our seaboard cities and in Italy. He was distinctly a minor poet, but some of his Pennsylvania pastorals, like the deserted road, have a natural sweetness, and his luxurious drifting, which combines the methods of painting and poetry, is justly popular. Sheridan's Ride, perhaps his most current piece, is a rather forced production and has been overpraised. The two Ohio sister poets, Alice and Phoebe Carey, were attracted to New York in 1850, as soon as their literary success seemed assured. They made that city their home for the remainder of their lives. Poe praised Alice Carey's pictures of memory, and Phoebe's nearer home has become a favorite hymn. There is nothing peculiarly Western about the verse of the Carey sisters. It is the poetry of sentiment, memory, and domestic affection. Entirely feminine, rather tame and diffuse as a whole, but tender and sweet, cherished by many good women, and dear to simple hearts. A stronger smack of the soil is in the negro melodies like Uncle Ned, O oh Susanna, Old Folks at Home, Way Down South, Nellie Was a Lady, My Old Kentucky Home, etc., which were the work not of any southern poet, but of Stephen C. Foster, a native of Allegheny, Pennsylvania, and a resident of Cincinnati and Pittsburgh. He composed the words and music of these, and many others of a similar kind, during the years 1847 to 1861. Taken together, they form the most original and vital addition which this country has made to the psalmody of the world, and entitle Foster to the first rank among American songwriters. As Foster's plaintive melodies carried the pathos and humor of the plantation all over the land, so Mrs. Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1852, brought home to millions of readers the sufferings of the Negroes in the black belt of the cotton-growing states. This is the most popular novel ever written in America. Hundreds of thousands of copies were sold in this country and in England, and some forty translations were made into foreign tongues. In its dramatized form it still keeps the stage, and the statistics of circulating libraries show that even now it is in greater demand than any other single book. It did more than any other literary agency to rouse the public conscience to a sense of the shame and horror of slavery more even than Garrison's Liberator, more than the indignant poems of Whittier and Lowell, or the orations of Sumner and Phillips. It presented the thing concretely and dramatically, and in particular it made the odious fugitive slave law forever impossible to enforce. It was useless for the defenders of slavery to protest that the picture was exaggerated, and that overseers like Legree were the exception. The system under which such brutalities could happen, and did sometimes happen, was doomed." It is now easy to point out defects of taste and art in this masterpiece, to show that the tone is occasionally melodramatic, that some of the characters are conventional, and that the literary execution is in parts feeble and in others coarse. In spite of all, it remains true that Uncle Tom's Cabin is a great book, the work of genius seizing instinctively upon its opportunity, and uttering the thought of the time with a power that thrilled the heart of the nation and of the world. 
Mrs. Stowe never repeated her first success. Some of her novels of New England life, such as The Minister's Wooing, 1859, and The Pearl of Oars Island, 1862, have a mild kind of interest, and contain truthful portraiture of provincial ways and traits, while later fictions of a domestic type, like Pink and White Tyranny and My Wife and I, are really beneath criticism. There were other Connecticut writers contemporary with Mrs. Stowe. Mrs. L. H. Sigourney, for example, a Hartford poetess, formerly known as the Hemans of America, but now quite obsolete, and J. G. Percival of New Haven, a shy and eccentric scholar whose geological work was of value, and whose memory is preserved by one or two of his simpler poems, still in circulation, such as To Seneca Lake and The Coral Grove. Another Hartford poet, Brainerd, already spoken of as an early friend of Whittier, died young, leaving a few pieces which show his lyrical gift was spontaneous and genuine, but had received little cultivation. A much younger writer than either of these, Donald G. Mitchell of New Haven, has a more lasting place in our literature by virtue of his charmingly written Reveries of a Bachelor, 1850, and Dream Life, 1852, stories which sketch themselves out in a series of reminiscences and lightly connected scenes, and which always appeal freshly to young men, because they have that dreamy outlook upon life which is characteristic of youth but upon the whole the most important contribution made by Connecticut in that generation to the literary stock of America was the Beecher family. Lyman Beecher had been an influential preacher and theologian, and a sturdy defender of orthodoxy against Boston Unitarianism. Of his numerous sons and daughters, all more or less noted for intellectual vigor and independence, the most eminent were Mrs. Stowe and Henry Ward Beecher, the great pulpit orator of Brooklyn. Mr. Beecher was too busy a man to give more than his spare moments to general literature. His sermons, lectures, and addresses were reported for the daily papers, and printed in part in book form, but these lose greatly when divorced from the large, warm, and benignant personality of the man. His volumes made up of articles in the Independent and the Ledger, such as the Star Papers, 1855, and Eyes and Ears, 1862, contain many delightful more so upon country life and similar topics, though they are hardly wrought with sufficient closeness and care to take a permanent place in letters. Like Willis's Ephemerae, they are excellent literary journalism, but hardly literature. We may close our retrospect of American literature before 1861 with a brief notice of one of the most striking literary phenomena of the time, The Leaves of Grass of Walt Whitman, published at Brooklyn in 1855. The author, born at West Hills, Long Island, in 1819, had been printer, schoolteacher, editor, and builder. He had scribbled a good deal of poetry of the ordinary kind, which attracted little attention, but finding conventional rhymes and meters too cramping a vehicle for his needs of expression, he discarded them for a kind of rhythmic chant, of which the following is a fair specimen. Press close, bare-bosomed night, press close, magnetic, nourishing sight, night of south winds, night of the few large stars, still nodding night and naked summer night. The invention was not altogether a new one. The English translation of the Psalms of David and some of the prophets, the poems of Ocean, and some of Matthew Arnold's unrhymed pieces, especially the strayed reveller, have an irregular rhythm of this kind, to say nothing of the old Anglo-Saxon poems like Beowulf and the scripture paraphrases attributed to Cædmon. But this species of oratio soluta, carried to the lengths to which Whitman carried it, had an air of novelty which was displeasing to some, while to others, weary of the familiar measures and jingling rhymes, it was refreshing in its boldness and freedom. There is no consenting estimate of this poet. Many think that his so-called poems are not poems at all, but simply a bad variety of prose, that there is nothing to him beyond a combination of affectation and indecency, and that the Whitman cult is a passing fad of a few literary men, and especially of a number of English critics like Rossetti, Swinburne, Buchanan, etc., who, being determined to have something unmistakably American, that is, different from anything else, in writings from this side of the water before they will acknowledge any originality in them, have been misled into discovering in Whitman the poet of democracy. Others maintain that he is the greatest of American poets, or indeed of all modern poets, that he is cosmic or universal, and that he has put an end for ever to puling rhymes and lines chopped up into metrical feet. Whether Whitman's poetry is formerly poetry at all, or merely the raw material of poetry, the chaotic and amorphous impression which it makes on readers of conservative tastes results from his effort to take up into his verse elements which poetry has usually left out, the ugly, the earthy, and even the disgusting, the underside of things, 
which he holds not to be prosaic, when apprehended with a strong masculine joy in life and nature seen in all their aspects. The lack of these elements in the conventional poets seems to him and his disciples like leaving out the salt from the ocean, making poetry merely pretty and blinking whole classes of facts. Hence the naturalism and animalism of some of the divisions in Leaves of Grass, particularly that entitled Children of Adam, which gave great offense by its immodesty or its outspokenness. Whitman's holds that nakedness is chaste, that all the functions of the body in healthy exercise are equally clean, that all, in fact, are divine, and that matter is as divine as spirit. The effort to get everything into his poetry, to speak out his thought just as it comes to him, accounts, too, for his way of cataloguing objects without selection. His single expressions are often unsurpassed for descriptive beauty and truth. He speaks of the vitreous pour of the full moon, just tipped with blue, of the lisp of the plain, of the prairies, where herds of buffalo make a crawling spread of the square miles. But if there is any eternal distinction between poetry and prose, the most liberal canons of the poetic art will never agree to accept lines like these. And I remember putting plasters on the galls of his neck and ankles, and he stayed with me a week before he was recuperated and passed north. Whitman is the spokesman of democracy and of the future, full of brotherliness and hope, loving the warm, gregarious pressure of the crowd and the touch of his comrade's elbow in the ranks. He liked the people, multitudes of people, the swarm of life beheld from a Broadway omnibus or a Brooklyn ferryboat. The rowdy and the negro truck driver were closer to his sympathy than the gentleman and the scholar. I loaf and invite my soul, he writes. I sound my barbaric yawp over the roofs of the world. His poem, Walt Whitman, frankly egotistic, simply describes himself as a typical average man, the same as any other man, and therefore not individual, but universal. He has great tenderness and hardiness, the good gray poet, and during the Civil War he devoted himself unreservedly to the wounded soldiers in the Washington hospitals, an experience which he has related in The Dresser and elsewhere. It is characteristic of his rough and ready camaraderie to use slang and newspaper English in his poetry to call himself Walt instead of Walter, and to have his picture taken in a slouch hat and with a flannel shirt open at the throat. His decriers allege that he poses for effect, that he is simply a backward eddy in the tide, and significant only as a temporary reaction against ultra-civilization, like Thoreau, though in a different way. But with all his mistakes in art there is a healthy, virile, tumultuous pulse of life in his lyric utterance, and a great sweep of imagination in his panoramic view of times and countries. One likes to read him because he feels so good, enjoys so fully the play of his senses, and has such a lusty confidence in his own immortality and in the prospects of the human race. Stripped of verbiage and repetition, his ideas are not many. His indebtedness to Emerson, who wrote an introduction to The Leaves of Grass, is manifest. He sings of man and not men, and the individual differences of character, sentiment, and passion, the dramatic elements of life, find small place in his system. It is too early to say what will be his final position in literary history, but it is noteworthy that the democratic masses have not accepted him yet as their poet. Whittier and Longfellow, the poets of conscience and feeling, are the darlings of the American people. The admiration and even the knowledge of Whitman are mostly esoteric, confined to the literary class. It is also not without significance as to the ultimate reception of his innovations in verse that he has numerous parodists, but no imitators. The tendency among our younger poets is not toward the abandonment of rhyme and meter, but toward the introduction of new stanza forms, and an increasing carefulness and finish in the technique of their art. It is observable, too, that in his most inspired passages Whitman reverts to the old forms of verse, to blank verse, for example, in The Man of Warbird. Thou who hast slept all night upon the storm, waking renewed on thy prodigious pinions, etc., and elsewhere not infrequently to dactylic hexameters and pentameters. Earth of shine and dark, modeling the tide of the river, far-swooping elbowed earth, rich apple-blossomed earth. Indeed, Whitman's most popular poem, My Captain, written after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, differs little in form from ordinary verse, as a stanza of it will show. My captain does not answer, his lips are pale and still. My father does not feel my arm, he has no pulse or will. The ship is anchored safe and sound, its voyage closed and done. From fearful trip the victor ship comes in with object won. Exult, O shores, and ring, O bells, but I, with mournful tread, walk the deck, my captain lies, fallen, cold and dead. This is from Drum Taps, a volume of poems of the Civil War. 
Whitman has also written prose, having much the same quality as his poetry, democratic vistas, memoranda of the Civil War, and more recently, specimen days. His residence of late years has been at Camden, New Jersey, where a centennial edition of his writings was published in 1876. End of Part 2, Chapter 6 Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany On March 14, 2009Part two, chapter seven of A Brief History of English and American Literature. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kalinda. A Brief History of English and American Literature by Henry A. Beers. Part two, chapter seven. Literature since 1861. A generation has nearly passed since the outbreak of the Civil War and although public affairs are still mainly in the hands of men who had reached manhood before the conflict opened, or who were old enough at that time to remember clearly its stirring events, the younger men who are daily coming forward to take their places know it only by tradition. It makes a definite break in the history of our literature, and a number of new literary schools and tendencies have appeared since its close. As to the literature of the war itself, it was largely the work of writers who had already reached or passed middle age. All of the more important authors described in the last three chapters survived the rebellion, except Poe, who died in 1849, Prescott, who died in 1859, and Thoreau and Hawthorne, who died in the second and fourth years of the war, respectively. The final and authoritative history of the struggle has not yet been written, and cannot be written for many years to come. Many partial and tentative accounts have, however, appeared, among which may be mentioned on the northern side, Horace Greeley's American Conflict, 1864-66, Vice President Wilson's Rise and Fall of the Slave Power in America, and J. W. Draper's American Civil War, 1868-70. On the southern side, Alexander H. Stevens's Confederate States of America, Jefferson Davis's Rise and Fall of the Confederate States of America, and E. A. Pollard's Lost Cause. These, with the exception of Dr. Draper's philosophical narrative, have the advantage of being the work of actors in the political or military events which they describe, and the disadvantage of being, therefore, partisan, in some instances passionately partisan. A storehouse of materials for the coming historian is also at hand in Frank Moore's great collection, The Rebellion Record. In numerous regimental histories and histories of special armies, departments, and battles, like W. Swinton's Army of the Potomac, in the autobiographies and recollections of Grant and Sherman and other military leaders, in the war papers, now publishing in the Century Magazine, and in innumerable sketches and reminiscences by officers and privates on both sides. The war had its poetry, its humors, and its general literature, some of which have been mentioned in connection with Whittier, Lowell, Holmes, Whitman, and others, and some of which remain to be mentioned as the work of new writers, or of writers who had previously made little mark. There were war songs on both sides, few of which had much literary value, excepting perhaps James R. Randall's southern ballad, Maryland, My Maryland, sung to the old college air of Lauriga Horatius, and the grand martial chorus of John Brown's body, an old Methodist hymn, to which the northern armies beat time as they went marching on. Randall's song, though spirited, was marred by its fire-reading absurdities about vandals and minions and northern scum, the cheap insults of the southern newspaper press. To furnish the John Brown chorus with words worthy of the music, Mrs. Julia Ward Howe wrote her Battle Hymn of the Republic, a noble poem, but rather too fine and literary for a song and so never fully accepted by the soldiers. Among the many verses which voiced the anguish and the patriotism of that stern time, which told of partings and homecomings, of women waiting by desolate hearths in country homes for tidings of husbands and sons who had gone to war, or which celebrated individual deeds of heroism, or sang the thousand private tragedies and heartbreaks of the great conflict, by far the greater number were of too humble a grade to survive the feeling of the hour. Among the best, or the most popular of them, were Kate Putnam Osgood's Driving Home the Cows, Mrs. Ethel Lynn Beers's All Quiet Along the Potomac, Forsyth Wilson's Old Sergeant, 
and John James Pyatt's Riding to Vote. Of the poets whom the war brought out, or developed, the most noteworthy were Henry Timrod of South Carolina and Henry Howard Brownell of Connecticut. During the war, Timrod was with the Confederate Army of the West, as correspondent for the Charleston Mercury, and in 1864 he became assistant editor of the South Carolinian at Columbia. Sherman's march to the sea broke up his business, and he returned to Charleston. A complete edition of his poems was published in 1873, six years after his death. The prettiest of all Timrod's poems is Katy, but more to our present purpose are Charleston, written in the time of the blockade, and The Unknown Dead, which tells of nameless graves on battle plains washed by a single winter's rains, where some beneath Virginian hills and some by green Atlantic rills, some by the waters of the west, a myriad unknown heroes rest. When the war was over, a poet of New York State, F. M. Finch, sang of these and of other graves in his beautiful Decoration Day lyric, The Blue and the Gray, which spoke the word of reconciliation and consecration for North and South alike. Brownell, whose lyrics of a day and war lyrics were published respectively in 1864 and 1866, was private secretary to Farragut, on whose flagship the Hartford he was present at several great naval engagements, such as the passage of the forts below New Orleans and the action off Mobile, described in his poem The Bay Fight. With some roughness and unevenness of execution, Brownell's poetry had a fire which places him next to Whittier as the kerner of the Civil War. In him especially, as in Whittier, is that Puritan sense of the righteousness of his cause which made the battle for the Union a holy war to the crusaders against slavery. Full red the furnace fires must glow that melt the ore of mortal kind. The mills of God are grinding slow, but ah, how close they grind. Today the Dahlgren and the drum are dread apostles of his name. His kingdom here can only come by chrism of blood and flame. One of the earliest martyrs of the war was Theodore Winthrop, hardly known as a writer until the publication in the Atlantic Monthly of his vivid sketches of Washington as a camp, describing the march of his regiment, the famous New York Seventh, and its first quarters in the capital at Washington. A tragic interest was given to these papers by Winthrop's gallant death in the action of Big Bethel, June 10, 1861. While this was still fresh in public recollection, his manuscript novels were published, together with a collection of his stories and sketches reprinted from the magazines. His novels, though in parts crude and immature, have a dash and buoyancy, an outdoor air about them, which give the reader a winning impression of Winthrop's personality. The best of them is perhaps Cecil Dream, a romance that reminds one a little of Hawthorne, and the scene of which is the New York University building on Washington Square, a locality that has been further celebrated in Henry James's novel of Washington Square. Another member of this same 7th Regiment, Fitz James O'Brien, an Irishman by birth who died at Baltimore in 1862 from the effects of a wound received in a cavalry skirmish, had contributed to the magazines a number of poems and of brilliant though fantastic tales, among which The Diamond Lens and What Was It had something of Edgar A. Poe's quality. Another Irish-American, Charles G. Halpine, under the pen-name of Miles O'Reilly, wrote a good many clever ballads of the war, partly serious and partly in comic brogue. Prose writers of note furnished the magazines with narratives of their experience at the seat of war, among papers of which kind may be mentioned Dr. Holmes's My Search for the Captain in the Atlantic Monthly, and Colonel T. W. Higginson's Army Life in a Black Regiment, collected into a volume in 1870. Of the public oratory of the war, the foremost example is the ever-memorable address of Abraham Lincoln at the dedication of the National Cemetery at Gettysburg. The war had brought the nation to its intellectual majority. In the stress of that terrible fight there was no room for buncombe and verbiage, such as the newspapers and stump speakers used to dole out in antebellum days. Lincoln's speech is short, a few grave words which he turned aside for a moment to speak in the midst of his task of saving the country. The speech is simple, naked of figures, every sentence impressed with a sense of responsibility for the work yet to be done, and with a stern determination to do it. In a larger sense, it says, We cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated far above our poor power to add or detract. 
The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Here was eloquence of a different sort from the sonorous perorations of Webster or the polished climaxes of Everett. As we read the plain, strong language of this brief classic, with its solemnity, its restraint, its brave old wisdom of sincerity, we seem to see the President's homely features irradiated with the light of coming martyrdom. The kindly, earnest, brave, foreseeing man, sagacious, patient, dreading praise, not blame, new birth of our new soil, the first American. Within the past quarter of a century the popular school of American humor has reached its culmination. Every man of genius who is a humorist at all is so in a way peculiar to himself. There is no lack of individuality in the humor of Irving and Hawthorne and the wit of Holmes and Lowell, but although they are new in subject and application, they are not new in kind. Irving, as we have seen, was the literary descendant of Addison. The character sketches in Bracebridge Hall are of the same family with Sir Roger de Coverley and the other figures of the Spectator Club. Knickerbocker's History of New York, though purely American in its matter, is not distinctly American in its method, which is akin to the mock heroic of Fielding and the irony of Swift in The Voyage to Lilliput. Irving's humor, like that of all the great English humorists, had its root in the perception of character, of the characteristic traits of men and classes of men, as ground of amusement. It depended for its effect, therefore, upon its truthfulness, its dramatic insight and sympathy, as did the humor of Shakespeare, of Stern, Lamb, and Thackeray. This perception of the characteristic, when pushed to excess, issues in grotesque and caricature, as in some of Dickens's inferior creations, which are little more than personified single tricks of manner, speech, feature, or dress. Hawthorne's rare humor differed from Irving's in temper, but not in substance, and belonged, like Irving's, to the English variety. Dr. Holmes' more pronouncedly comic verse does not differ specifically from the facetier of Thomas Hood, but his prominent trait is wit, which is the laughter of the head as humor is of the heart. The same is true, with qualifications, of Lowell, whose Biglow papers, though humor of an original sort, in their revelation of Yankee character, are essentially satirical. It is the cleverness, the shrewdness of the hits in the Biglow papers, their logical, that is, witty, character, as distinguished from their drollery, that arrests the attention. They are funny, but they are not so funny as they are smart. In all these writers humor was blent with more serious qualities, which gave fineness and literary value to their humorous writings. Their view of life was not exclusively comic. But there has been a class of jesters, of professional humorists in America, whose product is so indigenous and so different, if not in essence, yet at least in form and expression from any European humor, that it may be regarded as a unique addition to the comic literature of the world. It has been accepted as such in England, where Artemis Ward and Mark Twain are familiar to multitudes who have never read the One Hoss Shea or the Corton. And though it would be ridiculous to maintain that either of these writers takes rank with Lowell and Holmes, or to deny that there is an amount of flatness and coarseness in many of their labored fooleries, which puts large portions of their writing below the line where real literature begins, still it will not do to ignore them as mere buffoons, or even to predict that their humors will soon be forgotten. It is true that no literary fashion is more subject to change than the fashion of a jest, and that jokes that make one generation laugh seem insipid to the next. But there is something perennial in the fun of Rabelais, whom Bacon calls the great jester of France. And though the puns of Shakespeare's clowns are detestable, the clowns themselves have not lost their power to amuse. The Americans are not a gay people, but they are fond of a joke. Lincoln's little stories were characteristically Western, 
and it is doubtful whether he was more endeared to the masses by his solid virtues than by the humorous perception which made him one of them. The humor of which we are speaking now is a strictly popular and national possession. Though America has never, or not until lately, had a comic paper ranking with Punch or Caravari or the Fliegende Blätter, every newspaper has had its funny column. Our humorists have been graduated from the journalist's desk and sometimes from the printing press, and now and then a local or country newspaper has ridden into sudden prosperity from the possession of a new humorist, as in the case of G. D. Prentice's Courier Journal, or more recently of the Cleveland Plain Dealer, the Danbury News, the Burlington Hawkeye, the Arkansas Traveler, the Texas Siftings, and numerous others. Nowadays there are even syndicates of humorists, who cooperate to supply fun for certain groups of periodicals. Of course, the great majority of these manufacturers of jests for newspapers and comic almanacs are doomed to swift oblivion. But it is not so certain that the best of the class, like Clemens and Brown, will not long continue to be read as illustrative of one side of the American mind, or that their best things will not survive as long as the mows of Sidney Smith, which are still as current as ever. One of the earliest of them was Seba Smith, who under the name of Major Jack Downing did his best to make Jackson's administration ridiculous. B. P. Shillaber's Mrs. Partington, a sort of American Mrs. Malaprop, enjoyed great vogue before the war. Of a somewhat higher kind were the Phoenixiana, 1855, and the Squibob Papers, 1856, of Lieutenant George H. Derby. John Phoenix, one of the pioneers of literature on the Pacific coast at the time of the California gold fever of 49. Derby's proposal for a new system of English grammar, his satirical account of the topographical survey of the two miles of road between San Francisco and the Mission Dolores, and his picture gallery made out of the conventional houses, steamboats, rail cars, runaway negroes, and other designs which used to figure in the advertising columns of the newspaper, were all very ingenious and clever. But all these pale before Artemis Ward, Artemis the Delicious, as Charles Reed called him, who first secured for this peculiarly American type of humor a hearing and reception abroad. Ever since the invention of Hosea Biglow, an imaginary person of some sort, under cover of whom the author might conceal his own identity, has seemed a necessity to our humorists. Artemis Ward was a traveling showman who went about the country exhibiting a collection of wax figures, and whose experiences and reflections were reported in grammar and spelling of a most ingeniously eccentric kind. His inventor was Charles F. Brown, originally of Maine, a printer by trade, and afterward a newspaper writer and editor at Boston, Toledo, and Cleveland, where his comicalities in The Plain Dealer first began to attract notice. In 1860 he came to New York and joined the staff of Vanity Fair, a comic weekly of much brightness, which ran a short career and perished for want of capital. When Brown began to appear as a public lecturer, people who had formed an idea of him from his impersonation of the shrewd and vulgar old showman were surprised to find him a gentlemanly-looking young man, who came upon the platform in correct evening dress, and spoke his piece in a quiet and somewhat mournful manner, stopping in apparent surprise when any one in the audience laughed at any uncommonly outrageous absurdity. In London, where he delivered his Lecture on the Mormons in 1866, the gravity of his bearing at first imposed upon his hearers, who had come to the hall in search of instructive information, and were disappointed at the inadequate nature of the panorama which Brown had made to illustrate the lecture. Occasionally some hitch would occur in the machinery of this, and the lecturer would leave the rostrum for a few minutes to work the moon that shone upon the great salt lake, apologizing on his return, on the ground that he was a man short, and offering to pay a good salary to any respectable boy of good parentage and education who was a good moonist. When it gradually dawned upon the British intellect that these and similar devices of the lecturer, such as the soft music which he had the pianist play at pathetic passages, nay, that the panorama and even the lecture itself were of a humorous intention, the joke began to take, and Artemis's success in England became assured. He was employed as one of the editors of Punch, but died at Southampton in the year following. Some of Artemis Ward's effects were produced by cacography or bad spelling, but there was genius in the wildly erratic way in which he handled even this rather low order of humor. 
It is a curious commentary on the wretchedness of our English orthography that the phonetic spelling of a word, as for example, was, w-u-z, for was, should be in itself an occasion of mirth. Other verbal effects of a different kind were among his devices, as in the passage where the seventeen widows of a deceased Mormon offered themselves to Artemis. And I said, Why is this thus? What is the reason of this thusness? They hove a sigh, seventeen sighs of a different size. They said, Oh, soon thou wilt be gonested away. I told them that when I got ready to leave a place, I went to stood. They said, Doth not like us? I said, I doth, I doth. I also said, I hope your intentions are honorable, as I am a lone child, my parents being far, far away. They then said, Wilt not marry us? I said, Oh, no, it cannot was. When they cried, O oh, cruel man, this is too much, oh, too much, I told them that it was on account of the muchness that I declined. It is hard to define the difference between the humor of one writer and another, or of one nation and another. It can be felt, and can be illustrated by quoting examples, but scarcely described in general terms. It has been said of that class of American humorists, of which Artemis Ward is a representative, that their peculiarity consists in extravagance, surprise, audacity, and irreverence. But all these qualities have characterized other schools of humor. There is the same element of surprise in De Quincey's anticlimax, Many a man has dated his ruin from some murder or other which, perhaps at the time he thought little of, as in Artemis's truism that a comic paper ought to publish a joke now and then. The violation of logic which makes us laugh at an Irish bull is likewise the source of the humor in Artemis's saying of Jeff Davis that it would have been better than ten dollars in his pocket if he had never been born. Or in his advice, always live within your income, even if you have to borrow money to do so. Or again, in his announcement that Mr. Ward will pay no debts of his own contracting. A kind of ludicrous confusion caused by an unusual collocation of words is also one of his favorite tricks, as when he says of Brigham Young, he's the most married man I ever saw in my life or when having been drafted at several hundred different places where he had been exhibiting his wax figures, he says that if he went on he should soon become a regiment, and adds, I never knew that there were so many of me. With this, a whimsical understatement and an affectation of simplicity, as where he expresses his willingness to sacrifice even his wife's relations on the altar of patriotism, or where, in delightful unconsciousness of his own sins against orthography, he pronounces that, Chaucer was a great poet, but he couldn't spell. Or where he says of the feast of raw dog tendered him by the Indian chief Waki Baki, it don't agree with me, I prefer simple food. On the whole, it may be said of original humor of this kind, as of other forms of originality in literature, that the elements of it are old, but the combinations are novel. Other humorists like Henry W. Shaw, Josh Billings, and David R. Locke, Petroleum V. Nasby, have used bad spelling as a part of their machinery, while Robert H. Newell, Orpheus C. Kerr, Samuel L. Clemens, Mark Twain, and more recently Bill Nye, though belonging to the same school of low or broad comedy, have discarded cacography. Of these, the most eminent by all odds is Mark Twain, who has probably made more people laugh than any other living writer. A Missourian by birth, 1835, he served the usual apprenticeship at typesetting and editing country newspapers, spent seven years as a pilot on a Mississippi steamboat, and seven years more mining and journalizing in Nevada, where he conducted the Virginia City Enterprise, finally drifted to San Francisco, and was associated with Bret Hart on the Californian, and in 1867 published his first book, The Jumping Frog. This was succeeded by The Innocents Abroad, 1869, Roughing It, 1872, a Tramp Abroad, 1880, and by others not so good. Mark Twain's drolleries have frequently the same air of innocence and surprise as Artemis Ward's, and there is like suddenness in his turns of expression, as where he speaks of the calm confidence of a Christian with four aces. If he did not originate, he at any rate employed very effectively that now familiar device of the newspaper funny man, 
of putting a painful situation euphemistically, as when he says of a man who was hanged that he received injuries which terminated in his death. He uses to the full extent the American humorist's favorite resources of exaggeration and irreverence. An instance of the former quality may be seen in his famous description of a dog chasing a coyote, in Roughing It, or in his interview with the Lightning Rod Agent, in Mark Twain's Sketches, 1875. He is a shrewd observer, and his humor has a more satirical side than Artemis Ward's, sometimes passing into downright denunciation. He delights particularly in ridiculing sentimental humbug and moralizing cant. He runs a tilt, as has been said, at copy-book texts, at the temperance reformer, the tract distributor, the good boy of Sunday school literature, and the women who send bouquets and sympathetic letters to interesting criminals. He gives a ludicrous turn to famous historical anecdotes, such as the story of George Washington and his little hatchet burlesques the time-honored adventure in nautical romances of the starving crew casting lots in the longboat and spoils the dignity of antiquity by modern trivialities saying of a discontented sailor on columbus's ship he wanted fresh shad the fun of innocence abroad consists in this irreverent application of modern common sense utilitarian democratic standards to the memorable places and historic associations of europe Tried by this test, the old masters in the picture galleries become laughable. Abelard was a precious scoundrel, and the raptures of the guide-books are parodied without mercy. The tourist weeps at the grave of Adam. At Genoa he drives the Ciceroni to despair by pretending never to have heard of Christopher Columbus, and inquiring innocently, Is he dead? It is Europe vulgarized and stripped of its illusions, Europe seen by a Western newspaper reporter without any historic imagination. The method of this whole class of humorists is the opposite of Addison's or Irving's or Thackeray's. It does not amuse by the perception of the characteristic. It is not founded upon truth, but upon incongruity, distortion, unexpectedness. Everything in life is reversed, as in the opera bouffe, and turned topsy-turvy so that paradox takes the place of the natural order of things. Nevertheless, they have supplied a wholesome criticism upon sentimental excesses, and the world is in their debt for many a hearty laugh. In the Atlantic Monthly for December 1863 appeared a tale entitled The Man Without a Country, which made a great sensation, and did much to strengthen patriotic feeling in one of the darkest hours of the nation's history. It was the story of one Philip Nolan, an army officer, whose head had been turned by Aaron Burr, and who, having been censured by a court-martial for some minor offense, exclaimed petulantly upon mention being made of the United States government, "'Damn the United States! I wish that I might never hear the United States mentioned again!' Thereupon he was sentenced to have his wish, and was kept all his life aboard the vessels of the Navy." being sent off on long voyages, and transferred from ship to ship with orders to those in charge that his country and its concerns should never be spoken of in his presence. Such an air of reality was given to the narrative by incidental references to actual persons and occurrences that many believed it true, and some were found who remembered Philip Nolan, but had heard different versions of his career. The author of this clever hoax, if hoax it may be called, was Edward Everett Hale, a Unitarian clergyman of Boston, who published a collection of stories in 1868 under the fantastic title If, Yes, and Perhaps, indicating thereby that some of the tales were possible, some of them probable, and others might even be regarded as essentially true. A similar collection, His Level Best and Other Stories, was published in 1873, and in the interval three volumes of a somewhat different kind, the Ingham Papers and Sybaris and Other Homes, both in 1869, and Ten Times One is Ten in 1871. The author shelters himself behind the imaginary figure of Captain Frederick Ingham, pastor of the Sandemanian Church at Nagua Davik, and the same characters have a way of reappearing in his successive volumes as old friends of the reader, which is pleasant at first, but in the end a little tiresome. Mr. Hale is one of the most original and ingenuous of American story writers. The old device of making wildly improbable inventions appear like fact by a realistic treatment of details, a device employed by Swift and Edgar Poe, and more lately by Jules Verne, became quite fresh and novel in his hands, and was managed with a humor all his own. 
Some of his best stories are My Double and How He Undid Me, describing how a busy clergyman found an Irishman who looked so much like himself that he trained him to pass as his duplicate, and sent him to do duty in his stead at public meetings, dinners, etc., thereby escaping bores and getting time for real work. The Brick Moon, a story of a projectile built and launched into space to revolve in a fixed meridian about the earth and serve mariners as a mark of longitude. The Rag Man and Rag Woman, a tale of an impoverished couple who made a competence by saving the pamphlets, advertisements, wedding cards, etc., that came to them through the mail, and developing a paper business on that basis. And The Skeleton in the Closet, which shows how the fate of the Southern Confederacy was involved in the adventures of a certain hoop skirt, built in the eclipse and rigged with curses dark. Mr. Hale's historical scholarship and his exact habit of mind have aided him in the art of giving vraisemblance to absurdities. He is known in philanthropy as well as in letters, and his tales have a cheerful, busy, practical way with them in consonance with his motto, look up and not down, look forward and not back, look out and not in, and lend a hand. It is too soon to sum up the literary history of the last quarter of a century. The writers who have given it shape are still writing, and their work is therefore incomplete. But on the slightest review of it two facts become manifest. First, that New England has lost its long monopoly, and secondly, that a marked feature of the period is the growth of realistic fiction. The electric tension of atmosphere for thirty years preceding the Civil War, the storm and stress of great public contests, and the intellectual stir produced by transcendentalism seem to have been more favorable to poetry and literary idealism than present conditions are. At all events, there are no new poets who rank with Whittier, Longfellow, Lowell, and others of the elder generation, although George H. Boker in Philadelphia, R. H. Stoddard and E. C. Stedman in New York, and T. B. Aldrich, first in New York and afterward in Boston, have written creditable verse, not to speak of younger writers, whose work, however, for the most part, has been more distinguished by delicacy of execution than by native impulse. Mention has been made of the establishment of Harper's Monthly Magazine, which under the conduct of its accomplished editor George W. Curtis has provided the public with an abundance of good reading. The old Putnam's Monthly, which ran from 1853 to 1858, and had a strong core of contributors, was revived in 1868, and continued by that name until 1870, when it was succeeded by Scribner's Monthly, under the editorship of Dr. J. G. Holland, and this in 1881 by The Century, an efficient rival of Harper's in circulation, in literary excellence, and in the beauty of its wood engraving, the American school of which art these two great periodicals have done much to develop and encourage. Another New York monthly, The Galaxy, ran from 1866 to 1878, and was edited by Richard Grant White. During the present year, a new Scribner's magazine has also taken the field. The Atlantic, in Boston, and Lippincott's, in Philadelphia, are no unworthy competitors with these for public favor. During the forties began a new era of national expansion, somewhat resembling that described in a former chapter, and like that bearing fruit eventually in literature. The cession of Florida to the United States in 1845, and the annexation of Texas in the same year, were followed by the purchase of California in 1847 and its admission as a state in 1850. In 1849 came the great rush to the California gold fields. San Francisco, at first a mere collection of tents and board shanties with a few adobe huts, grew with incredible rapidity into a great city. The wicked and wonderful city apostrophized by Bret Hart in his poem San Francisco. Serene, indifferent of fate, thou sittest at the western gate, upon thy heights so lately won, still slant the banners of the sun. I know thy cunning and thy greed, thy hard high lust and willful deed. The adventures of all lands and races who flocked to the Pacific coast found there a motley state of society between civilization and savagery. There were the relics of the old Mexican occupation, the Spanish missions, with their Christianized Indians, the wild tribes of the plains, Apaches, Utes, and Navajos, the Chinese coolies and washermen, all elements strange to the Atlantic seaboard and the states of the interior. The gold hunters crossed in stages or caravans enormous prairies, alkaline deserts dotted with sagebrush and seamed by deep canyons, and passes through gigantic mountain ranges. On the coast itself, nature was unfamiliar. The climate was subtropical, 
fruits and vegetables grew to a mammoth size, corresponding to the enormous redwoods in the Mariposa groves, and the prodigious scale of the scenery in the valley of the Yosemite, and the snow-capped peaks of the Sierras. At first there were few women, and the men led a wild, lawless existence in the mining camps. Hard upon the heels of the prospector followed the dram shop, the gambling hell, and the dance hall. Every man carried his colt, and looked out for his own life and his claim. Crime went unpunished or was taken in hand, when it got too rampant, by vigilance committees. In the diggings, shaggy frontiersmen and pikes from Missouri mingled with the scum of eastern cities and with broken-down businessmen and young college graduates seeking their fortune. Surveyors and geologists came of necessity. Speculators in mining stock and city lots set up their offices in the towns. Later came a sprinkling of school teachers and ministers. Fortunes were made in one day and lost the next at poker or loo. Today the lucky miner who had struck a good lead was drinking champagne out of pails and treating the town. Tomorrow he was busted and shouldered the pick for a new onslaught upon his luck. This strange, reckless life was not without fascination, and highly picturesque and dramatic elements were present in it. It was, as Bret Hart says, an era replete with a certain heroic Greek poetry, and sooner or later it was sure to find its poet. During the war, California remained loyal to the Union, but was too far from the seat of conflict to experience any serious disturbance, and went on independently developing its own resources and becoming daily more civilized. By 1868 San Francisco had a literary magazine, the Overland Monthly, which ran until 1875. It had a decided local flavor, and the vignette on its title page was a happily chosen emblem, representing a grizzly bear crossing a railway track. In an early number of the Overland was a story entitled The Luck of Roaring Camp by Francis Bret Hart, a native of Albany, New York, 1835, who had come to California at the age of seventeen in time to catch the unique aspects of the life of the Forty-Niners before their vagabond communities had settled down into the law-abiding society of the present day. His first contribution was followed by other stories and sketches of a similar kind, such as The Outcasts of Poker Flat, Miggles, and Tennessee's partner, and by verses, serious and humorous, of which last, plain language from truthful James, better known as the heathen Chinee, made an immediate hit and carried its author's name into every corner of the English-speaking world. In 1871 he published a collection of his tales, another of his poems, and a volume of very clever parodies, condensed novels, which rank with Thackeray's novels by eminent hands. Bret Hart's California stories were vivid, highly-colored pictures of life in the mining camps and raw towns of the Pacific coast. The pathetic and the grotesque went hand in hand in them, and the author aimed to show how even in the desperate characters gathered together there, the fortune-hunters, gamblers, thieves, murderers, drunkards, and prostitutes, the latent nobility of human nature asserted itself in acts of heroism, magnanimity, self-sacrifice, and touching fidelity. The same men who cheated at cards and shot each other down with, with tipsy curses were capable on occasion of the most romantic generosity and the most delicate chivalry. Critics were not wanting who held that in the matter of dialect and manners and other details the narrator was not true to the facts. This was a comparatively unimportant charge, but a more serious question was the doubt whether his characters were essentially true to human nature whether the wild soil of revenge and greed and dissolute living ever yields such flowers of devotion as blossom in Tennessee's partner and the outcasts of Poker Flat. However this may be, there is no question as to Hart's power as a narrator. His short stories are skillfully constructed and effectively told. They never drag and are never overladen with description, reflection, or other lumber. In his poems in dialect, we find the same variety of types and nationalities characteristic of the Pacific coast. The little Mexican maiden Pachita in the old mission garden, the wicked Bill Nye who tries to cheat the heathen Chinee at Euchre and to rob Injun Dick of his winning lottery ticket, the geological society of the Stanislav who settle their scientific debates with chunks of old red sandstone and skulls of mammoths, the unlucky Mr. Dow who finally strikes gold while digging a well and builds a house with a cupolo, and Flynn of Virginia, who saves his pard's life at the sacrifice of his own by holding up the timbers in the caving tunnel. These poems are mostly in monologue, like Browning's dramatic lyrics, 
exclamatory and abrupt in style, and with a good deal of indicated action, as in Jim, where a miner comes into a bar-room looking for his old chum, learns that he is dead, and is just turning away to hide his emotion when he recognizes Jim in his informant. "'Well, there, good-bye. No more, sir. I—' uh, "'What's that you say? Why, darn it, show. No. Yes. By Joe. Sold. Sold. Why, you limb, you ornery, derned old long-legged Jim.' Bret Hart had many imitators, and not only did our newspaper poetry for a number of years abound in the properties of Californian life, such as gulches, placers, divides, etc., but writers further east applied this method to other conditions. Of these, by far the most successful was John Hay, a native of Indiana and private secretary to President Lincoln, whose Little Breeches, Jim Bloodsoe, and Mystery of Gilgal have rivaled Bret Hart's own verses in popularity. In the last-named piece, the reader is given to feel that there is something rather cheerful and humorous in a bar-room fight which results in the gals that winter, as a rule, going alone to the singing school. In the two former we have heroes of the Bret Hart type, the same combination of superficial wickedness with inherent loyalty and tenderness. The profane farmer of the Southwest, who doesn't pan out on the prophets, and who has taught his little son to chaw tobacco just to keep his milk teeth white but who believes in God and the angels ever since the miraculous recovery of the same little son when lost on the prairie in a blizzard, and the unsaintly and bigamistic captain of the prairie bell, who died like a hero holding the nozzle of his burning boat against the bank till the last galoots ashore. The manners and dialect of other classes and sections of the country have received abundant illustration of late years. Edward Eggleston's Hoosier Schoolmaster, 1871, and his other novels are pictures of rural life in the early days of Indiana. Western Windows, a volume of poems by John James Pyatt, another native of Indiana, had an unmistakable local coloring. Charles G. Leland of Philadelphia, in his Hans Breitman Ballads, in dialect, gave a humorous presentation of the German-American element in the cities. By the death in 1881 of Sidney Lanier, a Georgian by birth, the South lost a poet of rare promise, whose original genius was somewhat hampered by his hesitation between two arts of expression, music and verse, and by his effort to coordinate them. His Science of English Verse, 1880, was a most suggestive, though hardly convincing, statement of that theory of their relation which he was working out in his own practice. Some of his pieces, like The Mockingbird and The Song of the Chattahoochee, are the most characteristically southern poetry that has been written in America. Joel Chandler Harris's Uncle Remus stories in Negro dialect are transcripts from the folklore of the plantations, while his collection of stories at Teague Poteets, together with Miss Murfree's In the Tennessee Mountains and her other books, have made the northern public familiar with the wild life of the moonshiners, who distill illicit whiskey in the mountains of Georgia, North Carolina, and Tennessee. These tales are not only exciting in incident, but strong and fresh in their delineations of character. Their descriptions of mountain scenery are also impressive, though in the case of the last-named writer, frequently too prolonged. George W. Cable's sketches of French Creole life in New Orleans attracted attention by their freshness and quaintness when published in the magazines and reissued in book form as Old Creole Days in 1879. His first regular novel, The Grandissimes, 1880, was likewise a story of Creole life. It had the same winning qualities as his short stories and sketches, but was an advance upon them in dramatic force, especially in the intensely tragic and powerfully told episode of Bras Coupé. Mr. Cable has continued his studies of Louisiana types and ways in his later books, but The Grandissimes still remains his masterpiece. All in all, he is thus far the most important literary figure of the New South, and the justness and delicacy of his representations of life speak volumes for the sobering and refining agency of the Civil War in the States, whose cause was lost, but whose true interests gained even more by the loss than did the interests of the victorious North. The four writers last mentioned have all come to the front within the past eight or ten years, and in accordance with the plan of this sketch receive here a mere passing notice. It remains to close our review of the literary history of the period since the war, with a somewhat more extended account of the two favorite novelists, whose work has done more than anything else to shape the movement of recent fiction. 
These are Henry James, Jr. and William Dean Howells. Their writings, though dissimilar in some respects, are alike in this, that they are analytic in method and realistic in spirit. Cooper was a romancer pure and simple. He wrote the romance of adventure and of external incident. Hawthorne went much deeper, and with a finer spiritual insight dealt with the real passions of the heart and with men's inner experiences. This he did with truth and power. But although himself a keen observer of whatever passed before his eyes, he was not careful to secure a photographic fidelity to the surface facts of speech, dress, manners, etc. Thus, the talk of his characters is book talk, and not the actual language of the parlor or the street, with its slang, its colloquial ease, and the intonations and shadings of phrase and pronunciation which mark different sections of the country and different grades of society. His attempts at dialect, for example, were of the slenderest kind. His art is ideal, and his romances certainly do not rank as novels of real life. But with the growth of a richer and more complicated society in America, fiction has grown more social and more minute in its observation. It would not be fair to classify the novels of James and Howells as the fiction of manners merely. They are also the fiction of character, but they aim to describe people not only as they are in their inmost natures, but also as they look and talk and dress. They try to express character through manners, which is the way in which it is most often expressed in the daily existence of a conventional society. It is a principle of realism not to select exceptional persons or occurrences, but to take average men and women and their average experiences. The realists protest that the moving incident is not their trade, and that the stories have all been told. They want no plot and no hero. They will tell no rounded tale with a denouement, in which all the parts are distributed, as in the fifth act of an old-fashioned comedy. But they will take a transcript from life and end when they get through, without informing the reader what becomes of the characters. And they will try to interest this reader in poor, real life with its foolish face. Their acknowledged masters are Balzac, George Eliot, Turgenev, and Anthony Trollope. And they regard novels as studies in sociology, honest reports of the writer's impression which may not be without a certain scientific value even. Mr. James's peculiar province is the international novel, a field which he has created for himself, but which he has occupied in company with Howells, Mrs. Burnett, and many others. He was born into the best traditions of New England culture, his father being a resident of Cambridge and a forcible writer on philosophical subjects, and his brother, William James, a professor in Harvard University. The novelist received most of his schooling in Europe and has lived much abroad, with the result that he has become half denationalized and has engrafted a cosmopolitan indifference upon his Yankee inheritance. This, indeed, has constituted his opportunity. A close observer and a conscientious student of the literary art, he has added to his intellectual equipment the advantage of a curious doubleness in his point of view. He looks at America with the eyes of a foreigner, and at Europe with the eyes of an American. He has so far thrown himself out of relation with American life that he describes a Boston horse-car or a New York hotel table with a sort of amused wonder. His starting point was in criticism, and he has always maintained the critical attitude. He took up story-writing in order to help himself by practical experiment in his chosen art of literary criticism, and his volume on French Poets and Novelists, 1878, is by no means the least valuable of his books. His short stories in the magazines were collected into a volume in 1875, with the title A Passionate Pilgrim and Other Stories. One or two of these, as The Last of the Valeri and The Madonna of the Future, suggest Hawthorne, a very unsympathetic study of whom James afterward contributed to the English Men of Letters series. But in the name story of the collection he was already in the line of his future development. This is the story of a middle-aged invalid American, who comes to England in search of health and finds, too late, in the mellow atmosphere of the mother country, the repose and the congenial surroundings which he has all his life been longing for in his raw America. The pathos of his self-analysis and his confession of failure is subtly imagined. The impressions which he and his faraway English kinsfolk make on one another, their mutual attraction and repulsion, are described with that delicate perception of national differences which makes the humor and sometimes the tragedy of James's later books, like The American, 
Daisy Miller, The Europeans, and An International Episode. His first novel was Roderick Hudson, 1876, not the most characteristic of his fictions, but perhaps the most powerful in its grasp of elementary passion. The analytic method and the critical attitude have their dangers in imaginative literature. In proportion as this writer's faculty of minute observation and his realistic objectivity have increased upon him, the uncomfortable coldness which is felt in his youthful work has become actually disagreeable, and his art, growing constantly finer and surer in matters of detail, has seemed to dwell more and more in the region of mere manners and less in the higher realm of character and passion. In most of his writings the heart, somehow, is left out. We have seen that Irving, from his knowledge of England and America, and his long residence in both countries, became the mediator between the two great branches of the Anglo-Saxon race. This he did by the power of his sympathy with each. Henry James has likewise interpreted the two nations to one another in a subtler but less genial fashion than Irving, and not through sympathy but through contrast, by bringing into relief the opposing ideals of life and society which have developed under different institutions. In his novel The American, 1877, he has shown the actual misery which may result from the clashing of opposed social systems. In such clever sketches as Daisy Miller, 1879, The Pension Borpas, and Bundle of Letters, he has exhibited types of the American girl, the American businessman, the aesthetic feebling from Boston, and the Europeanized or would-be denationalized American campaigners in the old world, and has set forth the ludicrous incongruities, perplexities, and misunderstandings which result from contradictory standards of conventional morality and behavior. In the Europeans, 1879, and an international episode, 1878, he has reversed the process, bringing old-world standards to the test of American ideas by transferring his dramatis personae to Republican soil. The last named of these illustrates how slender a plot realism requires for its purposes. It is nothing more than the history of an English girl of good family who marries an American gentleman and undertakes to live in America but finds herself so uncomfortable in strange social conditions that she returns to England for life, while contrariwise the heroine's sister is so taken with the freedom of these very conditions that she elopes with another American and goes west. James is a keen observer of the physiognomy of cities as well as of men, and his Portraits of Places, 1884, is among the most delightful contributions to the literature of foreign travel. Mr. Howell's writings are not without international touches. In A Foregone Conclusion and The Lady of the Aristic, and others of his novels, the contrasted points of view in American and European life are introduced, and especially those variations in feeling, custom, dialect, etc., which make the modern Englishman and the modern American such objects of curiosity to each other, and which have been dwelt upon of late even unto satiety but in general he finds his subjects at home, and if he does not know his own countrymen and countrywomen more intimately than Mr. James, at least he loves them better. There is a warmer sentiment in his fictions, too. His men are better fellows, and his women are more lovable. Howells was born in Ohio. His early life was that of a western country editor. In 1860 he published, jointly with his friend Pyatt, a book of verse, Poems of Two Friends. In 1861 he was sent as consul to Venice, and the literary results of his sojourn there appeared in his sketches Venetian Life, 1865, and Italian Journeys, 1867. In 1871 he became editor of the Atlantic Monthly, and in the same year published his suburban sketches. All of these early volumes showed a quick eye for the picturesque, an unusual power of description, and humor of the most delicate quality but as yet there was little approach to narrative. Their wedding journey was a revelation to the public of the interest that may lie in an ordinary bridal trip across the state of New York, when a close and sympathetic observation is brought to bear upon the characteristics of American life as it appears at railway stations and hotels, on steamboats, and in the streets of very commonplace towns. A Chance Acquaintance, 1873, was Howell's first novel, though even yet the story was set against a background of travel, pictures, a holiday trip on the St. Lawrence and the Saguenay, and descriptions of Quebec and the falls of Montmorency, etc., rather predominated over the narrative. 
Thus, gradually and by a natural process, complete characters and realistic novels such as A Modern Instance, 1882, and Indian Summer, evolved themselves from truthful sketches of places and persons seen by the way. The incompatibility existing between European and American views of life, which makes the comedy or the tragedy of Henry James's international fictions, is replaced in Howell's novels by the repulsion between differing social grades in the same country. The adjustment of these subtle distinctions forms a part of the problem of life in all complicated societies. Thus, in a chance acquaintance, the heroine is a bright and pretty western girl, who becomes engaged during a pleasure tour to an irreproachable but offensively priggish young gentleman from Boston, and the engagement is broken by her in consequence of an unintended slight, the betrayal on the hero's part of a shade of mortification when he and his betrothed are suddenly brought into the presence of some fashionable ladies belonging to his own monde. The little comedy Out of the Question deals with the same adjustment of social scales, and in many of Howell's other novels, such as Silas Lapham and The Lady of Aristic, one of the main motives may be described to be the contact of the man who eats with his fork with the man who eats with his knife, and the shock thereby ensuing. In Indian summer, the complications arise from the difference in age between the hero and heroine, and not from a difference in station or social antecedents. In all of these fictions the misunderstandings come from an incompatibility of manner rather than of character, and if anything were to be objected to the probability of the story, it is that the climax hinges on delicacies and subtleties which in real life, when there is an opportunity for explanations, are readily brushed aside. But in a modern instance Howells touched the deeper springs of action. In this, his strongest work, the catastrophe is brought about, as in George Eliot's great novels, by the reaction of characters upon one another, and the story is realistic in a higher sense than any mere study of manners can be. His nearest approach to romance is in The Undiscovered Country, 1880, which deals with the spiritualists and the shakers, and in its study of problems that hover on the borders of supernatural, in its out-of-the-way personages and adventures, and in a certain ideal of poetic flavor about the whole book, has a strong resemblance to Hawthorne, especially to Hawthorne in The Blythedale Romance, where he comes closer to common ground with other romancers. It is interesting to compare Undiscovered Country with Henry James's Bostonians, the latest and one of the cleverest of his fictions, which is likewise a study of the clairvoyants, mediums, women's rights advocates, and all varieties of cranks, reformers, and patrons of causes, for whom Boston has long been notorious. A most unlovely race of people they become under the cold scrutiny of Mr. James's cosmopolitan eyes, which see more clearly the charlatanism, narrow-mindedness, mistaken fanaticism, morbid self-consciousness, disagreeable nervous intensity, and vulgar or ridiculous outside peculiarities of the humanitarians than the nobility and moral enthusiasm which underlie the surface. Howells is almost the only successful American dramatist, and this is in the field of parlor comedy. His little farces, The Elevator, The Register, The Parlor Car, etc., have a lightness and grace, with an exquisitely absurd situation, which remind us more of the Comédie et Proverbe of Alfred de Musset, or the many agreeable dialogues and monologues of the French domestic stage, than of any work of English or American hands. His softly ironical yet affectionate treatment of feminine ways is especially admirable. In his numerous types of sweetly illogical, inconsistent, and inconsequent womanhood, he has perpetuated with a nicer art than Dickens what Thackeray calls that great discovery, Mrs. Nickleby. End of Part 2, Chapter 7 Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany On March twentieth, two 2009Part 2, Chapter 8 of A Brief History of English and American Literature. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kalinda. A Brief History of English and American Literature by Henry A. Beers. Part 2, Chapter 8 Theological and Religious Literature in America by John Fletcher Hurst. The important field of theology and religion in America has yielded many and rich additions to the storehouse of letters. 
The Bay Psalm Book, published in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1640, was the first book printed in the English colonies in America. Its leading authors were Richard Mather, 1596-1669, of Dorchester, father of Increase and grandfather of the still more famous Cotton Mather, Thomas Weld, and John Eliot, both of Roxbury. The book was a few years later revised by Henry Dunster, and passed through as many as twenty-seven editions. While it was both printed and used in England and Scotland by dissenting churches, it was a constant companion in private and public worship in the Calvinistic churches of the colonies. The early colonial writers on theology included Charles Chauncey, 1589-1672, to the second president of Harvard College, who wrote a treatise on justification, Samuel Willard, 1640-1707, to whose complete body of divinity was the first folio publication in America, Solomon Studdard, 1643-1729, to whose most celebrated work was The Doctrine of Instituted Churches, in which he advocated the converting power of the Lord's Supper, Charles Chauncey, 1705-1787, to a great-grandson of President Chauncey, celebrated as a stickler for great plainness in writing and speech, and one of the founders of universalism in New England, whose seasonable thoughts was in opposition to the preaching of Whitefield, and Aaron Burr, 1716-1757, father of the political opponent and slayer of Alexander Hamilton, and author of The Supreme Deity of Our Lord Jesus Christ. James Blair, 1656-1743, of Virginia, the virtual founder and first president of William and Mary College, wrote Our Savior's Sermon on the Mount, containing 117 sermons. The two tenants, Gilbert, 1703-1764, and William, 1705-1777, Samuel Finley, 1717-1764, and Samuel Davies, 1723-1761, were pulpit orators whose sermons still hold high rank in the homiletic world. Others of the colonial period distinguished for their ability are John Davenport, 1597-1670, to of New Haven, author of The Saint's Anchor Hold, Edward Johnson, died 1682, of Woburn, author of The Wonder-Working Providence of Zion's Savior in New England, Jonathan Dickinson, 1688-1747, to the first president of the College of New Jersey, Princeton University, who published Familiar Letters Upon Important Subjects in Religion, Samuel Johnson, 1696 to 1772, a distinguished advocate of episcopacy in Connecticut. Thomas Clapp, 1703 to 1767, president of Yale College, who was the author of The Religious Condition of Colleges. Samuel Mather, 1706 to 1785, a son of Cotton Mather, among whose works was An Attempt to Show That America Was Known to the Ancients, and Thomas Chalkley, a sixteen seventy five to seventeen forty nine and John Woolman seventeen twenty to seventeen seventy two both belonging to the friends and whose journals are admirable specimens of the Quaker spirit and simplicity. Some of the leading writers on theology whose activity was greatest about the time of the American Revolution are worthy of study. They are John Witherspoon seventeen twenty two to seventeen ninety four who, while he is better known as the sixth president of the College of New Jersey and a political writer of the Revolution, was also the author of Ecclesiastical Characteristics, a satirical work aimed at the moderate party of the Church of Scotland, and written before he left that country for America. Charles Thompson, 1729 to 1824, who was for fifteen years the secretary of the Continental Congress and published a translation of the Bible, Elias Boudinot, 1740-1821, the first president of the American Bible Society and a leading philanthropist of his time, who wrote The Age of Revelation, a reply to Paine's Age of Reason, Nathan Strong, 1748-1816, the editor of the Connecticut Evangelical Magazine and pastor of First Church, Hartford, Isaac Backus, 1724-1806, the author of the well-known History of New England with particular reference to the Baptists, Ezra Stiles, 1727-1795, president of Yale College, who published many discourses and wrote an ecclesiastical history of New England, which was not completed and never published. William White, 1748-1836, 
bishop of Pennsylvania for fifty years, who wrote several works on episcopacy, one of which was Memoir of the Episcopal Church in the United States, and William Lynn, 1752-1808, to who published sermons on the leading personages of scripture history. Belonging also to the revolutionary period, these should be noted. Mather Biles, 1706-1788, to a wit and punster of loyalist leanings, some of whose sermons have been many times printed, and who was a kinsman of the Mathers. Jonathan Mayhew, 1720-1766, to whose sermon on the repeal of the Stamp Act was the most famous of his stirring addresses on the political issues already prominent at the time of his death. William Smith, 1727-1803, to provost of the University of Pennsylvania, who was, not to speak of his other works, the author of several meritorious sermons, Samuel Seabury, 1729-1796, the first Protestant Episcopal bishop, and author of two volumes of sermons, and Jacob Duchesne, 1739-1798, rector of Christ Church, Philadelphia, who abandoned the American cause, but whose sermons were highly prized. A quartet of those who gained distinction as writers on doctrine are Joseph Bellamy, 1719-1790, an influential divine of the Edwardian school, and author of The True Religion Delineated, Samuel Hopkins, 1721-1803, the advocate of disinterested benevolence as a cardinal principle of theology, and author of The System of Doctrines Contained in Divine Revelation, Jonathan Edwards the Younger, 1745-1801, president of Union College and author of several discourses, the most celebrated of which are the three on the necessity of atonement and its consistency with free grace and forgiveness, these sermons are the basis of what has since been named the Edwardian theory. And Elhanan Winchester, 1751-1797, to the universalist preacher, one of whose chief works was The Universal Restoration. In the earlier group of theological authorship of the present century, or the national period, taking conspicuous place as doctrinal writers are Nathaniel Emmons, 1745-1840, to one of the foremost of the new school of Calvinistic theology, whose works on the important discussion lasting through half a century are marked by a peculiar force and point. Samuel Stanhope Smith, 1750-1819, president of the College of New Jersey and author of Evidences of the Christian Religion, his successor in office, Ashbel Green, 1762-1848, whose chief literary labor was bestowed on The Christian Advocate, a religious monthly which he edited for twelve years, and who wrote lectures on the shorter catechism. Henry Ware, 1764-1845, the acknowledged head of the Unitarians prior to the appearance of Channing, professor of divinity in Harvard, and author of The Letters to Trinitarians and Calvinists. Leonard Woods, 1774-1854, to professor in Andover for thirty-eight years, author of several able books on the Unitarian controversy, and Wilbur Fisk, 1792-1839, to the distinguished preacher and educator, and author of the Calvinistic controversy. Other theological lights of the early years of the Republic are also John Mitchell Mason, 1770-1829, provost of Columbia College, later president of Dickinson College, a prime mover in the founding of Union Theological Seminary, and author of many sermons of a high order. Edward Payson, 1783-1827, whose sermons are noted for the same ardent spirituality and beauty that marked his life and pastorate at Portland, Maine. John Summerfield, 1798-1825, a volume of whose strangely eloquent sermons were published after his early death. Ebenezer Porter, 1772-1834, professor in Andover, whose lectures on revivals of religion are still worthy of consultation. Ella Fallett Knott, 1773-1866, president of Union College for sixty-two years, whose lectures on temperance are accounted among the best literature on that great reform. John Henry Hobart, 1775-1830, bishop of the Diocese of New York who was the author of Festivals and Fasts, and one of the founders of the General Theological Seminary in New York. Nathan Bangs, 1778-1862, a leading Methodist divine who wrote A History of the Methodist Episcopal Church, and Errors of Hoskinsianism. And Leonard Withington, 1789-1885, to 
author of Solomon's Song Translated and Explained, a valuable exegetical work. In a second group of leading writers on religion, coming nearer the middle of the nineteenth century, we find as doctrinal authors Archibald Alexander, 1772-1851, author of Evidences of Christianity, Hosea Ballou, 1771-1852, the universalist preacher and author of An Examination of the Doctrine of Future Retribution, Nathaniel W. Taylor, 1786-1859, the author of Lectures on the Moral Government of God, in which there is a marked divergence from the strict school of Calvinistic theologians, Gardner Spring, 1785-1873, a tower of strength in the pulpit of New York for over fifty years, and author of The Bible Not of Man. Alexander Campbell, 1788-1865, whose public debates contain the record of his distinguished career as a controversialist and mark the formation of the religious society called Disciples of Christ. Robert J. Breckinridge, 1800-1871, whose work on the knowledge of God objectively and subjectively considered, gave him great distinction. George W. Bethune, 1805-1862, who besides several hymns wrote Lectures on the Heidelberg Catechism, and James H. Thornwell, 1811-1862, of the Southern Presbyterians, who left an able, systematic theology. Those whose works were of a more practical nature are Samuel Miller, 1769-1850, whose most telling book was Letters on Clerical Habits and Manners, Lyman Beecher, 1775-1863, the celebrated father of his more celebrated son, and author of Sermons on Temperance, Thomas H. Skinner, 1791-1871, professor in Andover and later in Union Theological Seminary, who wrote Aids to Preaching and Hearing, and translated and edited Vinay's Homiletics and Pastoral Theology. Charles G. Finney, 1792-1875, of Oberlin, whose lectures on revivals embody the principles on which he himself conducted his celebrated evangelistic labors. Francis Wayland, 1796-1865, the Baptist divine and author of a textbook on moral science, who also wrote The Moral Dignity of the Missionary Enterprise. Ichabod S. Spencer, 1798-1854, whose pastor's sketches have a perennial interest. Theodore Dwight Wolsey, 1801-1889, who besides other books on the classics and law, published The Religion of the Present and the Future. Bella Bates Edwards, 1802-1852, of Andover, whose chief work was that bestowed upon the Quarterly Observer, later the Biblical Repository, and still later as editor of Bibliotheca Sacra. James Waddell Alexander, 1804-1859, author of Consolation, or Discourses to the Suffering Children of God, and George B. Cheever, 1807-1890, who wrote several popular books on temperance, one being Deacon Giles's Distillery. A group of noted writers whose books have special bearing on the Bible are Moses Stewart, 1780-1852, the distinguished Hebraist and author of several commentaries and of a Hebrew grammar, whose scholarship was one of the chief attractions at Andover, Samuel H. Turner, 1790-1861, the distinguished commentator on Romans, Hebrews, Ephesians, and Galatians, Edward Robinson, 1794-1863, whose Biblical Researches and New Testament Lexicon mark him as one of the foremost scholars of the century, George Bush, 1796-1860, known chiefly as the author of Commentaries on the Early Parts of the Old Testament, Albert Barnes, 1798-1870, whose notes on the scriptures still have a large place among the more popular works of exegesis, Stephen Olin, 1797-1851, and John Price Durbin, 1800-1876, both distinguished as educators and pulpit orators of the Methodist Episcopal Church, who each wrote on travels in Palestine and adjoining countries. William M. Thompson, 1806-1894, the missionary and author of The Land and the Book, a work of perpetual value. Joseph Addison Alexander, 1809-1860, the famous philologist and author of valuable commentaries and a work on New Testament literature, and George Burgess, 1809-1866, who wrote The Book of Psalms in English Verse. Those who employed their pens in the field of history are 
William Mead, 1789-1862, author of Old Churches, Ministers, and Families of Virginia, George Junkin, 1790-1868, who wrote The Vindication, which gives an account of the trial of Albert Barnes from the old school point of view, William B. Sprague, 1795-1876, whose Annals of the American Pulpit form a lasting monument to his literary ability, Robert Baird, 1798-1863, author of A View of Religion in America, Francis L. Hawkes, 1798-1866, who published The History of the Protestant Episcopal Church in Maryland and Virginia, Morris J. Raffall, 1798-1868, a prolific Jewish writer, whose post-biblical history of the Jews is a valuable book, Thomas C. Upham, 1799-1871, professor in Bowdoin College and author of Mental Philosophy, who also wrote The Life and Religious Experience of Madame Guillon, William H. Furness, 1802-1896, long the leader of Unitarians in Philadelphia, from whose imaginative pen came a peculiar book, A History of Jesus, J. Daniel Rupp, born 1803, who wrote A History of the Religious Denominations in the United States, and Abel Stevens, 1815-1897, author of The History of Methodism, and also of A History of the Methodist Episcopal Church. Ashale Nettleton, 1784-1844, best known as an evangelist, published a popular collection of village hymns. Henry U. Onderdonk, 1789-1858, and John Henry Hopkins, 1792-1868, each wrote on the Episcopacy. Samuel Hanson Cox, 1793-1880, a vigorous and original preacher of the New School Presbyterians, was the author of Interviews Memorable and Useful. Henry B. Bascom, 1796-1850, whose sermons and lectures were of vigorous thought but florid style, was very popular for many years. Nicholas Murray, 1802-1861, under the nom de plume of Kirwan, wrote the celebrated letters to Archbishop Hughes on the Catholic question. And Edward Thompson, 1810-1870, Bishop of the Methodist Episcopal Church, was author of Moral and Religious Essays and Other Works. Among the American singers of sacred lyrics are Samuel Davies, 1724-1761, Timothy Dwight, 1752-1817, Mrs. Phoebe H. Brown, 1783-1861, Thomas Hastings, 1784-1872, John Pierpont, 1785-1866, Mrs. Lydia H. Sigourney, 1791-1865, William B. Tappan, 1794-1849, William A. Muhlenberg, 1796-1877, George W. Doan, 1799-1859, Ray Palmer, 1808-1887, Samuel F. Smith, 1808-1895, Edmund H. Sears, 1810-1876, William Hunter, 1811-1877, George Duffield, 1818-1888, Arthur Cleveland Cox, 1818-1896, Samuel Longfellow, 1819-1892, and Alice, 1820-1871, and Phoebe Carey, 1824-1871. From the large number of writers of the latter half of this century whose productions have been added to the treasures of thought for coming generations and are worthy of generous attention we name, Charles Hodge, 1797-1878, known best by his systematic theology, and his son, Archibald Alexander Hodge, 1823-1886, author of Outlines of Theology. Charles P. McIlvain, 1798-1873, whose Evidences of Christianity are widely known and read. Mark Hopkins, 1802-1887, who gave the world The Law of Love and Love as a Law. Edwards A. Park, born 1808, whose leading work was on the Atonement, Albert Taylor Bledsoe, 1809-1877, whose Theodicy was his chief work, James McCosh, 1811-1894, whose later years were given to America, and whose Christianity and Positivism and Religious Aspects of Evolution were written in this country, Davis W. Clark, 1812-1871, author of Man All Immortal, John Miley, 1813-1896, who was the author of A Clear and Able Systematic Theology of the Arminian Type, T. 
Thomas O. Summers, 1812-1882, who was a prolific author and whose systematic theology has been published since his death, and Lorenzo D. Maccabee, 1815-1897, who wrote on the foreknowledge of God. Those who have devoted their talent to the exposition of the scriptures are Thomas J. Conant, 1802-1891, a biblical scholar and author of Historical Books of the Old Testament, Daniel D. Whedon, 1808-1885, who wrote Freedom of the Will and was the author of a valuable commentary on the New Testament, Horatio B. Hackett, 1808-1875, whose exegetical works on the Acts, Philemon, and Philippians have great merit, Taylor Lewis, 1809-1877, the Nestor of classic linguistics, whose Six Days of Creation and the Divine Human in the Scriptures are among his best books, Melanchthon W. Jacobus, 1816-1876, whose commentaries on the Gospels, Acts, and Genesis unite critical ability and popular style, Ezra Abbott, 1818-1884, author of a critical work on the authorship of the Fourth Gospel, Howard Crosby, 1826-1891, the vigorous preacher and author of The Seven Churches of Asia, William M. Taylor, 1829-1895, whose works include excellent studies on several prominent Bible characters, Moses, David, Daniel, and Joseph, Henry Martin Harmon, 1822-1897, the author of An Introduction to the Study of the Holy Scriptures, and Henry B. Ridgeway, 1830-1895, who wrote The Lord's Land, a work based on his personal observations during an Oriental tour. Those who have treated historical themes include Charles Eliot, 1792-1869, whose ablest work was The Delineation of Roman Catholicism, Francis P. Kenrick, 1797-1863, who besides being the author of A Version of the Scriptures with Commentary, also wrote a work on the supremacy of the Pope, Matthew Simpson, 1810-1884, the eloquent bishop, who wrote A Cyclopedia of Methodism and A Hundred Years of Methodism, James Freeman Clark, 1810-1888, author of The Ten Great Religions of the World, Henry B. Smith, 1815-1877, whose History of the Church of Christ in Chronological Tables is much admired for its conciseness, accuracy, and thoroughness, William H. Odenheimer, 1817-1879, author of The Origin and Compilation of the Prayer Book, Philip Schaff, 1819-1893, the author of A Learned History of the Christian Church and Creeds of Christendom, and editor of the English translation of Lang's Commentary, William G. T. Shedd, 1820-1894, who besides other works wrote A History of Christian Doctrine, Charles Force Deems, 1820-1893, who wrote a work on the life of Christ, Henry Martin Dexter, 1821-1890, author of The Congregationalism of the Last Three Hundred Years, George R. Crooks, 1822-1897, who besides other labors in the fields of the classics, wrote The Life of Bishop Matthew Simpson, Charles Porterfield Crouth, 1823-1883, author of The Conservative Reformation and Its Theology, Holland N. McTeer, 1824-1889, whose chief literary work was The History of Methodism, and John Gilmory Shea, 1824-1892, who wrote many books on early American history connected with the Indians, one being A History of the French and Spanish Missions Among the Indian Tribes of the United States. John McClintock, 1814-1870, the scholarly Methodist divine and first president of Drew Theological Seminary, left a monument to his name in the great Cyclopedia of Biblical, Theological, and Ecclesiastical Literature, projected by him and his co-laborer, James Strong, 1822-1894, who completed the Herculean task and added yet other works, notably his exhaustive concordance of the Bible. Daniel Curry, 1809-1887, the keen editor and debater, has a gathered sheaf of his various addresses in platform papers. Austin Phelps, 1820-1890, wrote The Still Hour and The Theory of Preaching, which are fine specimens of his thoughtful work. And Phillips Brooks, 1835-1893, the renowned preacher, left sermons and addresses which still breathe the earnest and Catholic spirit of their cultured author. End of Part 2, Chapter 8 
Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany, on March 14, 2009. End of A Brief History of English and American Literature by Henry A. Beers